All right, welcome everybody here on site in Rafts in Switzerland and of course around the world, whoever is joining us on one of the live streams. Welcome to Biostasis 2022, our annual Biostasis conference here in Switzerland. Over the day today, um, a lot of the experts in biostasis, cryobiology, um, cryostasis and so on, will give a quick overview of what happened in, in the last year and then next year we will do this again and then the following year to always keep everybody up to date what's going on and start building this community more and more. First of all, I will give a bit of an introduction, some housekeeping to get everybody here on site and remote kind of up to date what's going to happen today and then I'll start giving a pr quick presentation about um, what we've been doing here at EBF at, and at Tomorrow Bio uh, in Berlin and then we will go through all the speakers either here on site or remote. Due to different time zones, the, there is no logic to who talks when. So there is no clear progression between science and, and community or anything like that. It's unfortunately or not, it's not that bad, but um, it's basically based on, on, on time zones because uh, we have speakers from the West Coast in the US to Australia, so basically covering almost every time zone. But to get started, um, let me briefly introduce myself and the foundation which is hosting Biostasis 2020 and the whole Biostasis conference series. Uh, my name is Emil. Um, I'm on the board of EBF and also running and one of the founders at Tomorrow Bio and I will lead you to or host the day today. The European Biostasis Foundation is a non-profit Swiss foundation, Swiss research foundation founded uh, in the beginning of 20. Uh, 19 to support uh, research in biostasis, conduct research in biostasis, and last but not least, also fund research in biostasis. And then, apart from the research part, we also educate people, we you know advocate for the topic, and so on. And this is part of what these conferences are about. Here today, you are in our newly built biostasis um, yeah, facility in Rafts. Um, where we are at a large conference room, but there's also a, a lab and medical facility and all of that. And I'll show you a couple of pictures in when the talk goes on. So just to catch everybody up, yesterday we had a workshop day here um, to kind of you know walk, work closer with researchers and local communities and local associations and societies all over Europe. Today, as I mentioned before, there's gonna be talks by the experts in the field. And then tomorrow, and this, Today is the only stream day, and then tomorrow there's an open house day uh, with more people joining and taking a look at the facility and interacting with the community. If you would like to ask any question, there is a Slido link. Slido is a tool where you can, where you can post questions and upload questions. So either here on site, you can use that uh, QR code. Um, Remotely, you can also, of course, use the R code or go to slido.do, that's S-L-I.do, and then enter the code that you see on your screens um, to access the um, Biostasis 22 question uh, line. And if you feel like a question is particularly interested, interesting, even though you might not have asked it yourself, you can upvote it so that the speakers or I know which questions to prioritize should be run out of time. All right, that's, that's that, and I will show that link again. All right, now that works again. One last housekeeping topic. We always run these conferences, conferences and I already told that to everybody here who is on site, but for the remote participants, um, we run these conferences under the so-called Chatham House rules, which means you can report on what is being said but you cannot attribute that comment or that whatever someone said to an individual. An individual. So you, you can report what is being said, so all the content is fine, but please um, respect these rules and do not, um, do not um, in identify who said that, uh, that statement. Um, all right, so as I already mentioned, I'm representing two organizations, of course, um, here, the European Biostasis Foundation, but then also kind of a day-to-day -day operative organization called Tomorrow Bio. We are here in Switzerland. Tomorrow Bio is um, based in, in Berlin, in Germany. And I'll give a quick overview. 
view of what these two organizations have been up to over the last, over the last year. So a bit more than a year ago, in July 2021, this is how this facility where we are located here today looked like. Basically, we're just starting um, to excavate the ground. And as you can see, it's kind of, we're, we're located here in a small hill um, where the upper part where we're right now is kind of above ground, and then the lower level is actually underground where I'm standing here, and then we're going further to the back where you might see the ambulance and a couple of cars sitting outside. It was a year ago. Slightly more than a year after, um, this is the facility that we're looking at today. And of course, everybody here on site has already seen it and you had a tour, but for the people who are joining us remotely, just to give you a quick in, in, uh, impression. So we're in the upper layer, um, in the upper level underground, then we have all the you know, medical facility and so on. This is how the building, this is actually the room here on the left where we're currently, where we're currently located. And now to quickly, just as kind of a virtual tour, let me show you briefly how it looks from the inside. This is, this is our lab. So we were gonna do um, you know, from basic science to applied science to translational science. Um, that is where that is gonna um, at least partly happen. This is the lab. Uh, since, of course, we're collaborating with a lot of other organizations around the world, this is the garage where these, where these medical um, biostasis response vehicles can drive into. Not super exciting, it's basically a, a simple garage. Um, then there's a medical facility um, for all the you know, organ transplantation stuff, for, for cryopreservations, um, and also a CT scanner, so it's kind of a combined operation room and, and uh, imaging facility. Um, there's, of course, large cryopreservation storage space that is also underground, as I said, basically in this hill, so, so highly secure. Um, with basically on every on every entrance two level of security um, kind of um, kind of gates and then mostly underground and last but not least this is the room this is what my view currently is or was in this morning I just took this picture um, a couple of minutes ago um, this is here the upper upper level which is an office or currently a small conference space and then conference rooms and so on and so on um, to kind of host these events and have people working here. So this is just to give you a bit of an introduction of how, how everything um, looks here. Now going over to what we do at, at Tomorrow Bio. Um, Tomorrow Bio is kind of the operative organization. EBF is the research organization and the organization which does the long-term cryopreservation storage um, that's why it's a non-profit organization. Um, that's why it's located in Switzerland. With Switzerland, of course, is a very stable country from all indices that you can look at. And then also, last but not least, of course, from a branding perspective. Um, this is this is the the membership um, from from Tomorrow Bio in in, in percentages. Um, as you can see, we only cover Europe so far. So we're not accepting members yet from any other continent just Europe and mostly with a strong focus on Western Europe and within that a strong focus on Germany where we are located um, and then of course also Austria and Switzerland so basically the Dach region and then every country around that um, there's a couple of a couple of members who are signed up from these countries um, as well and for the time being we're going to focus on or we con we're going to continue to focus on Europe making sure that this region is covered well <laughs> yesterday in these workshops that we had one of the topics was how European organizations can collaborate um, closer together, how there can be more SST teams or first aid teams in countries where, well, even though we're in Europe, some countries, of course, there's going to be a quite a distance if there's a cryopreservation case in, in those regions. Um, so one of the initiatives that we're going to uh, start now and have discussed yesterday is how to collaborate closer in these local organizations and, uh, and us. Um, so if any one of you in the audience um, is involved in a local organization, a local society, um, or is interested in getting involved in wherever they're based, um, and that can technically also be if there's already uh, an existing organization in that country where you live, but you might be far away, right? So maybe let's say, you know, there's a couple of countries that are pretty big, right? So you might be in a different region and would be interested in, in, in building a first aid or standby team then please reach out. We're more than happy to discuss and, and um, see what we can do together. 
Right, going on, going on from there, there's a couple of things, well, there's a couple of things that um, we, new things that we launched this, um, uh, this year. One of the important topics is that, so thinking about cryopreservation and then at some point considering that you actually do want to sign up for cryopreservation, for some people that's a, you know, that, that's a, that's a consideration that might take a while, right? We have a, a, a large range of people who sign up for, for us, for cryopreservation um, with us, who have been thinking about this topic, well, lit literally for years. Um, a lot of people tell us, you know, they heard about this topic first, I don't know, five, six, um, sometimes 10 years ago, or at least two years ago. And then at some point after kind of contemplating that topic on and off, they decide that now is the time to sign up. Of course, it's for us, it, we, will, we will advocate that it probably doesn't make sense to think about it for eight years, right? But of course, we understand that this is a topic where some, type, type, some amount of contemplation is very important. So to make that a bit easier, we have launched what we we'll call the Tomorrow Fellowship Program, which is basically not a full sign up. So if something should happen to you once you've signed up to this program, we would not have the funds available and also not the contractual basis to cryopreserve someone, but it kind of gives you an opportunity to interact with the community, be part of the community, um, and so on. So this is a, it's a five euro um, a month kind of m mini membership, which gives you a range of, of um, you know, advantages from t-shirts, right, that you can pick. We have a range of interesting t-shirts from all over the, you know, all over your chest, like the Supreme shirt saying Kranix, right? So very aggressive stuff and also to also t-shirts that are a bit more, um, not as visually uh, impressive maybe. Um, from that to research reports, to being part of our online community and so on. And of course, if at any point in the future you should decide that now is the time to actually do sign up for cryopreservation, then every, all of these five euros per month that you have paid so far, we're giving you, for every five euros that you have paid in the past, we're giving you six euros, so 20% more, as a discount on, on your membership fee. So if at any point in the future you decide, you've basically not lost money by, being, by having been a fellow, fellow for, um, for a while. Um, so so um, the question was if this is just for the first year or if this is indefinite. So let's say you've been a fellow for 10 years, right? And you've paid 10 years long, five euros a month, right? Then whatever that amount is, plus 20%, we're giving you as discount. So, and that of course, on the top of my head, I'm not sure how long that discount would now last if you now pay 25 euros a month, with, which is our membership fee for a full sign up. Um, but that might be more than a year. So it's, it's not limited on, on any amount of time. It's just limited on how much money you have basically paid um, prior to that. And it's always 20%. Um, so if anybody is interested in cryopreservation but has just not fully asked any question that, or every question that they might want to ask before fully signing up, this might be a way of how to kind of getting involved. Um, of course, you're more than happy, of, or we're more than happy to ask, ask, ask or answer questions, of course, also without you being a fellow. Um, but this fellowship program might be a good first step um, to kind of get, get more involved. So if you're interested, go to tomorrow.bio slash fellow, and then we're more than happy to, to have you on board. So that's the um, Tomorrow Fellowship Program. Then this slide was very similar last year. Um, one, of, one of the very important things is, of course, in cryopreservation is making sure that should something happen to you, maybe last minute, maybe without any advance notice, then that the cryopreservation organization, or if there's a local SST first aid team, is aware of that without any undue delay. So, of course, people have membership <laughs> cards, they have these bracelets that, that tells other people that they are, have a cryopreservation contract. You might have a patient advance directive that states that you have a cryopreservation contract, and so on and so on. But of course, all of these things kind of rely on someone else looking at your braces, looking at your patient advance directive, looking at your membership card, and then kind of following the instructions that are given on that, on, on that, of, on that kind of yeah, well, bracelet and so on. Um, 
One additional option that we've been developing is an Android and iOS app that, um, that does these emergency notifications, basically. So this is not an app that is branded uh, Tomorrow Bio. This is an independent um, biostasis app, biostasis emergency app, right? We have not only developed it for us, but any other person who signed up with any other organization can use that app as well. So it's very independent of us. Um, it currently works, as I said, on Android and iOS. It works either time-based, so you can say every five hours, every whatever minutes, um, I would like to have a push notification that asks me if I'm still okay, and then if you don't click, I'm okay, then an emergency cascade is being started. So kind of like a dead man, um, dead man switch where you need to actively do something, otherwise an emergency system is started. Um, the emergency system in that case um, would send an emergency message to predefined emergency contacts. It would send every file that you want to send over, for example, let's say your cryopreservation contract, your last will, your patient advance directive, and so on. And of course, it sends last known GPS positions and a couple of other things to give your emergency contacts the opportunity, um, well, to react to that emergency in some predefined way. It's not only time-based, but co of course you could argue that this is, might be pretty annoying to every, whatever, five hours or every day even. We might need to remember that you need to click your mobile. It can also act on a pulse-based, um, in a pulse-based me pulse -based method. So if you have one of those smart rings, so for example, I have this Ura ring, uh, which is a smart ring, or any other smart device, a Whoop, an Apple um, Watch, you name it, we basically support everything that either puts data into HealthKit on the Apple side or Google Fit on the Android side. So as long as there's pulse data being updated in there, the app reads the pulse data and then stops the emergency cascade from starting. If for whatever reason there's no pulse data available, then it sends out these emergency signals again. And of course, now you can imagine that there might be a couple of false positives and false negatives. You know, if your if your if your phone or your your watch or your ring, whatever, runs out of battery, or you've forgotten to take it with you, what you whatever it might be the case. In that case, of course, it doesn't directly send an emergency message the second there's no pulse data available. No, it starts an emergency cascade. So first, it's going to send you a push notification. Um, if it doesn't detect data anymore, pulse data, then it's going to send you a text message, it's going to turn on an alarm, and so on. So there's this emergency cascade where you then still can say, well, no, 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 sorry, 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 I just forgot to charge my, my phone or my, my, my Apple Watch. Um, I'm totally fine. But of course, if you do not react to any of these messages um, or push notifications, then this emergency cascade, which sends all this information to your emergency contacts, will be started. Now, last but not least, we are not primarily an app company, right? We are, we are a medical, we are a cryopreservation company, and um, all of our resources we would like to rather put on, on you know, funding research and, and so on than on, on, uh, on building apps, which of course are important, but building apps also is not cheap. Um, so what we will do, as I said, this is not supposed to be an app for tomorrow. This is a, uh, and supposed to be an app for the community that can be used by all other organizations as well. So at the end of 2020, we're currently preparing an open source project where all of the app will be put into this open source project so that it can A, be used by anybody and everybody, and B, then for that open source project, we're getting together a group of people involved in the space who also have you know, computer and technical skills and app development skills and back-end development skills to continue continuously improving that system as an open source project. So whoever has a computer science background or an app developer background or whatever you name it, whoever can be involved and wants to be involved and continuously continue to build this app, there's still a lot of things that need to be improved that can be better, um, where higher fidelity um, can be can be done with higher quality, false negative and, and false positive detection can be done. So a lot of stuff is still open to be done. Um, then we're more than happy to have you join on that open source project that will be set up in the next couple of, of weeks. So please reach out for that as well. Right. All right. One more thing that we're currently implementing for the part of the community who wants to be involved 
in, in, in more depth. I already mentioned that yesterday we had these workshops and again, I'm speaking here mostly um, to the remote audience um, because on site we already discussed this yesterday. We, we, are, we have started to build um, kind of a repository, a wiki, um, a, 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 yeah, well, a database of information that would be helpful to either set up a standby team, set up a cryopreservation organization. A lot of the stuff is you know, somewhere available, but there are very few guidelines of how to build that stuff kind of in a construction, like an IKEA, in like an IKEA-like in, in instruction manual. So we're setting that up that will have information about, you know, legal considerations for every European country, not only on a country level, but if that's relevant for one of the European countries, also on a state level because at least, for example, here in Germany and in other countries as well, there's differences not only country to country, but also state to state within that country. Um, it will have a, a vast repository of, of uh, protocols, of SOPs, and so on and so on, contact information for people in a certain country, so that if a case should happen without us being there, or last minute sign up, or, um, or someone um, who hasn't signed up yet at all, um, then that information gives you kind of a basis to, to well, set up a local team and, and, and work with us um, and have this information readily at hand. It won't be fully public. It will be, it will be accessible by people who get involved in this community a bit, a bit more. Um, so if, you know, you're interested in that, feel free to reach out to us as well. All right, and last but not least, the whole community of Prior preservation, unfortunately, is still funded in, in, relatively, in relatively small amounts of money. So there isn't much uh, scientific funding yet for cryopreservation research um, basically anywhere in the world. Of course, there's funding bodies who have been funding the, the, um, the, the, the cryopreservation research effort over many years. But if you compare it to any other medical sector, be it longevity, be it life extension, be it aging, be it cancer and so on, the amounts of funding are negligible basically in comparison, right? So it's a couple millions per year that goes into cryopreservation research for human cryopreservation, right? There's a bit more if that goes into cryobiology, but of course not everything that is being done in cryobiology on cells can even, rem well, it, it, it's, it's far to translate that into, into practice of cryopreservation. So um, there has been this new initiative or this new idea to fund research um, with, with funding from the crypto community. So for example, the, one of the examples is um, an organization that is called VitaDAO, which is a decentralized autonomous organization, which of course is a mouthful, um, but it's basically an organization that is kind of run online and funded um, by various cryptocurrencies that then use that fund or these funds to fund research projects. So with some people from that community, um, Tomorrow Bio is starting, or not legally speaking Tomorrow Bio, because it's basically just individuals who do that, um, is setting up what is called CryoDAO, um, which will be also a, de um, a decentralized autonomous organization that is purely there to fund science from basic science to applied to translational, um, to fund science needed for cryopreservation. So if anybody wants to get involved in that, um, either if you have a scientific background as an advisor or as someone who would like to maybe even uh, submit uh, research proposals, or on the other side, of course, if you're somehow involved in the crypto ecosystem, then also as, as either someone who funds research um, or is involved in the day-to-day -day running of that organization, well, then please reach out uh, uh, to us as well. All right, last but not least, I would like to remind everybody again um, that feel free, please, to ask any questions. Um, you can technically also ask these questions in YouTube chat, but please use um, Slido, because then they directly um, arrive at my, on my iPad here, and when then the speaker talks, I can, I can, uh, I can directly read the question. Um, now, without further ado, since there are no more questions, I think, at least not that I see, if there's any questions, now is the time to either ask it here on site um, or put it into Slido. 
um, because otherwise we would already s slowly go to the to the next um, speaker if the next speaker because it's a remote speaker is already to already ready to go any questions here from the audience Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So this is not like this database is not generating necessarily new knowledge, right? It's not like, listen, we reinvent the wheel everywhere. It's more an aggregation of everything that is out there, but um, an aggregation with the, with the plan to have it as a very tangible, almost, if possible, one, two, three, well, step one, step two, step three kind of things, right? So that it is more, it's more, you know, it, it, it can be easily implemented if someone wants to implement something, let's say, very far away from us where there's no other community, but there's someone, two people who would like to do something um, to do that. Um, until... Um, the stream organizers here tell me that the next uh, speaker is ready. One more thing for the speakers. So whenever um, someone starts here on site, I'll hand over the microphone. If for Q&A, um, I need to come relatively close together, but not too close for any COVID uh, regulation. Um, just take over the microphone and the clicker from me and then hand it to the next speaker um, who will then start. All right, then now, we're starting with the, uh, with the next speaker, who is remote. Um, not sure if Peter can hear me. Peter is uh, calling in from, from Australia, um, representing Southern Cryonics, the cryopreservation organization in, in Australia. personal actually but the most part of it is because we are very near to getting our facility going and there's just a lot going on at this end just tying in these final bits and pieces uh, seems to be taking a lot of our time at this stage last year uh, when I did this I went through the status of where we were and talked about the work we had done to get the facility operating it's been a very eventful year but there are still a few other steps that I had mentioned needing to be finalized. And unfortunately, some took far longer than we thought, particularly in the still COVID environment of last year and early this year. What I would like to do today is not just focus on the facility itself. I'd like to cover the four main chronics organizations that we have formed in Australia over the years. Each of these had their own challenges. It won't be a long presentation and there will be time for questions at the end if there are any. Let me just go to the first one. Okay, this is the first one. All that this does is just summarize the four organizations. Uh, the first of these is Southern Chronics, which is the facility itself and is the one I spent most of the time last year discussing at the conference. The second is Cryopath, which is involved with standby stabilization transportation. The third is Chronic Services Australia, which is a sort of a one-stop uh, shopping concierge organization uh, to assist people in joining Cryonics. The fourth of these is Cryopart Prime, which has to do with long-term trusts. For your information, these are actually four separate organizations, although there are obvious links. I'll discuss these in a little bit more detail in the next few charts. 
Let me start with Southern Chronix. It's the largest of these projects. I won't go through all the details of the progress we made because there were so many steps and we had covered a lot of them last year. Let me just summarize a few things. We have 34 founding members who have already contributed 50,000 to 70,000 Australian dollars. We completed buying the land. That was quite a few years ago. We uh, built the facility, uh, installed all the major and minor pieces of equipment. Um, the major pieces of equipment included the a cryostat and uh, a cooling chamber. And there were some others as well, the tank to hold the liquid nitrogen as well as doing all the training and resourcing. We had hoped, as I had said last year, to be operational by now. However, we still have one more, I would say one more item to do at the facility. There is a major, there is a special loading arm for loading liquid nitrogen uh, from the large storing tank into the cryostat. I won't get into very many details here, because I'm sure you're not interested, but the suppliers of liquid nitrogen have some legal responsibility here, and they want to make sure we have a proper type arm installed. It allows safe loading by one operator. Again, in this, we were hit by COVID de uh, delays. What should have been a one to two month exercise in making this specially built loading arm uh, took over six months. Uh, the supplier was hit, you know, understandable here. They were hit with supply problems and they were hit with COVID illnesses of their own earlier this year. So, but now we are, we are very close to being ready. They've uh, actually manufactured the arm and most likely will be delivering and finishing it uh, in November. This means that essentially the facility is ready to be opened. We are planning to have a soft landing, or a soft opening, I should say, later this year, just a, an opening to just let us test how everything is working later this year or early next year. And then a more full-blown event, probably later next year, where we really go out and say we're officially open. Okay, that's the facility. The second, organization is Cryopath. This second organization was developed over the last 10 years uh, and it's basically involved in handling standby, stabilization, perfusions and transportation. As well as handling these requirements for Southern Chronics, it will be handling for Southern Chronics, Cryopath can also cover the US organizations on an outsourced basis. That is, if requested, of course, by these uh, overseas organizations. Mainly, I'm talking about uh, Elcor and Chronix Institute. For Cryopath, most of its activities are outsourced to an organization called Australian Blood Management. This organization is not related to Chronix specifically. They are an established organization in Australia, which has perfusionists and medical practitioners on their staff. Their main activity has been conducting perfusions on patients at hospital. Perfusion in that sense is a little bit different from what we would consider to be perfusion in chronics. Perfusions at hospital is typically the use of heart lung machines, which are used mainly for open heart surgery. They have had a wide range of experience in this area and particularly with ECMO, ECMO, uh, technology. In fact, they have a variety of ECMO devices, including some portable ones. They we're working very closely together and they have built a special portable one, which we can use for our own Cryonix work. All this equipment, again, will be available in November. We do have one challenge still with Cryopath to overcome. Because of the stringent laws in Australia, obtaining some of the prescription uh, pharmaceuticals is an issue. We've got some workarounds on this at the moment, and that is trying to use non-prescription substitutes, investigating whether we can obtain uh, these prescription chemicals for veterinary use where there are less restrictions and possibly obtaining them from overseas. For the longer term, we may make an official application to the relevant government authority requesting use of these pharmaceuticals for research purposes, but this could be a long, uh, long drawn out process. So at the moment, we'll work with our workaround um, 
uh, techniques and see if we can have this all in place in the next couple of months. I'm going to shift gears again into one, the next one. And the next one is to do with our next organization, which is called Cryonic Services Australia Limited. This organization provides services to make joining a cryonics organization much easier. Uh, Cryonic Services Australia has been operating for nearly 10 years. To date, most of their work is assisting those wanting to join US organizations, again, particularly Elcor and Cryonics Institute. Cryonics Services Australia coordinates the obtaining of, let me see if the list is life insurance, financial arrangements, legal arrangements, estate planning, trusts, and the administration required for joining cryonics organizations. Most prospective members really only require the life insurance aspect, but there, there has been some involvement in the other areas. Obtaining life insurance for cryonics purposes in Australia is really no easy task. You have to work your way through the life insurance system to obtain it. We have developed some good relationships uh, with major insurers, and that's allowed us to organize this life insurance for those who wish to use it for cryonics in Australia. Uh, let me make an important point here. Uh, cryonics Services Australia does not do this specialist work itself. It's not a life insurance organization and does not have professional, financial, or legal credentials. They are, these are all left to qualified professionals. What Cryonics Services Australia tries to do is coordinate with these qualified professionals to make sure that the cryonics needs are understood and incorporated in the services they supply. Because cryonics is so new and so small in Australia, most of these professionals who get involved in this don't have any idea uh, what you're talking about when you try to include the cryonics aspects of certain uh, of certain legal or other requirements that may be needed. Um, for example, if somebody's doing a will and they want to include cryonics aspects in the will, they want to include that they want to be chronically suspended, the people who are the lawyers or whoever are the estate planners who are putting the will together aren't really sure what it is and what to do. That's where Chronic Services Australia helps and points out how it fits in and what the sort of, uh, we, we know basically the legal framework under which it's around. Okay. The last item on this chart, and that was about five years ago, Chronic Services Australia developed with the assistance of specialist trust lawyers, a long-term trust deed, which is suitable for cryonics use. It was a far more complex and expensive uh, exercise than what we had originally thought. But the development of this trust deed highlighted many of the issues that people wishing to put aside funds for the future need to, un need to actually achieve and overcome. Uh, that statement actually conveniently leads me into the next chart, which is to do with our organization, Cryoprime. Cryoprime is a trust coordination organization based on the trustee developed by Chronic Services Australia that I mentioned previously. Putting aside funds after death is far more complex than most people understand, at least far more difficult than I thought before we embarked on this trustee exercise about 10 years ago. There are three main legal and I stress legal because there are other issues, legal related areas, which cause problems in putting aside funds or assets for cryonics for the longer term. The first of these is that in many jurisdictions, legal devices such as trusts are subject to a rule against perpetuities. This states that a personal trust cannot last more than about 80 years after death of the person. So if your trust lasts longer than about 80 years in these jurisdictions, if it lasts more than 80 years after death, it may be illegal and unenforceable. This creates significant limitations in the use of normal trust for Australia. I should add that, uh, sorry, normal trust for chronics. I just wanted to add that in Australia, we have this limitation. A second issue is that even when there are no such limitations, there are still other issues, particularly as it relates to chronics. Usually in jurisdictions where there is no rule against perpetuity, 
the allowance of longer term trusts really relates to tax savings. That's what it is in the US. Basically, in the US, uh, these rules don't, the rule against perpetuity doesn't apply. So you can have longer trusts, but they're really to skip a generation in inheritance laws. Again, this is not really related to chronics. Therefore, we still must have a trust that allows for chronics needs. Uh, for example, how the funds are, are paid back to yourself after chronics revival, whether the funds are used for your recovery process or not, what protections are there to prevent challenges that could, in what could be very sizable funds. These need to be allowed for. The third of these issues, and this is an interesting one, relates to topics I hear many times when this subject is discussed. It relates to misconceptions about what you own, what you actually own after death. Basically, in about every jurisdiction I know, inheritance laws do not allow you to leave assets to yourself. Therefore, you basically own nothing after you die. Therefore, uh, people talk about putting gold coins aside or storing coins or storing gold or stamps or whatever, and then being able to uh, use these stored items later. Uh, it needs to be noted that funds and assets don't le legally belong to you after you die. They belong to your heirs, to whoever your estate goes to, and it, can go, and it can't go to yourself. Some people envisage hiding gold or similar items in a secret place. You, you could do, excuse me, you could do this, of course, but the gold, again, does not strictly belong to you. You may say, but who will know in 200 years' time, for example? However, if you come back suddenly wealthy in 200 years, then investigations may be made. And remember, even these days, assets can be tracked quite effectively. Imagine what the tracking mechanism will be in 200 years' time. Uh, even the items, for example, left in small storage boxes uh, with cryonics facilities are not yours. If these are of value, the new owners can legally claim them from the cryonics facility, unless you leave them to the cryonics facility, of course. We have found that long-term trusts, if designed in a particular way, are at this stage the best way to put aside funds safely for the future. Cryo Prime is involved in setting up trust for individuals and consolidated trust for groups. Also, Cryo Prime coordinates trusts with large established trustee organizations for those with substantial assets and is itself a trustee for those with more modest assets who wish to put funds away. Let me now shift to my final view graph. Basically, what's next? This last chart deals with what we believe are our next immediate steps. We believe that we will be opening our facility either late this year or very early next year. At that stage, we'll commence obtaining new members. These members are not the same as the current founding members we have. The current founding members, if you remember I mentioned, paid upfront $50,000 to $70,000 uh, per member. Uh, the, they were like investors, actually, who helped to get Southern Chronics going. These new members or clients will be using payment techniques such as life insurance, and this payment will not be necessary until the time of their suspension. They are more in line with the traditional approach used by most Chronics organizations. As well, we need to test some of our standby perfusion capabilities, particularly with the use of ECMO. We are planning to do dry runs here, some with humane animal testing, uh, which Australian blood management does have access to. So we'll be, it, it, you know, basically what needs to happen is we won't be able, obviously, just to experiment on, on uh, patients, but we hope we can do some uh, using these humane animal testing approaches, just to get us a little bit more understanding of what needs to be done. We need to do more training with the processes and the equipment we have. To date, our training has tended to be training one or two people in a train the trainer type of approach. We need to extend this further so that we have a greater pool of trained people. We have a local, well, this is a sort of an aside, but we have a local professional group making a documentary about chronics in Australia in which we feature. At worst, 
this will be a good chronicle of our journey of what we have done in Australia. At best, it may also encourage others to join chronics organisations. Yeah, in the same vein, we also have a pent up demand from TV media to do programs about our facility. I've been holding them back until we are officially open, but we must have about, I think I get calls every month. We must have about five, six different television media stations who want to, to do a program about us. Uh, we will hold them back until the time we open, and we hope that this will be part of the splash that gives that additional public awareness at the time we do open. After we are operating, one of our first priorities is to develop people to run our organizations longer term. We have been very dedicated. We do have actually not have been, we do have a very de dedicated group, but we need to widen the number of people more involved, uh, especially younger people. And most importantly, we need to be prepared for our first case. Uh, I hope we get plenty of time to prepare, but we need to be very prepared for our first case that come up, comes up. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, if there are any questions, if there's time for questions or any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Peter, thank you so much. Yes. Um, there's yeah. a couple of questions, on that, of course, uh, potentially also some in the audience. Um, if there's any in the audience, we would start with the audience. Otherwise, I would switch to online and then the audience can think for a couple more minutes. Um, okay. The first question would be, do you see people are interested in Quranics in Australia? Uh, yes, more so than what we thought. Uh, and it's a, there's a fairly simple way in which we're measuring some of this. One is that when we first went out, to, uh, to look for founding members, we thought we could get 16 or 18. In fact, we were very happy if we got that. We got double that number, uh, 34 founding members. The other thing is we've had uh, groups uh, ask us anything type seminars, which we thought normally these are attended by five or six people. And we got something like 25 to 30 people uh, attending the, uh, this sort of seminar, which gave us a lot of hope because a lot of people wouldn't normally attend. The other thing is our Facebook uh, page seems to get around the, depending on what we write, 300 to 1,000 reviews with a lot of people asking us, when will you be open? I have a, ba a backlog of something like 80 to 100 people waiting for us to open. We won't get all of them, but I think there's a lot of interest. Australians are very open about the new things like chronics. So there is a lot of interest. It's not going to be overwhelming because our population's not that large, but there is a lot of interest. And I'll try to keep my answer shorter. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, right, question two will is, um, will you focus only on Australia um, or also on or, or, and not neighboring regions? Uh, will it be legally more difficult for non-Australian uh, customers or members? Uh, not, we will, sorry, we'll focus on Australia and New Zealand, but we are open to other regional areas. Within Australia, it won't be legally more difficult, but I don't know what the legal requirements are in those other countries. They may have some issues, but within Australia, uh, it won't be because we're classed as a cemetery and essentially people from overseas can come to be, in inverted commas, interred in Australia. You know, it's not a big issue unless, of course, there's some contagious disease issue or something like that. But uh, but it should not be a big issue. All right. Um, will you offer both neuro and whole body preservation? And do you have price estimates? Uh, for whole body, our price estimate is 150,000 uh, Australian dollars. For neural, we haven't made a final decision on that. That's why we're not quoting numbers. Uh, let, let me be honest, some of our members and some of our board are for it and some are against it. I think we will end up offering neural as well, but uh, but there are some issues. Um, you know, one of our board members, especially at the beginning, one of our board members uh, mentions that if we have a child in the first as one of our first cases, do we really want to be offering neurals with all the publicity associated with that in a child? So we, we're very careful. We definitely will be offering whole body and neural is a decision to be made later. All right. 
Um, next one will be from, from David Wood. Um, your founding members provided, provided funds up front, enabling organization process. Yeah. New members uh -huh. will provide funds only when they die. Are you exactly. new founding members? We, we've closed off founding members. New members, however, do pay an ongoing fee of about $350 a year. Uh, we are not open to new founding members. Uh, we, made a, we made a commitment to those who were founding members that they put their money, they took the risk for five, six, seven years. Um, you know, putting your money now uh, is coming in without the risk. However, having said that, we may have an approach where we say, all right, it's $150,000 at the time you become a patient, you become suspended. But if you put upfront money, it, it's sort of like a founding membership, it'll probably be higher. Let's, I'll just call it, if you put $100,000 upfront, then um, you, know, you, you will have the suspension guaranteed for the future. That could be a way we do it. But at the moment, we don't have any specific plans for that. Right. Um, will the uh, Cryo Prime Trust be open also for non-Australians who want to be who want to preserve funds for later revival? It will be open, but there will be a cost to it. People ought to contact me because I'll be honest. We spent almost eighty over eighty thousand Australian dollars developing that trust. It was it was a lot of work involved. So there will be a cost. Normally, what's happening is Australians are normally are, are buying into it and are using it at the moment. But there are, we have, if somebody wants trust, we have different variations of that trust and some of them cannot, can be relatively cheaper than others. But they need to contact me because it is an extremely complex topic. Uh, I don't want to just give advice here. And in fact, I'm probably not uh, entitled to give advice, but I, I do know I'm probably the after all the money we spent and after all the training we used, I'm probably the Australian expert on long-term trust. So, uh, you know, with all the, I, I got $80,000 of training in that, in that exercise. So, so I do know um, quite a bit about them. Last but not least, uh, yes, kind of, of course. Last call for adding additional questions. Um, which founding member paid 50K or uh, 70K? And what's the difference? Uh, basically, the 50K were what we call founding members. And later on, there were a group we call full members. Founding members joined us about, about eight years ago, nine years ago. As we got closer to the opening, we stopped founding membership and we opened full membership. Two years before we opened, we opened full. Again, the reason is risk. Somebody who put their money eight years ago had a lot more risk than somebody says, oh, wait, you're ready to open, <laughs> then I can put my money in here. So full members are still open at the moment in some ways, the 70,000, but that will close off completely at the time we open the facility. But it's basically a risk assessment of who put in the money. The people who put the lesser amount took much more risk than the people who put in the larger amount. Right. If there's no further questions, then thanks a lot, Peter. No, thank you all very much and all the best to the conference and all the best to everybody there. I hope next year I can make it. I really do. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Bye then. Bye. As next speaker on site, I would like to welcome Michael to the stage. And Where's my phone? Okay. And you might need to point it to point the light in the direction okay. because it doesn't. Okay. Good morning, everybody. My name is Michael Benjamin. I'm working on the Alcor Meta Analysis Project for Advanced Neural Biosciences, which is Austin awesome DeWolf Company. <coughs> Who likes results? Does anybody like results? <laughs> uh, so well, what I'm going to discuss is one of the overarching results that we've, uh, one of the overarching 
items that we've found or observations that we've made uh, and discuss some of the uh, sort of low-hanging fruit that we think can address the, this particular issue uh, fairly, you know, quicker than the other things. I'm also going to go over the project a little bit. Uh, so it's comprehensive meta-analysis of all, <coughs> all the case reports of all the cases in our court. I've covered uh, 1967 to 2020 for this presentation, uh, and we're going to be adding the last couple of years in the next couple of months. Um, so the idea is to develop, one of the first ideas is to develop a database of all the data that we can pull out of all, the, all of these case reports. One note I want to make about that, you know, in that database are times, when was cardiopulmonary support, what were temperatures at given times, all that sort of data is going into the database. Uh, but just as important as that data, while we have a, an interface to able, allow people to search through that data and pull out specific data points, context is very important. And the case reports are still going to be very important to look, you know, take that data and look at the case reports to understand what's really going on in each case. So this database is really a tool uh, to make the, the, all the data points available more easily. Um, so we also developed a quantitative measure to determine how good a case uh, result was uh, on an individual basis. So as a uh, full-scale review of all the alpha cases uh, to see where we can find ways to improve the crowd protection process and get the best crowd protections that we can. Um, so a little bit about the database, some of the data points that we're collecting, uh, different stages of the crowd protection, uh, patient demographics, uh, standby, um, SST, washout, and crowd protection. Uh, and for each case, there's about 700 to 900 data points, depending on the case. Um, put it in a uh, Amazon Web Services post database, uh, web-based tool, and I'll show you that in a little bit. Uh, to interface with the data, allows you to log in, allows you to uh, make some different charts with the data. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, it improves the ability to look up the data, but we still need case reports for context. Picture of the database to log in, and as you can see over here, make it a little bit bigger. But some of the charts that you can make with the data, there's different options to make different charts. Uh, so the standardized measure for ischemic exposure, that's the, the metric that we came up with. Uh, Ashwin DeWolf and Mike Perry uh, worked on this, and there's actually a white paper that you can go to that website to look up. That is measuring how much ischemic time uh, a patient will receive between circulatory arrest and throughout the crowd preservation process to when the patient reaches zero degrees Celsius. So that's what this is measuring. Um, you know, the, the, process, the, the most important thing in the S-mix are the different temperature drops during different procedures. So you have um, SST, during which you have cardiopulmonary support. Uh, you have a temperature drop in there. And you have a temperature drop in, during washout, temperature drop during cryopreservation. And you take all that information and plug that into the SMIX. There's a calculator that we put up, and that will give you an, an SMIX value for each of those segments. And those segments added together will give you a total SMIX score. Again, the SMIX is how much ischemic damage has been done to the patient during this cooling process. Um, this is the website uh, with the calculator on there. So there's a set of instructions on the website, and then there's the calculator itself. You're initially taking, taking each segment, putting in the initial temperature at the beginning of that segment, the final temperature at the end of that segment, and the duration of that segment. And this will kick out a number that tells you how much ischemic exposure a patient has experienced in that time. Um, so let's say you had a cardiopulmonary support period, and that took two hours. 
uh, depending on what the temperature drop and other things that went on during that, you might have an, ischem an ischemic exposure time of 15, 30 minutes, depends on the, on the case. I don't know if anybody wants to use that QR code to get to the website, take a picture of the screen. <clears throat> Got it? So where are we now? So the meta-analysis is coming to an end at the end of the year. Um, and like I said earlier, we've got all the data from 1997 to 2020. The rest of the, the last two years will be added in in the next couple of months. <clears throat> uh, database and the interface are undergoing a final build. We're putting in and organizing all the, all the uh, data in a way that will be easiest to utilize. Um, so part of the meta-analysis, there, you know, there are different areas. We, we found, had certain findings, and there are different areas to look at to see how we can improve on the issues that we found. And these are 12 areas that we're doing deep dives into. Uh, to, to determine you know, how do we improve these areas. And I'm, I'm actually going to read through these because I think these are important. Uh, the impact of autopsies on ischemic time, uh, impact of unattended deaths, um, how well SST teams are deployed, uh, whether cardiopulmonary support is done, whether there's um, uh, ventilation during cardiopulmonary support, um, so you have situations where there's patients in hospice. What are the logistics of that? Will the hospice teams work with the cryonics team, work with the SST team to allow them to do their procedures right away as quickly as possible? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, and that, in the, the less cooperation, the more the ischemic time in the patient. Um, how long does it take to induce hypothermia? How quickly is hypothermia induced? The quicker we get the patient cooler, the better. Uh, to a degree, we don't want to do it too fast. Um, types of medication that were administered. You know, alcohol has a set of medications that need to be administered. Some situations you can't get them all in the time. Uh, so we're doing a deep dive into uh, cases and determining which patients had a full suite of medications, which didn't, and how that may have impacted the outcomes. Uh, remote blood substitution, uh, crowd protection, field crowd protection, uh, refinement of the S-mix. So, you know, the more we can improve the S-mix over time, the better. The better, the closer we can get to the actual ischemic time, the better we can tell how the patient was preserved. Um, correlating the S-mix to CAT scans uh, that are done to some patients, uh, determining ice, uh, what are the correlations between ice and the brain, uh, after cloud preservation and the S mix, so it's not necessarily a one to one, but we're, we're going to we believe we're going to find some correlations between the two. Um, and monitoring of SSP and cloud protection, uh, I think that's an important one, uh, and I say that because going, having gone through all the cases over the last fifty some odd years. I don't want to say things have been missed, but you know. You have all the case reports weren't necessarily done right away. So there's data that's missing uh, from those cases. Um, and sometimes mod different kinds of monitoring were done. So we need to improve the processes, make sure the proper monitoring is going on so we can get all the data we need to study this uh, more in the future. Um, and as I said, the calculator is complete. I showed you that. Uh, and Alcor is also going to be using the S-mix measure in all of their case reports going forward. They've started doing that in the last couple of case reports. So what have we discovered so far? So you see, all, these are all the uh, SMIC scores over the last 50 years. Um, and you see that trend line. That trend line is going up. What that means is that you would hope over 50 years there would be improvement in cryopreservation. What we're seeing in this slide, uh, in that trend line, is that the S-mix has actually been getting a little bit higher. 
which means more ischemic time over time. And we want exactly the opposite of that. There's a lot of reasons for this. This is a very complicated uh, problem. Um, you know, I definitely seen in the, in the case reports from the last few years, improvements in a lot of areas. But, you know, figuring out what improvements will affect this in the best possible way is, is, a, comp is a complex thing to understand. And as you can see from all those different factors I listed before, there's a lot of things to study to see what impacts they have and a lot of modeling that needs to be done to really understand what's having the biggest impact. Um, so let me go back a second. So you see there's a lot of spikes here. And you wonder, you know, for those of you familiar with this kind of stuff, how many of these are outliers? And how, how do we count the outliers or not count the outliers? I mean, you've got to count them. So what I did was I, any SMIC score above 15 hours, I listed here. One thing you'll notice about this, look in the, in the far right column. What are most of these cases? Unattended deaths. People who have passed away in their houses and weren't found for hours, days, increases that extem uh, ischemic time significantly uh, and makes a good cryopreservation preservation less likely. Uh, so that, that's the thing that stands out uh, probably the most. And then there's uh, post-mortem third-party cases where patients were not members and either family members or friends or whatever reached out to Alcor, which the, the Alcor doesn't usually take those cases, but sometimes they do. Uh, but those generally have uh, long ischemic times as well, because by the time the membership is approved and they get an SST team out to the, to the patient, there's a long waiting period. So what I did here is I removed those, um, those quote unquote outliers to see if that would impact that trend line. And it really did, and it's maybe slightly improved here, uh, but no significant change. Uh, so in this one, what I decided to do was take out all the unintended deaths and all the post-mortem cases. And you see a slight decrease in that trend line, which means a slight improvement in the S mix over the last 50 years. Now, you would hope to see a better improvement than this, you know, really small slope downward line. Uh, but this is what we're seeing at the moment. Uh, so I tried a few different things. I said, okay, what could have an impact on these cases? What could have an impact on improving this uh, over time? So in the first one, I said, okay, how do the cases look if there was no standby? If there was nobody there, no SST team there before the patient deanimated? And then it took a certain amount of time for them to get to the patient and start stabilization procedures. So as you can see, that slope you know, clearly increases over time. Um, so when you add a with standby and they're there to start procedures right away, you see an improvement in the S-mix over time where the slope is going down. So on the bottom, and I thought this would have a bigger impact than it really seems to, uh, if there's a local case, it's easier for an SST team to get there quicker with or without a standby. Well, as you can see, even local cases, you're seeing that increase in the estimates over the last 50 years. So they didn't have the impact that one would imagine that it would have. Uh, and same thing with the non-local cases, which, you know, what you would expect. It just takes longer. If there's no standby, it just takes longer to get to the patients. Uh, so, you know, looking at the trends, you know, especially the last set of slides, you see some up, some down. I think basically over the last 50 years, improvement in all these processes to get the best outcomes has been fairly flat. You know, you see some slope slightly up, some slope slightly down, but I think in general we're pretty flat, uh, which means, you know, all the work that's been done over the last 50 years, um, we're still not seeing the improvements that we should. Uh, so, you know, question is why is that? So I think the next step is, uh, to sort of run simulations of these different scenarios, with or without standby, with or without cardiopulmonary support, 
<laughs> what medications are being used, all those things that I listed in the deep dive that we're working on uh, to really dig down and try to figure out what, you know, how do we improve this? Um, and the other very important thing uh, is improving data collection during cases. One of the biggest problems that I've seen is um, data loggers, temperature loggers. Temperature loggers fail. They put uh, the probes and, and nasal pharyngeal probes into the nostrils. Ice water gets in there and, and it skews the readings. You know, all kinds of things like this. Uh, you know, how do we improve that? How do we improve those processes? How do we make sure the data loggers are always working? How do we make sure that the data doesn't get lost? How do we make sure that you know, we need to make sure the data loggers are set up properly? You know, there's a whole bunch of things that need to be looked at to improve that sort of thing. So you know, the analysis is only as good as the data that we're getting. So you know, and I, like I said, I've seen improvements in the last few years uh, in, in, in those processes and recording all the information. Uh, so I think they're starting to make more progress. Um, so let's go back to unattended deaths. Uh, out of all the, all the cases, only 13% are unattended deaths. Um, and here's the top highest estimate score. As you can see, we're back to the same thing. Unattended deaths and postmortem third parties. 70% of the highest estimate scores are unattended deaths. Now we want to mitigate that as much as possible. Um, why are unattended deaths bad? Well, 54% of unattended deaths are straight freezes. That's the last thing you want because you get ice formation, damages all the tissues. Um, of uh, all the cases, uh, only 12%, all, 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 all non-unattended deaths, only 12% of those cases were straight freezes. So there's a big disparity here. We need to figure out how to improve unattended deaths. Uh, the other thing is autopsies. Autopsies, depending on what degree of autopsy they do, some autopsies, the worst case, they slice up the brain into slices. Uh, difficult to repair, you know? So we want to avoid that as much as possible. Alpha actually does a pretty good job of avoiding autopsies. I've read a lot of cases with autopsies uh, that they've gone to great lengths, lawyers, courts, judges, uh, to get... If not, the autopsies, if not stopped, minimized to CAT scans or, or full body autopsies without slicing up the brain. So Alcor does make great strides to prevent autopsies as much as possible. A um, little bit deeper into this, uh, look at the types of unattended deaths. One thing stood out to me, suicides. 40% uh, of the unattended deaths or suicides. That's probably the hardest thing to mitigate. How do you mitigate somebody from, you know, that's the big question, right, when it comes to suicide. How do you mitigate this? And surprisingly, you know, in the, in the, um, in our world, you would think suicide wouldn't be as big of a problem, but it, it still is. Um, and the other situations, you know, people just home alone, die in their sleep, die at home, not down for days, hours, at a time. And, you know, I just wanted to point out, uh, there was one suicide that was not in the top 10 where they actually called the police before they committed suicide. So a team, an SST team was able to get there pretty quickly. The other challenge you have with suicide is they become uh, medical examiner cases. And the medical examiner may not, you know, there's a question of the autopsy, and then how long before the medical examiner lets the SST team get in and start procedures? Um, so, you know, how do you mitigate these unattended deaths? Uh, you know, um, Emil was talking earlier about an app that, that they have put out there. Uh, there's an app called Snug in the United States. It doesn't work here. I tried it the other, yesterday. Didn't, I had to get a VPN so I could do it in the U.S. Um, but th that app does similar to what Emil was talking about. Uh, you press a button and you have to check in daily at a certain time. You can set those times. And if you don't respond to it a number uh, by a certain time, it sends out emergency text messages to your emergency contacts. 
uh, Alcor has made available a service that they call you once a day and check in on you and make sure you're still okay. Uh, and if, if you don't respond, they call your emergency contacts as well. Um, and the technologies, like Emil was talking about, the Apple Watch, uh, send a text message for uh, uh, fall detection. There's also some limited cardiac testing that the Apple Watch can do. And it, while it doesn't call uh, emergency contacts, it will alert the user that there is some sort of issue, whether it's atrial fibrillation or, or what have you. Um, and again, suicide are the most difficult uh, unattended deaths to mitigate. You know, I've seen cases where nobody knew that the suicide was going to happen, and they just found the, the patient days, days and days later, uh, and situations where Alcor staff has spent days talking to a suicidal patient, and, you know, in the end, it, it didn't help when you have the same problems of a scan of time, finding the patient. Um, I just wanted to do a comparison of the highest and lowest ESMIC scores. So as you can see, those ESMIC scores, the highest, pretty high, 40 hours of ischemic uh, exposure. Um, and the lowest is 0.8. Those are, uh, you know, one thing to note about that is most of the lowest scores are local cases. And even the one that was not with a field cloud preservation, so they did the cloud preservation in the field in a decent amount of time. And that's equivalently a local case because of that. Um, just to do a comparison, uh, one thing you'll notice here, one thing that stands out is the time it took to get the patient down to zero degrees Celsius uh, post um, circulatory arrest. On the left, on the lowest cases, four hours, around four hours seems to be the average. You've got a three there. And then on the highest scores, 156 hours, 213 hours, and you know that's where you see those long ischemic times and get these high ESMIC scores. Um, so another thing to talk about is cooling rates. Cooling rates are very important. Uh, the, the quicker, I, so these are cooling rates during cardiopulmonary support. So the quicker we get these cooling rates down, the better for outcome for the patient. But what we're seeing here in this green trend line is sort of the same situation as we've seen in the ESMIC scores, where over time, our cooling rates have been going up when we want them to go down. Uh, you know, I still, I still look at these results and I'm like, what happened here and how do we fix this? Um, so I want to go over some of the highest and lowest cooling rates, just to give you an idea. Uh, 0.3 degrees Celsius per minute highest. Uh, this is again, this is during cardiopulmonary support. 0 0.005 degrees per Celsius per minute um, is our lowest. So I, I did a quick comparison. I think cooling rates are a little bit more challenging to determine what's causing these lower and higher cooling rates. Um, one thing you'll notice here, well, on the right, one thing you'll notice is the temperature data is a challenge in a lot of these case reports and a lot of these case files. So that makes it more difficult to understand, you know, why we're getting uh, that trend line in the cooling rates. Uh, you'll notice all of these had full cardiopulmonary support. Uh, so that doesn't have, that doesn't seem to have that big of an impact, although and I'll, once I get to the next slide, we do feel, still feel that getting good CPS is important to getting these cooling rates down. Um, the only big difference here is the time it took to start uh, external cooling. So on the highest cooling rates, external cooling was started much quicker than on the lowest cooling rates. So that's the big thing that stands out here. You know, it's always, it's all about time, right? How quickly can we get these things done? Uh, I want to point out a couple of specific cases, James Gallagher and Arlene Freed. Uh, these are the highest cooling rates within the first 10 and 30 minutes post uh, circulatory arrest. Uh, James Gallagher, they did an experimental procedure where they did peri uh, peritoneal and gastric lavage, which they started before they started the CPS. And that 
that gave the, that's 1.05 uh, in the first 10 minutes for James Gallagher and 0.56 degrees Celsius per minute in the first 30 minutes. Arlene Freed, she was 36 kilograms, that's 80 pounds. She cooled down fairly quickly. Uh, so, you know, just some examples of high cooling rates. And, you know, the question is, how do we get these cooling rates down? And some of these, there's some experimental procedures uh, that you know, we can use to get these cooling rates down. That one for James Gallagher is one example of that. Uh, so, you know, cooling rates decrease, the cooling rate decreases during the CPS. So the cooler you get, the longer it takes to get even cooler than that. This is basic physics. Um, and we, we've, so far we've this, we think that the optimum cooling rates are between 0.25 and 0.5 degrees Celsius per minute. So that's sort of what we think they need to shoot for in terms of these cooling rates. Um, and again, you know, aggressive CPS basically uh, to get the blood flowing in whatever, especially in the cases of you know, some of these experimental uh, things where we're putting uh, cooler uh, materials into the body and circulating it through the body to try to get it to cool down quicker. Uh, so in summary, um, by the end of the year, we're going to have a comprehensive report, which we're going to get to Alcor. That'll be an internal Alcor thing for now, and they will decide you know, what we share publicly from there. Um, again, the ESMIC trend, mostly flat, seemingly a slight uh, tendency towards increase. Need to figure out how to improve these things by looking at all the different factors. Um, unattended deaths are a problem. You know, those are, and those are the worst case. How do we mitigate it? Uh, some of the uh, highest and lowest ESMIC observation, uh, cooling rates are trending up. Uh, and, you know, I think what we're going to do is really, you know, what we'd like to see is a continuation of working with all this data, working on sort of this meta-analysis and digging more deeper into all the things that I spoke about here, all of these deep dives, you know, find these areas, really do some modeling and find these areas that impacts uh, how much ischemic time the, the patients uh, experience and try to improve the, uh, the outcomes. Any questions? Do, I knew you would have some. <laughs> yeah. I need to repeat your question because otherwise yeah, yeah, it okay. pick up. I'm hard of hearing too, so you might have to repeat. No worries. Yeah, there, so yeah, there are some recommendations, and that's part of what the deep dives are. That's going to be part of those deep dives. Briefly repeat the question and the answer. Okay. The last thing might not Max, Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't do it up here, but it, well, there was one situation where I don't think I took the outliers out of that one. Um, yeah, that's a good point. That's something else to look at to take out those outliers out of the local cases. But that was a little bit surprising. Real quick for the for the live stream. Yeah, sorry. If we took out outliers, there was a lot of taking out outliers and local cases at the same time. Right? Please. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you have a comment on this? Uh, Ashwin will be the person to talk about that. Uh, he's in. The, he's speaking after me. He has more information on that. The question was if there's yeah. a correlation. No worries. The question, I the question was if there's here a correlation yeah. um, between the CT scans. And the ethnic data. Come on. So you say they could say to each point if they were going to be protected outside the and you would say that normally for the patient they would be in a situation where they totally got cooling rate. You still they would say to be high outside the region. Right. So the question was for the cooling rates, uh, at what point are we talking about cooling rates? Uh, and at what, what stage of the process. So what I showed here was during cardiopulmonary support. Those were the cooling rates for that. 
Um, and the second slide that I showed just gave some examples of cooling rates in the first 10 minutes and 30 minutes uh, post uh, circulatory arrest. Uh, so, right, so that, that varies. Most of the time, it's pharyngeal temperatures. Sometimes you'll have tympanic, sometimes you'll have rectal, but the majority is, is pharyngeal. Eric? How does the original India uh, compare So that, I think that factored into the S mix uh, um, uh, formation, and Ashwin would be the person to answer that question. And really quick for the audience, the question yeah. was if the e data um, by Harris and Hickson um, somehow factored into uh, the ethnic measurement developed by Perry and Duvall. All right, if there's no more questions from the audience. I have a couple more from, from the online audience. Mm -hmm. um, all right, why is 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 degrees per minute optimal when higher cooling rates have been shown to be possible? Ashwin will address that in his talk. He's going to go over some of the cooling rate information. All right. Um, do you have any data about how these members are committing suicide, and do you need to know the age about? Uh, yes, that? most of the cases are confidential, though, so I can't discuss the details. Thanks. That's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. To my knowledge, that is all the questions I'm seeing here. If there's any last-minute questions, now is the time, either from the audience or from the people remote. Right, and then before we go on, I'm briefly stating to every speaker, uh, speak as loudly as possible because the microphone is not the greatest ever, apparently. Um, so speaking loudly is an important, uh, important part. Um, I'll take that. Yes. Okay. All right, as, as the next speaker, speaker, I would introduce Ashwin. All right. In the meantime, I will um, introduce myself. I'm going to speak loud, commend it. So, um, so my name is Arshin Wolf. First of all, I really thank the organization for having me over for a long time. Uh, must be something of hope. Uh, it's really great. I mean, last year we were here and it was very rudimentary, and look where we are now. So, I, I think it's just amazing. Um, so, I am the CEO of Neurobiosciences, which is a neurocryobiology company. More recently, I became the CEO and president of Biosatus Technologies, which is the organization I'm going to talk about primarily during uh, this talk. Um, I also want to thank Michael uh, for setting me up for my own talk because I will be drawing a lot on the sort of observations and the data is generated. It's just amazing the amount of work you have put in that, you know, day after day sometimes night after night, entering all the data into a database. It's, it's, it's a tremendous amount of uh, information. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about improving delivery of chronics. I think, you know, based on Michael's uh, presentation, I think it's fair to say that there are opportunities for improvement. Um, so we created this new organization called Biostasis Technologies. It's a nonprofit. We incorporated it in New York. And we have a number of objectives. And I want to highlight three here right now. One is to do very focused human cryopreservation research and development. Um, or you might say, like, is it not already going on? Are cryonics organizations not doing that? Are there not research? And the, the answer is yes, but because chronic organizations often find themselves running from one case to another. There is not really a lot of time to actually look at the data, to really do very thorough debriefings and analysis and make recommendations. And um, it, it's really hard to do when you're running from one case to another. And that also was the motivation behind the meta analysis project to really dive deep into that stuff. And of course, we have a lot of ideas of how in terms of technologies we use, we can improve cryonics. 
case analysis and meta-analysis, we heard a lot about that. We, uh, our aim is to continue that. So uh, Max Moore uh, recently said maybe when Elper has this CT scanner, we can even have more robust data. So maybe that project will continue through biostasis technology. We don't know yet, but at any rate, we will be uh, uh, a source for any sort of chronic organization we consider legit uh, to, to look at their data, of course, in a, in a confidential way and, and, and analyze it. So this project will be ongoing forever, so to say. Um, yeah, assisting chronic organizations. As I said, chronic organizations often have their hands full already with administrative stuff and doing cases. And there's often not a lot of time to really sit down and ponder a lot of these technical issues. So that is really uh, one thing where we want to serve them. And we also want to serve people in, um, oh, in setting up new, oh, I have to, okay, all right. So yeah, we're headquartered in New York City. It's a nonprofit run by people with very extensive chronic experience. That's sort of really important. Sort of the founding group are basically people who have been around for like 20, 30 years in this field and know a lot of, you know, what has been done, what hasn't worked, what are the persistent problems and so forth. Um, we will be have a clerical uh, and biomedical staff. We hope to do some hiring, additional hiring later this year and early next year. Um, we are a very sort of distributed organization. Some people might work on projects or in other states. It's not necessarily a place where everyone comes together and we're sitting in the same office, although we will have one in, uh, in New York. And um, collaborations already sort of exist with Quranic organizations in terms of you know, helping them sort of formulate meaningful research questions, helping them set up things, making recommendations about equipment and protocols. Um, so what are the advantages for chronic organizations? Well, uh, we can develop standards for chronic procedures. I mean, all chronic organizations are somewhat different, but you could argue there are some sort of basic procedures that every chronic organization that wants to take itself seriously should have in place. Um, we do full-time case review and analysis. We cut uh, organization of chronic case data meta-analysis. I mentioned that scientific and clinical advice, education and training and sort of the, ins the assistance in the creation of cryonics capabilities. That was a topic yesterday during the workshop. It's sometimes very hard for people who are new to the field that like, okay, I wanna do something locally, but what exactly do I do? Like what is the most important equipment that I can buy for a given budget? So we can really uh, assist in that. Um, so before I tell more about sort of the projects that we have going right now, I wanna say something about sort of the reality of uh, cryonics today, and uh, especially uh, SST, which stands for Standby Stabilization and Transport. Um, this is also pulled from the meta-analysis project. As you can see, the overwhelming majority of cases are not local. That is like really big. And I think one theme in Michael's presentation and the meta-analysis project really supports this, but it's also common sense when you're really close to a patient and you can mobilize all this staff that you have, you get a much better outcome than in a remote case. Um, so getting more cases local uh, is gonna be very important, I think. Here you can see the number of cases where people get cardiopulmonary support, uh, which basically, uh, means chest compressions and ventilations. And as you can see, the majority, it's not a huge majority, but it's a slight majority of the, the, the patients at Alcor don't get CPS. So in other words, it's, we, we cannot keep them, their brains viable by contemporary medical criteria by doing chest compression and ventilation. So that's not really good either. Um, okay, so here, ischemic exposure in chronic patients. Um, Michael talked in detail about the S-mix. So here are the median S-mix values by year. Well, as you can see, there's not a clear trend line going up, uh, going down. The S-mix should really go down. Preferably, it should be at zero, but we really do not see that. Um, and I think this realization that there is not really good progress in the delivery side of chronics was really the impetus of creating this organization. And if you look carefully at our logo, you will actually even see sort of these upward lines. It's sort of really important to, to, to turn this around. Here's another example, ice formation in chronics patients. So 
we created a skill that ranges from no ice formation at all to completely straight frozen. There might be one or two cases that have no ice formation according to the CT scans, but it's arbitrary. But some of them look pretty good and you see them there, they would be sort of in the first you know, bar, but a lot of it is over there. And that is one thing that I think sometimes even uh, people with chronic arrangements are not aware of, despite the use of vitrification technologies, you will only get as much or as little ice formation as ischemia permits. So if you have a lot of ischemia, then you get, generally speaking, a lot of ice formation. That's not just an observation in uh, cryonics clinical work, it's also what I have seen in my own lab. It, it, there's a very strong correlation between ischemic time and ice formation in the brain. Um, so what, what are some of the early lessons from the Elker meta-analysis project? Well, case outcomes appear sort of random. It's not like, you know, we're seeing this, this trend. We learn a lot, we learn a lot, and it gets getting better and better. So that, that's somewhat discouraging, all right? The uh, calculated equivalent normothermic exposure is one hour, which is the S-mix. Uh, and ideally, we would like to see that all being less than one hour. We know we can do it because in our best cases, our S-mix values are lower than one hour. Uh, we have ice formation in vitrified brains, often quite a lot of it. Uh, we have this correlation between ischemia and ice formation I talked about. Majority of cases are not local and cases with full CPS are minority. So this sort of recapping sort of what I said earlier. Um, so that creates, I, I, as, as Michael was pointing out in his prior presentation, um, we see this sort of really erratic pattern in the delivery of cryonics. It's not really, I mean, it might be flat, but it's certainly not going up. But what we can do in terms of technologies is going up. You know, we, we, we went from, um, you know, freezing to cryoprotection with high concentrated cryoprotectants to vitrification that can eliminate ice formation. Then we reduce the toxicity of those agents. We develop more rapid cooling techniques, which I will talk about a little later on. Um, we can open the blood brain barrier to prevent shrinking of the brain. So, you know, in the lab, we can do more and more. So the gap actually between what we're capable of and what we're actually delivering is, is increasing. And that's, of course, not good either. I mean, that the lab stuff is going up like that is great, but we would like to really the field to catch up. And that is really sort of the rationale for this organization. That is really our, our really ultimate goal is to translate everything we know into uh, deliverables that really increase the, the, you know, the, the typical outcome of cryonics cases. Um, so here are three projects for 2023. I mean, the year is almost over, so these are pretty much all 2023 projects, but some work has already started on it. Um, one is about rapid cooling technologies. One is whole body field cry protection, and the other is uh, immersion feature fixation, which I will talk about in a moment. Um, we think these things are really, really important. I mean, if you reflect on this, rapid cooling technologies are just really important because especially during the initial stages of cryonics, if you cool really, really fast, you have a really high cooling rate. I mean, as far as I am aware, you know, the higher the cooling rate, the better. Um, you decrease ischemia and you get better outcomes in terms of cry protection and reduction of ice formation. Whole well, body field cry protection is interesting because it can convert a lot of these remote cases into local cases. And that's sort of the beauty of field cry protection. Um, immersion vitrification is sort of a very sort of new concept that we have been talking about, and I will get to this in a moment. Um, Emil talked about it yesterday during the workshop, so it's sort of trending as a way to deal with various ischemic patients and maybe as a low-cost alternative for whole body crowd protection. Um, okay, so I'm going to do two slides that are sort of a little bit nerdy. Um, Mike Perry and I once tried to sort of calculate if you would only do cooling in a cryonic, cryonics patient, how fast you need to cool to outrun ischemia, so to outrun the negative effects of not having any oxygen flowing to the brain and any metabolic support. So we made a number of assumptions. So the patient is not ischemic prior to pronouncement of legal death. That's actually a very generous assumption because we, I think it's fair to say that in many cases that might not be the case, but okay. Uh, cooling is initiated immediately after pronouncement of legal death. 
there is no cardiopulmonary support or administration of neuroprotective agent. We're really looking about the efficiency of cooling here. Uh, brain injury starts at five minutes of warm ischemia. So that's kind of the mainstream sort of opinion on, the, on that. So Q10 is two, and that basically means that, you know, m metabolism is reduced by, by half for every 10 degrees Celsius reduction in temperature. There are no other forms of injury occurring than ischemic injury. Ischemic injury is eliminated at minus 123, and a cooling constant rate is being assumed. Okay, so using these assumptions, uh, a cooling rate of 2.89 degrees per minute is necessary to stay ahead of the equivalent of five minutes of warm ischemia. So if we, that, that, that's really a formidable number. Um, if we assume negligible ischemic insult below zero Celsius, because maybe calculating it all the way down to the glass transition temperature is, is not particularly meaningful, it, it only shaves off a little. We're at 2.66 degrees per minute. Um, so th these numbers cannot be achieved by any known cooling technology, even not ECMO, not liquid ventilation. Uh, that is really, really a fast cooling rate. The good thing is um, cooling is not the only thing we do, right? We do cardiopulmonary support and we give medications uh, that include a number of neuroprotectants. So it, it's not as bad. Um, you know, oxygenation and depressing brain metabolism can maybe reduce that number by at least 50%. We, we don't know sort of how to really quantify it. In the S-mix, we say if there is good CPS, the S-mix for that segment is reduced by 50%. In other words, if you give oxygen to the brain just after pronouncement of that, that these cooling amounts are significantly reduced. But you know, even if you do some mental math, you still would require very high cooling rates. Uh, not the kind of cooling rates that we typically see in chronics. Michael used two really great examples of two cases in which the first 10 minutes of cooling were really, really high. And um, it's non-trivial to pull that off. I like in one of the cases, the patient was literally skin over bone, but that, that helped her tremendously in terms of cooling rates. Um, but in the other case, it was because a lot of different adjunct cooling t technologies were being used. So, and that is a possibility. And there are cooling technologies that we actually haven't tried really in cryonics yet. Um, okay, so how do, how, do you, how do you optimize? What would be a good initial cooling protocol? And I'm talking here about US and probably European cases. We're not talking about cases in countries where maybe the hospitals would say, oh, you know, you can place a cannula and you can put people on bypass or whatever. That, that sounds great. And I think that would be amazing, but it's not really possible in the US to do that. And I doubt that in many European countries, you will be able to do that in the hospital. Um, so right now, the best, uh, cooling protocol would be to place the patient sort of really rapidly in a portable ice bed with recirculating ice water and then do very vigorous high impulse mechanical chest compressions. You want the blood to really circulate and you want the ice water to really stir vigorously. That typically creates the most potent cooling rates. One thing we're going to research is uh, nasal lavage, running an ice cold solution through the nasal cavity to further accelerate cooling and, and brain cooling in particular. Liquid ventilation, which you may have heard a lot about sort of in the last couple of years, but we have a, made a very strong commitment to say like, okay, is this technology going to work or not? So we're going to move it to sort of hopefully sort of the ultimate trials. Uh, rapid cardiopulmonary bypass surgery and cooling is also, of course, really great. Um, many people have argued that if you could people on bypass or ECMO or whatever you want to call it, on any kind of internal cooling that would be great. And it, it would be great. I don't think that is something you can start immediately in a typical chronic uh, situation in the US or Europe, but you should be able to do it fairly rapidly in the vehicle. And um, we're looking into that. I know that tomorrow by Stasis also has expressed a strong interest into seeing how quickly you can get people to internal cooling as opposed to sort of using the ice bath. Okay, um, well, one thing, this is a very trivial thing, and I, I, the reason why I want to highlight that is a lot of this is sort of high-level sort of scientific stuff and data analysis, but in the end, how good a cryonic case, uh, cryonics case runs is very much dependent on logistics. If you don't 
have the logistics right, it doesn't matter what technologies you have. Let's say you have a portable ice bath uh, that, you bring, that you bring up to a patient and then you unfold it and then the patient goes in it and lo and behold, then you have to go down later and it doesn't fit anywhere. You cannot go in the elevator, you cannot go down the stairs. So what do you do? You have to take the patient out and whatever. And then you lose sort of all the gains that you've made. So the logistics of, of cryonics is a very, I think, underrated topic. So I, we're talking about standby stabilization and transport, but I think increasingly we should also be just talking about the logistics of chronics. How comes it all together? Like what exactly do you do to make it work in a specific case, given the constraints that we're operating in, whether it's a hospital or hospice and so forth. Um, in the past, I worked with Charles Platt on an ice bath. There have been a lot of different portable ice baths in chronics and some were very, very hard to put together with like color-coded tubes and it took hours. I mean, these were good first attempts. I mean, we should really be thankful for the people who made these things, but uh, Charles Platt thought we could do a much better job and try to create an, an ice bath that is completely collapsible and that almost has no loose parts. So he actually has been working with us on that. He had made, uh, completely collapsible ice baths in the past, but we made some improvements to that. And as you can see, um, so it weighs like about 20 kilos. There, there are almost no loose pieces. It's so far has been tested with 150 kilograms. It has easily detachable wheels. It fits in the back of a car. And that's the interesting thing. This, this ice bath can ha both have legs or it has no legs. Um, because if you have an ice bed with legs and the only transport you have available is an SUV or a small car, it's not going to do you any good. You, you can just not fit it in. So this is getting back to the sort of the whole logistics thing. So the beauty of this ice bed design is it can operate on the ground, but it can also operate in legs. And if you can operate with legs, it sort of makes it easier you now to administer medications or to do manual threads compressions or to do surgery later on in the vehicle. One person can lift it, uh, both ends fold to fit in elevators. So you can even sort of collapse on both ends the ice bath if really necessary. Um, so there's ample space for large patients. It's designed for sort of very generously for, you know, the, the typical American, I would say. Um, so, um, so here's an example of uh, a model. Um, so here you see it with the legs. And uh, well, as you can see, it, the only thing is missing here is the liner, right? The, the thing you put in to contain the ice water. Um, okay, and so you see it here. Here you see the real ice bed in its unfolded side, and uh, the gentleman behind it is Charles Platt. So um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's really a great piece of work, I think. As I said, there are almost no loose parts. So it is like, you know, uh, an accordion, you just fold it out, you put the liner on, and you should be good to go. The version you see here is the one low to the ground because we're still working on the legs. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I think this is a, a really good design and it's, it, it, it further builds on what he has done in the past. And I think it really has a lot of the advantages uh, of prior ice bed and none of the disadvantages. So I think, I think it, it's a good piece of work. Um, okay, so getting to the next, uh, project that we're gonna take on liquid ventilation. That probably requires a little bit of, of an, uh, an introduction. So what you do in liquid ventilation, you actually um, infuse an inert oxygen carrying liquid into the lungs in and out, and it's a very cold liquid. So what that, because all your blood flows through the lungs, it basically, your lungs operate sort of as a heat exchanger that keeps sort of imparting uh, cold to the rest of the body. And if you keep pumping it in and out, you can create cooling rates that are vastly superior than anything you can do um, by just doing external ice bath cooling. And the beauty of liquid ventilation is that unlike uh, CPB or ECMO, you don't need any surgical access. You just need to place an endotracheal tube in the throat and then you hook up the equipment and then it will cycle in and out the um, the liquid and over the, I mean, this, <laughs> the idea of liquid ventilation for chronics was envisioned by Michael Darwin in the mid nineties. And so here we are, and we, we still don't have that. And I've always been greatly dissatisfied by that. And uh, I'm currently working with a group of people to really put this project back on the map. I mean, will this pan out to work really well in chronics? I cannot say that, but what I do want to do is wrap it up either 
you know, this is gonna work for cryonics or we have to conclude that it's not as promising as we thought. So we're really now probably going to take the, the final step in doing cadaver cooling studies to see how this works. Uh, sometimes liquid ventilation has been um, called a bypass to a bypass. So in an ideal case, you have sort of very rapid cooling externally, then you hook people up immediately to the liquid vent uh, machine. And then when a patient is being transported, then you do your surgery and you go to bypass. And that would be basically, I think, the highest cooling rates that you could ever squeeze out of a chronics case. And in conjunction with very good cardiopulmonary support and neuroprotective medications, we might be able to say, okay, we keep the brain viable by contemporary biological criteria. And think about it, that's just sort of amazing. These people are pronounced dead, but we sort of keep them alive with our technologies because it facilitates you know, the best long-term preservation, but also it facilitates ice-free cryopreservation. So that's why this is important. So what we wanna do is build a new prototype or actually complete a prototype that, um, that had been started a little while ago and then test the operation and the cooling in maybe experimental cases or uh, cadavers, probably both, and then implementation in chronics if it looks like it's as promising as we thought it would be. Um, whole body field crowd protection, it's another thing that me and others have strongly uh, advocated right now. Uh, well, let, let me back up a little. Um, field crowd protection, um, the reason why we call it that way is and not field cryopreservation is the only thing we do in the field is introduce the cryoprotectants and then typically we ship on dry ice to the chronic facility and the only thing that happens there is cooling to liquid nitrogen temperatures. Um, one of the beauty of uh, field cryoprotection, whether it's whole body or neuro, is that cryoprotection is conducted on site or, or during transport in a vehicle and that eliminates all the cold ischemia that you typically see during uh, a remote cryonics case. Well, think about that. It basically means that, you know, unless you have these very unfortunate cases like unattended death, suicide, or whatever, you have a case with standby. It is remote, but that shouldn't matter. So the, the distinction between local and remote will be basically, uh, uh, will disappear when you have field crowd protection and uh, you know, much to my you know, relief, um, um, Biostasis Technologies is already pursuing that for themselves and also in their vehicle. Um, and there's actually one other advantage of whole body field crowd protection. It only requires one deployment instead of two because the reason the way it goes right now is you, let's say you have a case in, in Chicago in the United States, then a standby team goes there and there's this whole deployment and then they stabilize the patient and you know, at most they would do a blood washout and then ship to Alcor and then there will still be a whole crowd protectant perfusion procedure. So you basically have two deployments. Uh, field crowd protection reduces that to one single employment in which um, uh, CPS is immediately followed by, by crowd protection and shipping on, right now we do dry ice. So that's sort of another advantage. Um, but, uh, Clearly, this is very new, um, although it's the technology that is currently being envisioned being done for uh, patients of uh, tomorrow biostasis. Of course, we don't have a lot of empirical experience with it yet. So there are some research topics that are of interest, like what is the right sort of surgical technique? Like, you know, do we go through the chest or do we, you know, access the carotids or, you know. Um, another thing is, do we, do we do everything in a single pass? If we do that, we have to use an enormous amount of perfusate, um, or would it be possible to recirculate the last step and, and, and reduce perfusate? Because if you have to ship <laughs> hundreds of liters of perfusate to a remote location, that's clearly, that's not trivial. Um, another really interesting topic that itself, you know, could warrant a whole presentation is, do we use the same vitrification agent in field crowd protection? And a reason why we might do that differently is if you ship a patient back on dry ice and they will reach dry ice temperature, there is no further cooling. And 
most current vitrification agents have something called the critical cooling rate or critical warming rate when you go up. You have to cool at a certain rate to prevent ice formation. If someone is static at dry ice temperature, you actually prime that patient sort of for, for ice formation. You don't want that. Um, there are a variety of ways about that. Uh, I mean, if you transport on ground and you reach a cryonics facility before they even reach that temperature, I mean, that's great, but it might not always be possible. So you could use vitrification agents that are even more concentrated than we use right now that cannot freeze regardless of cooling rate or warming rate, that you can just not freeze those solutions. Um, um, transport vehicle versus air, uh, I think vehicle probably would be preferred because you can basically start a procedure in a vehicle and if there's anything that needs to be done, you can do that in the vehicle if your patient is on dry ice in, in, in an airplane and there are multiple, multiple delays, you have a very big problem on your hands. Um, and then the other thing is dry ice versus cryogenic transport. I mean, in the ideal world, you would even do the cryogenic cool down uh, on site because you go really quick to the cryogenic temperature, so you further mitigate any opportunities for ice formations. But cryogenic transport is probably non-trivial, especially for whole body patients. It might be an option for brains, actually, um, which I'm going to talk about right now. Um, so, uh, Emil, yesterday at the workshop, talked a little about uh, the idea of brain uh, vitrofixation. And the long technical word would be diffusion aldehyde stabilized cryopreservation. Well, that doesn't roll off so well. So, so I, um, vitrofixation is a lot better. And I came up with this uh, lowercase, you know, I in front, which stands for immersion. And um, the reason why we started thinking about this is there are two, two reasons. One of them is technical and the other one is financial. If you have a lot of ischemia in a patient, it's, 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 it's really not possible. At least we tried a lot. In fact, we have conducted some research for EBF last year, trying all kinds of different protocols to still mitigate ice formation after long periods of ischemia, but we have not been particularly successful. So that raises a question, is there still an other way in which you could eliminate ice formation in the brain? At least that, that's the most important organ, even if your whole body. And the answer is yes, there might be. Um, what you could do is you, you isolate the brain, so that you remove the brain, and then you immerse it in a chemical fixative, formaldehyde, fluoraldehyde, and then after fixation is complete, you do all your steps of, you know, brain crab protection, you know, 5%, 10%, and so forth. And then, you know, you do your usual long-term storage and liquid nitrogen, you know, or intermediate temperature storage if you have that capability. So what would be some of the advantages of that procedure? Well, it can be performed regardless of postmortem delay. And that is a huge benefit because classic cryonics only works as well as you know, your response time. If you have a lot of ischemia, I have re <laughs> reiterated this point over and over, but it's really important to understand. It's like, you cannot get a good cry protection, at least not in terms of eliminating ice formation. And if you do brain immersion, you don't have those limitations. You can just place the brain in the fixative or the cry protectant, and it will just diffuse throughout the whole brain. Uh, brain isolation can be performed by funeral director, medical examiner, there is a caveat to that though. They might do that in a way that is fine for an autopsy, but it's not particularly good for us. So we have to really think about a very rigorous uh, brain isolation protocol for such cases. Um, there's no additional sort of surgical medical perfusion skills required because it's an immersion procedure. So you're not running pumps, priming circuits, looking you know, at the oxygenator and whatever. Uh, there's actually minimum use of fixative and cry protectants. And I was saying earlier, in like classic field cry protection, it, it, it uses enormous amount of cry protectant, at least for whole body cases. Here, you don't have very much because you just have a container sort of with the brain. And of course, it gets occasionally replenished, but it's still a lot less than you would use in a perfusion case. Uh, well, the procedure can be done during ground transport. It's like it's, you know, you, you just, well, just, I mean, you need a container to sort of stabilize the brain and do that procedure. And uh, brain 
uh, brain only cryopreservation has sort of the longest, uh, you know, the lowest long term storage costs. It certainly has that advantage still over neuro. I mean, one of the purported advantages of neuro cryopreservation is cheaper, but brain is at least 50% uh, less expensive, and I think I would argue also a lot less controversial. But the major advantage of brain only versus neuro is that you can use emerging. It wouldn't make sense to to put the whole head in sort of a container and then to try through diffusion sort of to get the cryoprotectant or fixative in. So I see two scenarios for using this kind of procedure. One is where cases are so, if there's so much ischemia that you either have to do a straight freeze or just say, well, we do cryoprotective perfusion, but you get a lot of ice formation anyway. I mean, we see that in the CT scans. And the other application is as a low cost alternative for whole body. Um, I personally have never felt too comfortable with the idea of neuropreservation for, I think, a lot of sort of, you know, popular reasons, but I think a lot of these arguments don't really apply to brain cryopreservation. And it, it is also the cheapest, so that's great. I think it's less controversial and it's also a lot less costly. Um, so this is a really interesting application of the S-mix to something different than stabilization. What we did here is look what, what the optimal temperature was for immersion fixation, immersion cryoprotection. So if we do it sort of at room temperature, then you get an, and uh, we tried to model how long it would take for the fixative to read the core of the brain. So if you do it at room temperature, <laughs> you get an equivalent normothermic temperature, you know, of more than 20 hours. If you do it close to zero at very low, ultra profound hypothermic temperatures, that is strongly reduced. And because you take advantage of one of the main principles of hyperthermic organ preservation, and that is if you lower the temperature, the, 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 the reduction in metabolism is a lot stronger than the reduction in diffusion rate. So you still have reasonably good diffusion, but your metabolism is strongly reduced. So I would be very surprised if this becomes a practical protocol that we would not be doing this procedure like really close to zero degrees C. Although you can see the difference between like zero and five is not like, like really great. It's really coming down sort of from room temperature, let alone normothermic temperatures that would go even higher than this. So this is sort of a really interesting thing. My parent, I model this and the next step would be to actually empirically look at what does this procedure entail? How long does it in reality take for a fixative to reach the core of the brain? And then, you know, how do we measure cryoprotection by doing immersion? So here's an example of, uh, you know, I fit for, fit for fixation. I get, to, I get to get used to it myself still. Um, in practice, this was an Alcor case that was immersion cryoprotected with 10 molar glycerol, which is an insanely unholy concentration of glycerol, but we could do that because the brain was already fixed. And you know, if you tried to perfuse that, it would take like really forever and you could not even do it at low temperatures because it's so thick, but that was not a problem for immersion. And this is a photo actually made um, in liquid nitrogen. And as you can see, I mean, you don't have to have a very strong cryobiology background to see this brain is clearly not frozen. And of course, we cannot see the interior of it, but this looks pretty good. And I've seen this in my lab a lot. I mean, the difference between the frozen brain, sort of the exterior of it, and a vitrified brain is, is really stark. So it works. And this is a brain that had an amount of ischemia. If we would have done normal cryoprotectin perfusion, we would have ended up with a brain full of ice. So that is pretty cool, I think. Um, well, but there's still open question. I mean, this is all very, sort of very new. Uh, I think the, the idea that this might even be possible um, came about like five, six years ago when I first presented some data showing that brains stored at very low temperatures, like between zero and five, actually retain their fine structure for quite some time because you will need that time for the immersion. Um, so, um, and you addressed this point yesterday in the workshop. So what is the cutoff point? Like, where do you say we're no longer going to do cryoprotectant perfusion and we're going to do brain immersion? And of course, there's also an informed consent issue because some whole body members might say, well, 
you know, even if I'm cryopreserved with my whole body, I, I just don't want the procedure to be done. That's conceivable, you know. I mean, I would prefer it myself, but although I am whole body, uh, to at least subject my brain to it, but you never know, right? Is formaldehyde only sufficient? Formaldehyde is, has a much lower molecular weight than glutaraldehyde, so maybe it diffuses faster. That's, so that's something you need to look at. Uh, clearly, if the brain is not washed out, there might be a lot of residual blood. So sort of how does that interact with the fixative? You know, is, the, is that an obstacle? Um, what one, one really uh, not trivial problem is actually how do you determine when the core of the brain has been fixed? Because, uh, and we're really brainstorming about that, but maybe we could do something with a dye or a CT scan, because you need to know, you, you cannot go yet to crap protection uh, before you have a good uh, feel that the brain is actually chemically fixed, because only when the brain is chemically fixed, you ha then, then ischemia comes to a halt, a chemically fixed brain, at, even at room temperature, at least for, you know, short and medium term duration is, is stable. Uh, so that's important. And are there any contraindications for this procedure? I don't know, I'm, we're just starting with it. Maybe if there's bacterial infection in the brain, maybe there might be all kinds of scenarios in which this might not be a good idea, but. Um, okay, so how do we move forward on this project? So we wanna formalize a brain isolation protocol, uh, Chana Phaedra, uh, my, my ex-founder of uh, Advanced Neurobiosciences wrote one of the first sort of brain isolation protocols for chronics. But if we're getting serious about this, I think it, it needs to be further refined because minimizing damage to the brain is going to be very important. Uh, we have to design and professionalize immersion equipment and protocols. Um, Matthew Sullivan uh, earlier this year showed the first sort of prototype to do this procedure, but we already had some ideas of how to move forward and make it even better. Um, compare fixatives, or maybe there are certain fixative combinations that work better. Can we accelerate the fixation rate? Maybe a higher concentration of the fixative, maybe by stirring the bath. Um, we certainly want to obtain electromicrographs. That I think is going to be really important to be able to sign off on this and say, okay, this looks pretty good. And uh, yeah, design sort of long-term storage solutions for these brains. I mean, that would be ideal for uh, intermediate temperature storage prevention of cracking because we would assume that they completely vitrify and would not have any uh, ice formation. Okay, well, that's it. That's it. And um, I want to thank uh, some entities um, that really supported us throughout this, uh, the Biomedical Research and Longevity Society, BRS. I mean, uh, as some of you know, you know, Bill, Bill Faloon and Saul Kent have been sort of the most generous supporters of this field for a long, long time. It's just, it's hard to, you know, overestimate how, how supportive they are. Alcor has been supporting a lot of the stuff we do, including the meta-analysis project. Blue Phoenix, kind of a new player, has encouraged a lot of interesting research. And then European Biostasis Foundation, who is like really enthusiastic about, I think, a lot of the stuff that we talked about. And uh, we have done some initial sort of research collaborations with them as well. And uh, I, I, I wanted to announce our website here, and we had so much to do, we didn't have time, but hopefully soon we'll have the website up. And, uh, but for now, there's an email address if you sort of want to write us. And I want to close with one thing, which is, I think, really important. Um, so earlier this year, uh, we uh, published a book by Robert Freitas called Cryostasis Revival. I walked with three copies uh, in my hand to, uh, to the conference today. It's really heavy, but uh, it's, it, it's really the most comprehensive, detailed, technical work ever written on chronics. It's just like I reviewed the manuscript. It took me months, but it, it's, really, it's really great. It's more than 700 pages. It has 3,000 reference and 300 research topics to work out the ideas in the book. So if anyone, you know, tries to sort of critique the idea of Quranics, they would have to engage sort of with the work here. This is a very detailed exposition of how we're actually going to revive people. I, so I have two copies with me if you want, want to buy one, but on Amazon it's for sale as well. I think in the US, I think there's prime shipping. So, but I don't know how it works sort of in Europe, but I strongly recommend to, you know, read this book, give it to your friends, or as especially bring it to the attention of skeptics, because I think almost 
every conceivable objection to cryonics that is technical is addressed in this work. So, you know, thanks for, you know, to Robert Freitas for writing such a magnificent poem. So that's it. Thank you. Awesome, man. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Ask for quick answers to get everybody to okay. the coffee break. Yeah. So first of all, is the chart flat ice band um, expensive? Is it viable? Um, and is it air transportable in a pelican case, for example? Okay. So the question was: you have to repeat the questions again for no, you. Oh, oh, okay, that's great. Um, all right. So um, yes. Uh, so we're in the final stages of prototyping and we're gonna do some testing. We wanna even put more weight in it and you know, like literally sort of bump it around. But if we feel it's a good ice bed, then yes, uh, we wanna make it available. I, it's not gonna be terribly expensive. I think, you know, in the low thousands of dollars probably, but you know, I, I don't wanna commit myself to a number sort of at this point. And yes, it will be uh, air transportable. Uh, in fact, we're currently actually looking at what are the best sort of uh, safe uh, cases for that ice bath to uh, transport them. Yeah. Um, for nas nasal lavage, um, how do you measure temperature at that point, you too? Yeah, so that's a good question. I, I think that would necessitate, I'm not percent sure, but I think that would necessitate to doing tempanic temperature measurements and rectal. And rectal is something you should do anyway because it's kind of free. Uh, you have to do like a rectal occlusion device in chronics anyway. And so it might require that we do tympanic or any other, you know, yeah, uh, temperature measurement. That's more sort of like EMS personnel is probably very proficient in finding good locations to, uh, to do that. Yeah. Right. And then two more quick questions. Uh, yeah. For a wealthy client, what would like, you know, let's assume money is not an issue. Um, what would be the perfect procedure? Uh, within reason, of course. Yeah, well, I, I assume the question refers to something that is legal, right? Because the, the, the perfect procedure would be hospital-based elective cryopreservation. I actually wrote the protocol on how that would look like, but that's not realistic at this point. Uh, it would be, yeah, basically being really close to, you know, your uh, cryonics provider. I mean, as we have seen, local is really important. And I think even with field cryo protection, I would still rather be close to the facility and then, yeah, have all these features that we talked about, you know, liquid ventilation, rapid, you know, CPS, uh, you know, may maybe uh, a crap protectant perfusion procedure that's assisted by CT scans. Um, but the most important thing, I think, is not necessarily technical, but is logistical and to make sure, you know, you're at the right place at the right time and maybe take advantage if you're in a country or a state of laws that allow you to have some uh, you know, influence over your time of, uh, of death. That is probably very important. That's another thing we saw in the meta-analysis project in the few cases where people had that opportunity. These are generally good cases because you know exactly when to mobilize. Right, and last but not least, combining two questions. Um, what would be, what level of ischemia would you recommend to, well, at what point would you switch over to IV certification? And how much damage can happen during extraction of the brain? So how much is that, how, how dangerous is the procedure? Yeah. Um, in terms of what point of ischemia, that, that is a sort of little hard to answer because you have usually sort of normothermic ischemia and then a period of cold ischemia. What we do know is that if you have multiple hours of normothermic ischemia, we actually modeled it in our lab for three hours, you get a pretty, pretty bad result. And I think that shows also in, uh, in L4 CT scans. So when you talk about multiple hours of normothermic ischemia, that's not good. If it would be only cold ischemia, you can go for quite a bit longer, but it's actually rare to have only cold ischemia and no normothermic ischemia because you cannot sort of mysteriously sort of appear at zero degrees C. Um, the other question was... How dangerous the procedure? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, you can take out a brain for, let's say, forensic purposes, and it doesn't matter if, you know, whole chips come off the brain. We really don't want that. So I don't think... Uh, we would feel comfortable with a procedure like that, unless it's an extreme emergency case, uh, to do this until we have validated a very sort of safe, long-term preservation, safe way of, of brain removal. And uh, as I said in my presentation, uh, we have a protocol for that, but this has to be validated in, uh, you know, 
uh, maybe through cadaver studies and, and other things to make it really sort of a safe procedure because the last thing you want is that people just do a hack job and then yeah, you, you get good vitrification but the brain is in many pieces and some pieces are just sort of disappeared. Ashwin, thank you so much. Yeah. We would come back after a coffee break. I'd like to say that we would get at 12.05 to give everybody 20 minutes. So for everybody online, 12.05, we continue with the talk.
right, welcome back after a brief coffee break with our next speaker, Aaron Drake. I'll hand over the mic. Very good. Good afternoon, everybody, and good night and good morning, depending upon where you are around the world watching this. Um, glad you could all make it. If you don't know who I am, my name is Aaron Drake. I've been involved in the cryonics industry for about 14 years now. For the first seven, I was with uh, working with Max at Alcor uh, as their medical response director. Um, after that, I have spent the last seven years uh, working as a consultant. I've worked on some major projects like uh, developing the Infung Bio program in China, uh, helping develop international cryomedicine experts, which is an SST team providing services around the world, um, to consulting and training for Southern Cryonics, uh, doing some feasibility analysis for Cryonics for You in Thailand, so in a, in a variety of smaller projects. So I've been working on a variety of things. Um, during that time, I've been involved in about uh, 99 cryopreservations, one short of 100. Uh, so you probably think I'm here to talk about SST, but, 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 but I'm not. Today I want to actually talk about, about ECMO. Um, I was supposed to come last year and talk. Uh, however, Alcor set me on a, on a case just hours before I was to hop on the plane. Uh, to, uh, so I went to Canada instead. So I appreciate Emil bringing me back again this year and giving me an opportunity to talk. Um, ever since the very first cryopreservation back in 1967, uh, Dr. Bedford, um, we've been looking at ways to improve this process. Um, doctors and scientists have contributed their work. Uh, new chronic service organizations have been formed. Uh, there's been testing done on the medications. Uh, cryoprotectants have been improved. Even support organizations like all of us here today have uh, done everything they can to really help try to improve this process and have a greater chance for success. One of the latest developments and advancements has been attempting to integrate ECMO into the stabilization process, the, the preliminary part. Now, now, what is this word, this buzzword, ECMO? Well, the medical acronym stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. That's, that's a pretty fancy medical term. For lay people, what does it really mean? It means basically a cardio and pulmonary bypass. Okay, So what does that essentially do? In conventional medicine, when a patient experiences cardiac arrest, it really becomes a race against time. Uh, to correct that, they have things like defibrillators. They have advanced cardiac life support medications. Uh, they've got uh, hypothermia that they can use. They can do emergency cardiac surgery. But they have minutes to reverse that arrest and try to resuscitate that, that person back to health. If they don't, we all know what happens. Damage begins to happen. There's stress involved in the tissues. There's ischemia. You've heard that term thrown around here today. It begins to develop. We, and then eventually, you know, damage and necrosis where that tissue is no longer dead. So they have to correct that really within minutes to try to prevent that. They've got ways to do this, you know. They, they can, as I mentioned, they can use all those tools available. Um, but there is also another type of tool that they can do, and that is ECMO. I'll get into that a little bit. Um, the problem with <laughs> running a code like that in the aftermath uh, uh, running one of those, is it's not just restarting the heart. They have to actually figure out what is wrong with the patient. What's causing that heart to stop? What's causing those lungs from, from rebreathing again? Without finding that out, the patient's going to revert back into uh, cardiac arrest, respiratory arrest. They, they have tools to do this. I mean, obviously, they can do chest x-rays. They can do blood labs. They can do arterial blood gases. Uh, they can do CT scans, MRI scans, uh, they can do emergency cardiac surgery, but until they find out why that patient is doing that, 
that patient's just gonna revert back into the same problem in many, many cases. So the way to do that and protect against that race against time is by using ECMO. So what happens with, with ECMO is it basically gives the doctors time to figure out all of that. ECMO is a, is, is a way to replace the heart's function, replace the lung's function, and, and keep, keep the body going. They're hooked up to this machine, which takes the blood out of the body. It cools it. We know how important cooling is, right? It cools it. It filters it. It oxygenates it. And it brings it back into the body. The body can actually survive for an extended period of time in this state. This gives those doctors the time to figure out what's wrong. Okay, now I'm really talking about conventional uh, uh, applications for this, conventional medicine applications. But uh, people can be on ECMO for an extended period of time, hours, days, weeks, months. No heart function, no lung function. This is actually keeping them alive. It's as efficient, or actually probably more efficient at keeping the perfusion and the metabolism going in their body than what their body was doing before the end of life. Typically, ECMO is used, is considered to be used for about 60 days maximum. But there have been cases where they've gone up to 180 days, six months where they've been using ECMO, keeping the patient alive before they can successfully recover. Now, this is a really old picture, it's kind of hard to see, but this was the very first patient to ever be uh, on ECMO back in the early 1970s. And it took an entire surgical suite filled with equipment to run all these. They had very few people who could, could, could uh, run this machine and do it, but this is the very first time they ever used ECMO. Over time, it's become smaller. It's become more portable. It obviously is uh, less expensive than, than the original models were. Um, and that's what happens with medicine over time. They, this usually is a trend of, of how things work, become smaller, become portable. Uh, the people who learned this or were the originators of it would teach other lesser qualified people to actually begin to do it. So now you can get more people, more hospitals willing to do this. They really didn't want to take this on because it was so expensive. But over time, more hospitals began to adopt this. ECMO really became, it came into play during the H1N1 virus back in 2009. They found that ECMO was a, an incredible way of keeping these patients who were going through respiratory illness as a way of keeping them alive. The popularity of ECMO really grew. Um, today, you can find ECMO centers around the world. There's literally thousands of ECMO centers in over 50 countries. Um, the Cleveland Clinic in the United States has estimated that there are about 160,000 ECMO procedures done every, every year, quite a few. It's becoming very common, becoming very skilled. The processes are, are actually getting much better. Um, now, this is a great history lesson. You're learning a lot about ECMO, but what does it have to do with cryonics? Okay, well, back in the early days of cryonics, back in 1985, Jerry Leaf, who was the vice president of Alcor, he was also working at the UCLA Medical Center in their cardiothoracic division where they were developing ECMO. He took his knowledge and skills from there and came to Alcor and said, you know what, I think we can improve the stabilization process by adding ECMO to it. I think we can do a much better job so, research was done, funds were allocated, equipment was procured, and they set about designing this entire ECMO program. They even got to the point where they announced it in Alcor newsletters that very, very soon, probably next year, we will actually be adding ECMO to this process. It was a huge leap forward. Unfortunately, in 1991, Jerry Lee passed away from a sudden heart attack. It was a devastating loss to lose his skills, his knowledge, his innovation, 
and, and Jerry was frozen. Unfortunately, the, pro the program was also put on freeze for an indefinite period of time. It had, did not get revisited until 30 years later. Long time passed during that time. Hey, there's Max and I, <laughs> one of the old cases in, back in the day. So I had, in 2000, I mentioned before, I had been working at Alcor since 2009. Um, I had a great relationship with Alcor. Um, I had an opportunity uh, to, uh, after that in 2016, I had an opportunity to uh, work with a large biotech firm in, in China. Um, I was really reticent to leave Alcor. It was a tough decision to make. I had a nice talk with, with Max. I talked about how I wanted to probably broaden and expand my experiences, uh, my ability to do things. And it was a difficult decision because I thought we had a very good working group at Alcor at the time. Uh, but uh, Max listened to me and we talked about it and I really appreciated his support on my deciding t to leave that position. And um, uh, so I, I, I appreciate that. But the idea is that I was gonna be taking a job working with Yinfeng Bio in, in China. Um, there I am, can't see it's me. My face is cut off there. <laughs> um, but basically this, this, when I went to China, this was the first of 20 trips that I basically would make to China. Yinfeng Bio is a, a large conglomerate. Uh, they have about 8,000 employees, four different divisions. One of those divisions is a biotech division, about a little over 1,000 employees in that particular division. They had been performing cord blood stem cell storage for about one-fifth of China. Uh, they had one of the licenses to do that. So they had already been working with liquid nitrogen for an extensive time, for about 20 years prior to that. Um, they had vast resources to back up their program. Financial resources, personnel resources, PhD docs, medical docs, all basically at, at the ready that they could call on to work on that. They had great relationships with the hospitals, area hospitals and medical providers. They had affiliations with uh, on many, many government projects. And their goal was to develop a comprehensive cryonics program to kind of augment uh, a lot of the medical services they were providing. Um, that included designing the plant and the facility, procuring the equipment, fabricating some of the equipment, training the medical doctors, uh, training the medical staff, integrating the uh, program into everything they were doing. Um, here was basically our, our ECMO team. Now, they, they decided that the best approach was to, to, to get government support for a program, not only financial, but also just uh, willing to, to sponsor the program, um, was to try to mimic or parallel conventional medicine as closely as possible in their cryonics program. Let's use the doctors that are already working out there. Let's use the same hospitals that are already doing it. Let's use the same procedures. And these cardiothoracic doctors, uh, in fact, Dr. Swin on the, on the far left of your screen, um, performed the first uh, heart transplant in China. So they had a very skilled set of, of, of doctors who did ECMO all the time. Why not take that skill set and apply it towards this particular project. It would, again, mimic and, and allow the, the medical community to see how well this, this actually could be used. Beyond that medical community, you've got the general public. The general public thinks that when a person is dead, they're dead. They're, they can't come back. We know we've been fighting that for years when we try to explain it to people. In China, they have the same belief with, with Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, when you are dead, you are dead. And so this, this thought process of being frozen and being brought back to life seemed very strange to most of them. So by talking about ECMO and conventional medicine and how it could keep people biologically alive until they could be recovered, 
by using that, by extrapolating that into chronics, they could say, we can use ECMO in the same manner. We can keep this patient biologically alive throughout this process without the damage occurring, or at least mitigating the damage as much as possible. And then when the technology comes around, we can cure the cancers and all those other diseases we die of today, we can reverse it and we haven't had the damage because of the ECMO. So that made sense to a lot of people. It allowed them to take that, that leap of faith, that jump in their mind from one point to, to another, at least with respect to their cultural beliefs. So their utilization of ECMO basically is in two different types of scenarios. The first scenario is where the, the patient is in a remote hospital a long ways away. They're basically in an ICU. They have, um, uh, are on their deathbed, so to speak. They're expected to pass away and not make it. We send the medical team there, the ECMO team there. Once the patient is officially is pronounced, and we've talked about that before, about what official pronouncement means in China and how it differs from around the world, but it's essentially when the patient has officially stopped they're going to basically put a chest compression device over them, just like you see in almost all the other SST programs. They're going to drop it in a tube, put them on a hook onto portal ventilator. Simultaneously, the surgeons are initiating ECMO right there in the ICU bed. It's a portable ECMO, not a whole bank of ECMO machines like you'd see in a surgical suite, but a portable ECMO machine. They're hooking them up, connecting them, and getting them on bypass very rapidly. Okay. They then load them up and into an ambulance, whether it's, you know, uh, an hour drive or a 12 hour drive, they can maintain ECMO in that ambulance while they're driving to the facility. And here's actually Dr. Swin there, um, uh, managing a, a patient, uh, in the back. I think that was coming back from Beijing. Um, so they'll, they'll transport to the yin Feng facility. They bring them inside. They have a surgical suite there. They will hook the ECMO system up to the perfusion system. And then when the temperature is at the optimal rate, usually 15 degrees Celsius, they flip a switch and you go from a closed circuit perfusion to an open circuit where they begin to wash out the blood and introduce the cryoprotection. There's no gap between the two, unlike we currently have it in most other situations. The other scenario is the patient is at a local area hospital about 15 minutes away, in which case the time to establish ECMO at the hospital is logistically probably too short. So what they actually do is they throw on the uh, chest compression device, put them on a ventilator, apply ice, drive over to the awaiting ECMO team at the Enfung facility, and they start the process basically there. Um, again, they're doing compressions with the chest thing while the surgeon is actually gaining access. Now, why do I bring that up? Because that's, that's actually important. One of the advantages of ECMO is uh, you basically are, are, are gaining peripheral access. You're going through the femorals, you're going the carotid, you're doing central uh, lines you basically are not using the chest area. That frees up the chest for you to do compression. So you can actually do simultaneously. One of the problems with, with doing the thoracotomies, doing with the medium sternotomies, is you have to stop all of that in order to start the surgical access. So you have to wait until you get down to a certain temperature before you can start surgery. In fact, many times you even have to, you have to the surgeons are standing around waiting to begin until you can get to that, that style. Um, those two aren't competing for space in ECMO, so they can actually be done uh, simultaneously. What that basically converts to is a, is a much quicker cooling curve for the patient. Why? Well, because when we cool now, we're doing external cooling, right? We're using ice packs, we're using water. We have talked about lung lavage. We have talked about peritoneal lavage, where we do internal cooling. And you already see the data shows that those were, although it was the kind of unique and rare to do that, the, the data was very promising. This is also an internal. Because there's a heat exchanger on the ECMO, we now can cool internally in addition to externally. So we're getting much, much quicker uh, rates of temperature, which allows us to reach that optimal target temperature, 
uh, at a quicker state. It gives us a better S mix store, S mix score, and um, and everybody's happy, <laughs> right? Um, so some of the benefits of ECMO is it does provide provide a higher efficiency in perfusion versus mechanical compressions and ventilation. So conventional CPR with the chest compression device gives about 25 to 30 percent cardiac output as your normal heart. Let that number sink in. We're only 20, we're, we're less than a third efficient as your normal heart when we're doing those external compressions. With ECMO, you're up to 100 percent. ECMO does provide faster cooling, basically because you're doing external and internal cooling. ECMO is seamless between the transition between circulation and perfusion, and also gives you the ability very easily to do blood gases, use an ISTAT machine, do corrective measures, those things that you can't easily do in a normal surgery. So you can actually optimize the patient's uh, uh, the lactic state uh, and, and all that, so it's very good. Um, now, the drawbacks, it does require an investment, not only in money, equipment, disposables, you have to have team members who are trained, you have to train them, they have to be at the ready. Again, so we're adding layers of complexity to this. ECMO sounds great, but you have to have all these other things in place. It's only beneficial if a standby can be initiated prior to clinical death. We looked at the numbers earlier and saw how many people didn't actually have a standby or had a late standby. And of course, there's always this question about the reperfusion injury. Reperfusion injury is when you're introducing oxygen late in the system, it, late into the stabilization, you can actually do more harm. In theory, ECMO, if done early, can actually reduce or eliminate a reperfusion injury. But if you wait long enough, it might actually do additional damage. That's why some of the protocols we currently have uh, suggest not doing ventilation after a certain point. So, in conclusion, is, is ECMO realistic in cryonics? Yes and maybe. I say yes because obviously it's already been used in one system. In China, it's, it's an integral part of their program. Southern Cryonics has also authorized Australian Blood uh, Management, ABM, to do it. And I've done the training with them and they are planning on integrating ECMO as part of their stabilization process as well, okay? Uh, so there's one, maybe a second. The, the maybe, though, is other organizations. As new chronic service organizations are uh, designed around the world, they you know, could maybe look at implementing this into it. Existing ones, it may be more problematic. They've got existing protocols and it may be hard to reintegrate and redesign all of that. It takes a lot of work. But if we look at what China wanted to achieve with ECMO was better relations with the medical community, better relations with the government in terms of being allowed to do this. As new CSOs develop, they may think about this and keep ECMO in mind as a way to demonstrate to medical providers, we're doing the exact same thing you're doing. We're not just freezing a person and trying to bring them back. That sounds like a crazy notion. But by applying these conventional medical techniques that you're already using, we're mimicking what you're doing by reducing the ischemia. And that allows us to have a much greater chance at actually making what is probably the greatest science research project ever attempted to possibly work. You know, since I started in this industry about 14 years ago, I've really seen an improvement on the relations and how the hospitals and doctors see us when we come in. I have to give a lot of credit to the early pioneers of chronics where they went into a hospital and the hospital's like, you want to do what? Get out of my hospital. You're not doing anything to our patient. I got paperwork. I don't care. You get out. They fought through that. They paved the way for us today to actually enjoy a little bit more freedom in terms of what we're able to do in the hospitals. And now we have doctors and hospital administrators who are very inquisitive and they're like, hey, did you hear? We've got a chronic patient in our, in, up in room 14. You know, can we watch? How can we help? 
Look how that's changed over time. Let's project forward. Now we're adopting these, these highly uh, advanced medical treatments, and we're now doing that. Think about where that might lead. I think it, it might really make a paradigm shift for those medical providers and how we're seen as a community and what we're trying to accomplish is something that's very achievable. So that's my presentation on ECMO. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. You bet. Any questions in the audience? And I would also ask for quick answers due to time limitations. I think Ben was first, Ben over there. Did you go over the distances between the announcement of death and check and why that might represent a problem for practicing this in Europe and North America? Great point. Real quick, for the repeating of the question. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. You want to do it? Oh, yeah, I can do ah, it. Okay. So the question was, what are the legal differences between pronouncements of death in China versus Europe or the US? One of the differences is obviously most of the teams here in the US don't have a doctor on staff. And we've talked about maybe conflict of interest uh, before the other day about can that doctor who's representing the crimes company make a pronouncement. So there's a disconnect there. We have to rely on other doctors to do that. In China, they're actually using the doctors that work in those facilities. They're on the clinic's team. So they're, they're government employees. They're trusted by the government. This is their job is to make a pronouncement. So when they make a pronouncement, they can actually do it simultaneously with the chronics uh, uh, initiating. There's not that gap. And the gap can be here in the US. Sometimes it's 60 seconds. Sometimes it's six minutes. Sometimes you know it's an hour. So by closing that gap, they're able to do that. Now, I don't know about Europe. In, in the US, uh, we have to have one of the hospital uh, people make that official pronouncement. It's very formalized. I don't know about Europe if it's that, as formalized as that. In China, it's less formal because, again, it's the same person who is making the pronouncement versus uh, actually initiating the process. In fact, usually it's the anesthesiologist who is the one who's making that determination. And he's the one who's actually dropping the tube and, and administering the sedative to start the process. Is it illegal? It's illegal because the pronounced term for starting an ECMO, I mean, you start, you start an ECMO in the hospital uh, in China and you transport the patient, right? And in a sense, they're not legally dead at the time they're pronounced, but they can be given this protocol. Mm -hmm. And then they're in the, in the arriving facility, and there's a smooth transition. And no pronouncement. Whereas in the United States, uh, I think it would be illegal to uh, put a patient on that call and transport them to a branch. So I think you're, you're thinking about the application of ECMO to a patient before they're clinically dead in the United States and then using that as a mechanism to get them out of the hospital to start. Yeah, that, that's not something that they do. Really, in, in China, the pronouncement is less formalized than we have in the U.S., and I, I, I can't speak for Europe. Um, it's not, okay, the patient died at this minute, write it down and, and chart it. It, it it's, it's a less formalized process. The patient has passed, and now we can begin. And so um, whether we can do ECMO at the hospital, no, I, I think we have a long ways to go to, to do that. Can we do ECMO in the vehicle outside the hospital? Possibly. How much are we risking a reperfusion injury? So I think there, there's a lot of things that obviously have to be addressed. It may have been a lot easier to implement in China. Uh, I think the model that you're, we've discussed here might be applicable in Australia, you know, but we'll have to see as soon as they start the program. Quick question, quick answers. Okay. Because we need to speak. <laughs> I think Crystal was first. Because that mass is some brain activity. 
Okay. Well, I think brain activity is, is used to determine whether ECMO should be continued on a patient. In this case, we're not looking for an immediate resuscitation. We're looking for a much delayed resuscitation. And so I understand your point, but no, because that's not a, a marker of what they're looking for. There's no ECG activity monitored on a mobile ECMO unit. Um, could it be added? Absolutely. That might give more data points to the people who are doing the, the meta-analysis. That might be a great way to do that. Um, in terms of your ethical answer, um, or ethical question, I guess I'd need a little bit more criteria to answer that, maybe in private. Yes, so I unfortunately need to move all oh. the other questions uh, to the lunch break because we're a couple minutes over and the next speaker is already waiting. So I would like to welcome Roman to the stage and take the microphone back from you. So uh, first of all, thanks uh, very much to the organizers for having me and for, for organizing this wonderful event. So uh, I would like to talk about uh, the, the main avenues to rescue the, the brain from deterioration due to aging and other diseases. Thank you. And, uh, and the first one that uh, uh, will spring to mind to most of you, I'm sure, is uh, to, to essentially fight the deterioration due to aging itself uh, in the brain and, um, and other diseases such as, for example, cancer. The second uh, promising avenue is to repair and regenerate the brain part by part. And um, this is of, uh, of course, something that we see in nature, uh, for example, in, in the starfish, uh, where, where uh, parts of the starfish can regenerate. And, and so one avenue would be to use similar uh, uh, processes to, to regenerate the, the brain. And uh, a third avenue is, uh, as many of, of you will be aware, is to to see if we can slow down and maybe stop uh, metabolic processes and the, the brain tissue, uh, and then uh, wait until certain technologies are available to, to, to rescue the brain from deterioration. And the first two of those avenues, they receive a lot of funding from public and private uh, uh, funders, um, and the third, uh, not so much. So I will be talking about this, uh, also by giving some uh, descriptions of, of my own research and uh, to, to, to see essentially what are the challenges in these fields. So regarding the first one, uh, there are different ways of how we can inspect the brain. Right? You can use CT uh, scans as we, as we saw before, and uh, one very uh, promising uh, method is, is also uh, based on MRI, uh, where we use uh, so-called diffusion tensor imaging, which is a method that allows to, to measure the diffusion of water molecules in, in 3D space. And uh, this allows us to get an insight into the structure of the brain. So here you can see, for example, a visualization of a human brain uh, connectivity uh, or fiber tracts uh, different colors indicate different orientations of those fiber tracts. And um, you can immediately see that uh, this is a very informative and very complex structure. And uh, we also know that during aging, this structure changes a lot because uh, during aging, there is loss of, of neurons, there is loss of connections. And so diffusion tensor imaging allows us to get an insight into those changes. And just to, to, to further uh, corroborate this, this point, uh, here you can see a plot where you can uh, see this measure of, of uh, uh, f obtained from diffusion tensor imaging 
uh, which changes quite strongly across age. And so actually it is possible just by, based on look, by looking at this uh, data to predict the age uh, quite accurately. And then of course one can also look at activity because DTI looks at the structure of brain connections, but then we can also look at brain activities, for example, with electroencephalography, uh, EEG. This is a very uh, practical and, and cheap uh, uh, method. And um, in addition, we can also use modern computational tools, such as, for instance, AI and machine learning, in order to, to probe the, the activity of the brain in different conditions and across age. <clears throat> And uh, here we can see a, a visualization where one can clearly differentiate uh, changes in this EEG um, data or information across age. And depending on what features you look at, uh, you get uh, very different um, uh, signals uh, and changes and also at different parts of the, the brain. So uh, we can now very consistently look at uh, um, EEG changes across age and, and observe uh, common changes across multiple individuals. And so these are uh, uh, essentially descriptive uh, approaches in order to better understand how this EEG information changes across the brain. But important here is that actually uh, this is all descriptive. We don't really know uh, why exactly uh, for example, here in, in, in this part of the brain, there is a lot of changes in, in the front uh, of the brain in this particular feature. We don't know how this mechanistically depends on the uh, number of neurons or the, 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 the strength of the connections. So these are, uh, there are a lot of open questions, essentially. And, and so there is a, a lot of uh, challenges ahead in order to answer those questions. So very recently, uh, we actually published also a paper where we use such EEG um, data in order to differentiate different types of diagnosis. So they are very relevant also for, for biomedical applications, and, um, uh, but it, it remains to be seen in the future um, whether one can then also better understand what is really going on at the level uh, of, of individual cells or neurons uh, mechanistically. So overall, there, there is a, a, quite a lot of uh, open questions you know, for this potential avenue, uh, and there's a lot of support for it. Uh, but it's a very important avenue, of course, uh, because uh, th there is very limited neurogenesis in the brain uh, as an adult. There is some, but very little. And so essentially, most of your neurons currently you have already since birth. So um, there is there's, uh, only a limited amount of new neurons being born and therefore it makes sense to, to better understand the deterioration of the brain. And also uh, with regards to diseases, in particular cancer, for example, uh, there is a, a lot of uh, changes uh, across age. And uh, we have published a few years ago a paper where we looked at the incidence of glioma, so brain cancer, and there are different types of glioma. There is, for example, also glioblastoma, which is a particularly uh, dangerous uh, part of uh, scenario of glioma. And so what we did here is we created a mathematical model that is based on empirical data uh, collected uh, from, from humans. And, and we uh, used uh, this mathematical model to predict incidence across age. And what we could uh, see is that indeed this uh, model uh, reproduces quite well empirical data, demographic data. So here in, in red, you see uh, epidemiological data uh, in the US uh, across age. You can clearly see that there is a, an exponential increase in risk of glioma uh, until about 80 years of age. And then afterwards there is a decrease. So this, this bump goes down. And 
we, uh, we, we could uh, explain based on our mathematical model uh, why this can happen. And so we, we kind of uh, uh, show that, that uh, statistically speaking, this mathematical model, which uses actually numbers also on stem cell proliferation in the brain. As I mentioned before, there is uh, the, the proliferation of stem cells in the brain, uh, which actually then also decreases with age. And, um, and based on this uh, phenomenon, we could explain this demographic uh, uh, data. So this is uh, essentially to, to, to show an overview of, of what kind of topics uh, we can currently explore and better understand, but there are a lot of open questions um, in this avenue. So the second avenue is uh, with regards to the possibility to repair and regenerate parts of the brain. And um, uh, here it is important to note that the brain is changing all the time, right? We, we are never exactly the same. So the, throughout our entire lifespan, there are a lot of changes. Uh, gastrulation, which was uh, described by uh, embryonic uh, or, or developmental uh, biologist uh, Louis Wolpe uh, as the most important event or, or, or time in your life, more important than, than birth or, or marriage or death. Uh, then neurulation and, and and uh, uh, brain development, uh, embryo embryonic brain development, fetal brain development, uh, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and then finally uh, death. And throughout this process, there are a lot of changes going on. And what is also important here is that uh, certain uh, signals during these uh, changes or during this trajectory are transient. So they are only present during particular times. And I will get back to that uh, a, bit, a bit later. And uh, also, of course, uh, noteworthy is the fact that the human brain is extremely complex. It is the most complex system that uh, we know of. Uh, it has almost 100 billion neurons. It uh, has uh, about 10 to the 15 synapses. And this complexity arises through uh, uh, the, the, the genetic rules that are actually at the very beginning in a single cell. So all this complexity arises from a, one single cell in the genetic code uh, is with the information in the genetic code and then the developmental process uh, with interaction, of course, with the physical uh, environment and with interactions with, the, with our uh, outer environment in general produces then this extreme complexity. And so the fundamental process that governs this increasing complexity is described by this quite sim simple diagram where we have gene expression that is uh, uh, determined by genetic rules and we have the uh, external environment where I inc include all the external processes including physical processes uh, and, and, and electrical activity of course which plays a big role for brain development as well. And this is a very complex process and, and most of uh, developmental uh, neuroscience and biology is about this, to better understand this interaction because it's one, one in, in, in impacts the other one, which then again impacts the, the gene expression. And th that's a very complex uh, process, of course. And uh, just for those who, who maybe don't uh, know much about the, the underlying structure of, of the brain, uh, so uh, the, the brain is composed of neurons which have axons and dendrites and cell bodies. And those axons uh, um, and dendrites are, uh, are able to transmit electrical signals via synapses. And so this is like an, 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 a, a basic unit of, of a, a neural network in the brain. And then those uh, neurons, uh, they, they come together, they connect together and form very complex neural networks. Here you can see uh, such a, a network. It's, it's not regular. It's, it's, it's quite, uh, of course, uh, uh, difficult to, to understand exactly the, which neurons are connected to which other neurons and why exactly. And here you can see a simulation uh, that we uh, created where we simulate uh, in silico, so with a computational model, uh, how such a neural network 
uh, could, could develop. Uh, and you can see that starting from a very simple scenario where we have two different uh, cell types uh, in, in, in red and, and purple, and uh, these, these cells, uh, they follow very simple growth rules. So the axons follow growth rules such as uh, grow out into a certain direction. Uh, if you don't find a suitable target, retract, go, and go into another direction. And these kind of mechanisms are also happening during real uh, brain development. And so computational tools allow us to get a better insight into such uh, developmental uh, processes. And, and, and that brings me to, 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 uh, to a similar topic um, ab about brain anatomy. So in the previous simulation, you saw that th this development is a very interactive process. It's not like that one neuron does all the work and then connects somehow magically, right? It's that you have multiple neurons that probe each other. They try out different potential synaptic partners and so sometimes the electrical activity is not suitable so they try a, a different one so this is a, an ongoing developmental process that is interactive it's not unidirectional and uh, similarly uh, i want to show you now one example where we created a, a, a model that explains very well an observed uh, neural network uh, that is actually present in almost all mammalian cortices in the cortex of all mammals uh, except rodents, it seems, for some reason. Uh, rodents don't have this so-called superficial patch system. So this is a, a system of neural connections where we have um, uh, uh, patches of neurons. So you can see here uh, individual patches um, uh, where we have neurons connecting to other patches. So somehow, for some reason, neurons that are within a, a particular patch, uh, they don't uh, seem to... Uh, co connect homogeneously to all other neurons in their environment, but they seem to target particular other patches for some reason. And, um, and, uh, and so the question that we asked was, how could this develop? Because th this also has implications then for, for repair and regener regeneration, of course. So what we uh, did is we used actually some insights uh, and, and, and uh, some ideas of uh, someone that I'm sure many of you know, which is Alan Turing. Here you see me uh, ne sitting next to Alan Turing in a park in Manchester. Um, so Alan Turing, he was uh, one of the pioneers of, of modern computer science. And uh, he, he, of course, also had an impact, a uh, very strong impact in, 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 the, uh, in the Second World War. And, uh, but he actually, that many people don't know that, he also wrote uh, a paper, a very important paper, a seminal paper, uh, relevant to computational biology. And uh, so this paper is called The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis. And in this paper, he proposes that uh, certain patterns, biological patterns, emerge through interactions of substances. So this was quite a mathematical, of course, uh, uh, paper. And, uh, but, but it was, uh, it was very, uh, it had a big impact because then later on other models uh, were uh, formulated. And uh, one particular model that we then used in our model is the so-called gearer meinhardt activator inhibitor model. So in this activator inhibitor model, we have two uh, substances, activator and inhibitor substance, that uh, mutually interact with one another. And, uh, and I will not go into much into the details of what exactly the conditions have to be, but all you, you need to know for now is that we have these two substances that diffuse in, in space and cells produce them and they interact with one another. And uh, then we use this model in order to simulate how such patterns emerge. So here you can see in yellow uh, these patches that are uh, morphogenetic patches, so there are substances that are in this in this in this space, and um, essentially we uh, then used this pattern in order to simulate how axons are attracted to those patches and create connections with them. And so here you see um, a simulation. Oh, you should see uh, if this. Not sure if it works. Not sure if 
Oh no. Thank you. Yep. yep. Thanks. So, um, so we start here this simulation. It's a bit di for for I think for the uh, audience here, it's a bit difficult to see due to contrast issues. But you can see that this single cell produced now a, a two-dimensional uh, circle of, of cells, and then these produce those substances according to this gira meinhardt model, and then the neurons project their axons by following those guidance cues. So this is our proposed model, and, and you can see here that we indeed we get such a, such a biologically realistic uh, structure, and we also looked at other uh, features, so for example, people have looked at the width of those patches in different areas of the brain and the spacing between patches, and our model actually can reproduce this, uh, this, this uh, linear relationship uh, very well. So uh, this is, I think, uh, quite uh, re reassuring or, or, or confirms that there is, uh, there, this model could be potentially how it happens. And in our paper here, we also suggest what substances exactly could be uh, playing a role there. So uh, this is a, a realistic hypothesis, but what this means is that if this is the case, then of course regenerating uh, will, will also be ja challenging because those guidance cues are transiently there at that particular time. But if you want to grow this tissue uh, afterwards in, in, in the adult stage, you somehow need to find a way to, to connect with those patches in the proper uh, way. And so th this is, I think, also an, an important open question. How do you re re repair a neural network when the signals required for this neural network were transiently there, but afterwards and not anymore? Um, and uh, yeah, so this paper was actually also published uh, and, and then uh, shown on the cover of the, of the journal because it's quite aesthetically uh, pleasant. And uh, that brings me to the third uh, avenue, which is about preserving the brain and biostasis. And, um, and uh, we, we, we uh, last year published this uh, review that uh, uh, elaborates on, on modern technologies uh, where we, uh, that can be used to cryopreserve uh, biological systems. And uh, we also actually elaborate on, on particularly biomedical applications. So if you're interested, um, in these avenues, please uh, have a look. Uh, it's, it's, it's available, uh, it's open access. And, and uh, here I would like to stress that the preservation of biological systems and biostasis is actually relevant to many, many applications. It's not only for people who want to cryopreserve the brain, it's actually relevant to lots of other fields. And, uh, and we can see that, in, in, uh, for example, DARPA is interested in, in biostasis uh, people who want to preserve, uh, at least for, for hours or days, organs, uh, they are also interested in, in preserving uh, those uh, organs. And then uh, recently, uh, a, a quite a large grant was, uh, was funded by the uh, National Science Foundation. I think overall they uh, plan to uh, fund uh, $26 million, uh, uh, where uh, the goal would be then also to, to, uh, to preserve organs and, and other biological systems and it's the tissues and uh, also the um, Euro European Space Agency, for instance, is interested in, in, in biostasis. And of course, there, it, it, I'm not saying that they exactly want to, to follow the same uh, methods or approaches, but ultimately uh, they, they share some, some, some uh, common uh, um, topics and, and share also the, the, the fact that they need to address certain challenges. So, um, so uh, well, one thing that uh, I want to highlight here is also that computational tools, I think, will be, become extremely important for, for biostasis and, and preservation as well. And uh, so something uh, that is relevant here is that uh, we, we recently created an open source software that allows to, to simulate uh, tissues, um, biological tissues, uh, in a very uh, computationally performing manner. So uh, this BioDynamo software uh, was actually created by a consortium of multiple uh, prestigious institutions. And, um, and if you're interested, uh, feel free to, to, to get in touch. Uh, we are always happy to have people to, to, to work with us and, and, and also contribute, of course, to this platform. But the one important thing here is that with BioDynamo, we can actually also simulate 
neural tissue. So uh, we can simulate large scale neural tissues. We have already tested BioDynamo uh, to, to simulate billions of interacting elements. So we can really, it's not any more small, very small uh, academic size uh, or academically interested people who, who, for who this is relevant. This is really realistic uh, tissues that we can simulate with BioDynamo. And, um, and, and also, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we can then use data obtained from, for example, from diffusion tensor imaging. And we, can, we can use this information to create models of the brain connectivity and uh, connections between individual brain regions. And then, uh, and, and then we can, uh, the reason that I'm saying this is because uh, this is also relevant for, for, for biostasis because it allows us to check the quality of this connectome. For example, we use this to address Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. We use this uh, approach of diffusion tensor imaging um, and we published this work uh, a few years ago. And uh, what we did is we essentially modeled how those connections change during normal aging and how those changes uh, 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 proceed during Alzheimer's disease. And we use this model then in order to predict Alzheimer's disease actually uh, earlier than what currently is being done. So our, our results indicate that we can do this earlier than current uh, clinical di diagnosis. And so something similar could also be used for biostasis to essentially probe how to try preserve best uh, in order to have the, be the best quality of the brain connectome. And uh, this brings us to the very general problem of optimization of cryopreservation protocols. So there are many parameters that we need to optimize, how to cool down, we, talk, we heard that also before, how to administer cryoprotective agents, what kind of agents to administer, how to thaw, and uh, computation models can help here render this process much more efficient. Of course, we always need experimental data. And uh, just to, to, to highlight a recent paper that we just submitted, my PhD student Jack Jennings has um, created such a computational model in order to optimize the cryopreservation of Jurkat cells. So these are a certain type of uh, cancer stem cells. And uh, by, by using our model, we could actually achieve a, a much better, uh, um, much higher number of cells uh, the, that, pr that survived after cryopreservation as compared to traditional cooling protocols. So to summarize, uh, I would like to highlight that Currently, research on aging and, 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 and dementia receives a lot of attention and, and, and a lot of funding. And, uh, and also the, uh, with regards to, to repair of the brain, we have to note that, that the development of the brain is a very complex process uh, and it involves billions of neurons that interact different cell types. And so there are a lot of uh, open questions currently. And, um, uh, there, there has been a lot of interest recently on, on certain uh, with regards to cryopreservation from certain initiatives. Uh, and there is overlap with regards to, to, to the goals of brain cryopreservation. And, um, and uh, there are a lot of computational developments, uh, for example, from neuroscience, as I now explained, that can be applied also for brain cryopreservation. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. So my, uh, my conclusion or take home message is if you're interested in, 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 in uh, saving or rescuing the brain, then I would not put all your baskets in one, uh, all your eggs in one basket because of course uh, there are open questions everywhere and um, it, it, it is more, I think, wiser uh, to, to have uh, multiple baskets. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Roman. We have maybe time for one quick question. Then I need to move everybody else to lunch. I can see you oh, okay. Okay. Um, the stuff indicating that we can infer, like, I guess, from logical age from brain imaging. And how, how precise is it, and how does it compare to sort of that, you know, legal type of thought? Can you yeah. repeat the question briefly? Yes, yes. So the question was how uh, how accurate are 
methods to to infer connectivity, particularly connectivity. Uh, the, oh, the, the H, sorry, yeah, the, the, the H uh, from from uh, imaging uh, data as compared to methylation. So uh, th this is uh, something that, so there are multiple papers and they, they look at different types of imaging uh, methods. Uh, I think they're ultimately, uh, so what, what is quite consistent is that structural information is more informative than functional information to infer the age. Uh, but I don't think that uh, uh, one can currently say that uh, imaging is, is worse or better than uh, ep uh, ep uh, looking at epigenome uh, or information. So I think this needs also further research, but they are all uh, quite accurate, uh, I, I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, then, Roman, all the other questions at lunch. Second? Yes, I do know that. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Pedro, who's joining us from remote. You can start. Pedro, you can start. Hello. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you just fine. All right, that's perfect. Well, thank you very much, Emil. Thank you for the, the invitation. And I'm, I'm, I feel bad I'm not there. It's, uh, I was there last year and it seems like it's progressing fantastically. I hope to be there in person uh, uh, next year. So, so I mean, I'll, I'll start with a um, very brief introduction. Um, about what, what I'm interested in and, and why I'm interested in, in cryobiology um, very briefly, uh, similar to previous years, just, just, just so those who don't know me know who I am, get to know who I am. And then um, I'll focus a bit on technological progress um, in, in different fields, a, a bit, well, mostly on aging, but not just on aging, and also then implications for cryobiology and, and cryonics and biostasis. So just, just briefly, uh, as I said, a very brief introduction. Um, as I'm sure you're aware for this group, you know, we all die. Which a lot of people, well, I guess there's a lot of people in the world who don't believe they're going to die because they believe there's an afterlife. Uh, but if you don't believe in an afterlife, if you don't believe in God, like, uh, like I don't, um, then there is uh, inevitable death. Um, and that is something that, that, in my view, we have to find a solution for. Now, the other thing that's important is that um, we mostly die of old age. So, so aging is by far the, the greatest um, restriction or limit to how long we're going to live. So just to show that actually very briefly on a plot. So this is the percentage of people of life by age. I think this is data from the US, um, but you know it, it's, it's quite universal. What is interesting to note is, as you can see, is that you know after a while, your probability of dying basically increases exponentially. And what that means in practice is that most people die within a fairly narrow range of ages. So about 75% of people, they die within a 25 year period, roughly from 70 to 95, year, 70 to 95 years old. So, so that's something important to keep in mind. Also, the important to keep in mind if you're making cryonics arrangements, uh, because that's that's the the most likely age where you are going to die. Um, so, and this of course sets tremendous limits on on our lifespan. That means we cannot live more than uh, well. Current record is 122, um, and that's been the record for over 20 years. So, so it's unlikely to be beaten anytime soon. Uh, so I've realized this when I was when I was a child. Uh, I, I mentioned this last year already, but um, I realize you know everybody dies and nobody's doing anything about it. So so I'll cure aging. That's going to be my career. So when I was a child, uh, I decided I was going to cure aging because you know I didn't want to die. I didn't want my loved ones, my parents to die. So I was going to found find the the fountain of youth. That that was what I decided to do from very early age, and that's what I've been doing for the past. 20 plus years, uh, I've been working on aging. And so without going into a lot of detail, I've, I'm actually now at University of Birmingham. I was in, well, I was in Harvard, then I was in Liverpool for quite a long time. And I'm at the University of Birmingham where I'm a professor 
and I lead the Genomics of Aging and Rejuvenation Lab. Um, I'm CSO of a company working on cell reprogramming. Um, we do a lot of research in different areas, but just to, to, to you know, briefly summarize, we do everything from a lot of computational approaches, a lot of cellular molecular biology. We do some animal work. We look on drug discovery. Um, we work on long-lived animals like naked morats and whales. Uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, computational analysis as well. So I think I would say I've been fairly successful so far in my academic career. Um, having said that, you know, the question is not whether you know I publish a lot of articles or get a lot of funding or make big discoveries. The, the question to me, going back to my childhood dream, was: Am I really? Are we really advancing towards curing aging? And that that's that's the big question. So looking a little bit into technology, I mean, as I'm sure you're aware, there's been huge technological progress in the past. 100 to 200 years um, at different levels. So predicting technological progress is not that simple. I mean, there's, I'm sure you're familiar with some of these. There's a lot of failed predictions. I mean, it's a very famous quote. I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard of it. Um, you know, shortly before the Wright brothers, you know, the prediction from Lord Kevin of the Royal Society that heavier than air flying machines are impossible. And there's many like this. Um, you know, many men will never reach the moon regardless of all scientific events. That was in 1957. Um, um, also questioning uh, Charles Lindbergh, whether he would ever make it. I mentioned Charles Lindbergh because I'll actually come back to it in, in a couple of slides. So there's a lot of failed predictions, people failing to predict technological events that occurred in a not too distant future from when these predictions were made. Um, but the opposite is also true. There's a lot of failed predictions that overestimate technological progress. So, you know, to give one, a couple of examples, predictions of flying cars made in 1924. Um, predictions that uh, by, by NASA, well, one engineer at NASA, uh, that by the year 2000, we'll have a big operation in, on the moon, but which of course we don't. So, so that there's also a lot of, the point is that technological predictions are very hard to make. Um, and we can be way off. Experts can be way off, but one way or the other, not just they can be way off um, in pessimistic predictions, uh, failing to foresee technological breakthroughs, but they also can predict technological breakthroughs that never happen or happen way, way, way longer than anticipated. So that's the point. And that's particularly important in medicine. So the last quote is from uh, the Boston Medical Surgery Journal. It's, it's the President of the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, um, 1912. And they predicted that in 1993, this was an editorial, by the way, that uh, preventable diseases will be eradicated, nature and cure of cancer have been discovered. So they predicted this to have happened in 1993. Um, and, and so in medicine in particular, this is quite hard because medicine, you know, technology can evolve very fast, like computers, but medicine, it's, it's much harder. Uh, for various reasons, like clinical trials, because biology is complica complicated and so on. So, so there's a lot of unsolved medical problems, not just cancer. Uh, I mean, there has been progress in some types of cancer, like childhood blood cancers. But for many types of cancers, there's no cure. Sometimes for some types of cancers, like pancreatic cancer, there's no effective treatment, or the treatments are no more effective than they were decades ago. Even though there's massive investments, there's thousands of researchers working on cancer. And same for other fields. Alzheimer's disease, get lots of funding. There's not a single effective drug for Alzheimer's disease. At least as a cancer, there are drugs that slow the cancer progression. Alzheimer's, there's virtually nothing, no pharmacological interventions. Type two diabetes, et cetera. Now you can say, hey, you know, that, that's very complicated diseases. Sure. What about chronically dry skin? What about dandruff? We don't have a cure for dandruff. I find that quite remarkable. I mean, it's, it's relatively simple. Um, it's not a serious disease, but it's a relatively simple condition. We have ways of slowing dandruff. They exist. Um, salis, uh, I mean, aspirin, actually, topical aspirin, which has been known for centuries, uh, slow down uh, dandruff. But we don't have a cure for dandruff, even though it's a relatively simple process. The point is that medical problems have particularly non-infectious diseases that they're very difficult to tackle. Um, now, the reason I mentioned this is going back to, to the question of aging. I mean, will aging be curing in our lifetime? I don't think so, because of the reasons I've just mentioned that, you know, it's very, very difficult to intervene in human biology, particularly for non-infectious diseases. Um, 
Now, I published this a few years back in, in rejuvenation research, but let, let me just elaborate a little more why I don't think we can cure aging and why we have to, to, to really move on to cryopreservation. So there's a lot of challenges in aging, and this is kind of a slide also, because I, I know quite a few um, transhumanists, very excited always about aging research and latest developments in longevity, um, and you know why should we focus on cryonics when we're going to cure aging? Well, probably not. I mean, I don't think we're going to do it anytime soon, and there's, there's a, a couple of reasons. One, because medicine is really complicated and biology is really complicated, but aging has its own problems. There's no proven intervention to delay human aging. There's a lot of exciting stuff in animal models, but there's nothing proven in humans. Um, in spite of all the excitement, in spite of all the investment that, well, Roman just mentioned, the most it can extend lifespan in rodents is about 50%. And this is caloric restriction, which was discovered decades ago in the 1930s. Um, so, you know, it's basically restricting the amount of food you eat. So, so if you're a little late for lunch uh, because you were hearing my talk, don't feel too bad. It might allow you to live longer. Um, so the most we can extend lifespan is still the same and it's been for decades in, in rodents. Now, there's a lot of longevity drugs um, that extend lifespan in mice. It's some work that we're doing in our lab and, and, and many companies, um, but they extend lifespan about five, 15%. 20% at most. Uh, so, so they have relatively modest effects and it's very difficult to translate findings to humans. You know, you know, there's a big gap between mice and humans. I mean, you can cure cancer in mice all the time, but translating that to humans is much more, more complicated. You'll have to do clinical trials, which take years and cost millions and millions of dollars. So it's, it's not an easy process and a lot of things fail. And that's why it's a big challenge in biomedical research in general and in aging. So even though people try to cure aging, they've been trying for a long time. I, I you know, it's I don't think it's going to happen anytime within our lifetimes, or even my children's lifetimes. Just to give an example, I mentioned uh, the aviator Charles Lindbergh. He actually tried to cure aging. He, he partnered with Alexis Carroll, a very famous scientist. Um, well, this is a hundred years ago. He was a Nobel Prize winner, brilliant scientist, um, and they tried to achieve immortality. Um, and of course it failed uh, because the technology was not there and it is not here now even. Um, so that's the. Succeed just like last century, they didn't succeed. Just like cancer hasn't been cured, even though there's billions, hundreds of billions of dollars going into cancer. So, okay, so that's a bit depressing, Pedro, but um, we're not gonna cure aging. So we may have to do cryonics. If we if we want to avoid death, we need to go to cryonics. Absolutely, um, but it's also important to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, a couple of issues in terms of, of timelines. I think it may well take over 100 years for aging to be cured. It may take 500 years. I, I don't think it will be that long, but it, it's not unrealistic. So it could take centuries. Um, unlikely reanimation. You know, did this, I mean, I, I've actually, uh, uh, I think it's what Ashwin who mentioned this brilliant book by Robert Freitas, which, well, I have it on a PDF. I, you know, it's massive. So I, I, instead of carrying that massive book, I just have the, the PDF on my laptop. Um, in order to do that, I mean, it can take centuries. So I, I think reanimation may only be possible, if it's possible at all, may only be possible centuries from now. And that's something important to keep in mind for cryonics, for cryopreservation. It's that we're probably talking a very long time scales. Um, you know, and companies um, and, and procedures need to, to plan for this and individuals need to plan for this. Um, and of course, there could be problems down the road. I mean, we could have a nuclear war. That's not inconceivable. Um, so, so there are potential hurdles. Um, and that's something we need to be aware of. So that there's certainly risks. So, okay, that's, but that's our only option. That the, the point is, it's not, it's not like we have an alternative. If we're not gonna cure aging, I'm not saying it's, it's not impossible we can cure aging in my lifetime. We don't know technological progress is very hard to predict. I just think it's very, very unlikely. In fact, I think a nuclear war is way more likely than um, us curing aging within my lifetime. So, but both of them are quite unlikely. So, so let's, not, let's try not to think about them or let to consider them for, for planning. So cryonics has a lot of problems. Uh, as, I mean, I've mentioned this before and I keep mentioning it because 
because it's it's really unfortunate that we don't have answers to it. And I, you know, there's great work that I mean, Ashwin, um, we heard about Michael today um, are doing, but we still don't know how much brain damage occurs in cryonics. Um, there is some data on structural integrity. Um, Molecular damage, there's still very little data. There's very little data on cell survival, something I've been asking. We, we still don't know. There's still a lot of obvious questions. Part of the problem is there's very limited research on it, as, as well Emil mentioned um, and others have mentioned. So that is, I think that is one of the big problems. Now, I wanted to pick on the, the issue of cell survival uh, because I think the way we develop research and the way we advance the cryopreservation field, uh, there are some considerations. Um, and I think self-survival to me is important. So so biological viability, I think it's is crucial. Um, I, you know, this, this, again, not everyone will agree with me, but I would say that the copy of Jean-Pedro Magalhães is not me. So you, know, you can copy my DNA, you can make a, a clone of me, you can make a twin brother. That person is not me. So, so that's Mo Farah, famous um, British uh, runner, and his twin brother. His twin brother is not him. So, so a twin brother is not the same. Now you can say, well, a twin brother is not, you know, because he doesn't have your memories. It doesn't have your mind. Well, even if you can make a perfect copy of my mind, if you can make a person that is exactly the same, indistinguishable for me, that's not the same person as me. Um, you know, just like a, to me, it's just like having a twin. And twins do pranks. I mean, this is a um, YouTube, two twins on YouTube that play pranks on, on people because they're, they're twins. Um, so uh, so just because you can create someone indistinguishable for me, that's not the same person as me. And if you, you know, um, put a knife through me, uh, I will feel the pain, not the other person and vice versa. So, so that's an important consideration when we talk about things like mind uploading. I am not interested in mind uploading. I'm interested in preserving my identity and who I am. And so that, that's important consideration for cryonics as well. And now actually on that topic, you know, it's, you know, this is actually a big topic, identity theory in itself, but one interesting mind exercise, uh, I've discussed this on, on cryonics decades, well, 20 years ago, I think, uh, when I first became interested in the topic is, you know, if you can take a brain and you can smash it or you can burn it into ashes, uh, now, imagine that in the future, you know, the technologies that Robert Freitas talks about become possible. Imagine it's possible to, to scan the human brain in a way that you will know every, the position of every single molecule and you can reconstruct it. Is that the same person? You know, if you take someone's uh, brain, if you take a person and you completely disassemble, you burn them to ashes, but then you bring them back. Um, I would argue, no, that's, that's not the same person. I mean, you can even, you don't even have to use the same ashes. You can use different set of ashes, different molecules. Doesn't make any difference. It's not the same person. So just because you can completely reconstruct someone to its original state, if that individual is completely destroyed, then that person doesn't exist anymore. Um, I mean, this is known as the continuity identity theory. Uh, it's based on some assumptions. One of them is the material assumption that the, the fact that the mind has a material support of course, if you believe in afterlife or if you believe in the soul, then that's that's something you would disagree with me. And there may be someone in the audience who will disagree with me, and that's absolutely fine. But uh, to me, that's a quite important point, is that there has to be a continuity of this material support. So, so what that means is that for biostasis and cryopreservation and cryonics, biological viability is essential. We, we need, you know, if there's so much damage in the brain um, of a cryopreserved individual that is essentially destroyed, even if it can be repaired in the future, then that person doesn't exist anymore. So, so really, we need to advance our protocols to minimize damage, to optimize biological viability, cell and molecular viability. That, that's really what we need to do. Uh, and so we've been trying to do that. Um, I talked a little bit about this last year, so I won't go into details. Um, but we've been trying to do some cryobiology research. It's, it's. I mean, we've done some work with, well, with Greg Fahey um, on cryoprotecting toxicity, the assumption being that that's one of the major hurdles, one of the major limiting factors in cryobiology and cryonics. Um, I mean, Roman already mentioned the, the, the review we published last year, so trying to, to set, you know, what major problems, bottlenecks in the field. So we've been trying to, to advance research on the topic. Um, I mean, it's been it's been difficult. I think that we have a lack of, 
it's difficult to attract students. I have to say to cryobiology, I, you know, I work on aging or my lab focuses on aging and we tr tracked a lot of students on aging, um, a lot of students on cancer. We're doing some work on cancer as well. Um, but it's quite difficult to attract people to work on cryobiology. That's one of the bottlenecks and the other bottleneck many Roman and, and Emil and others have mentioned, it is very difficult to get funding uh, for work on cryobiology. Um, so those are being really our bottlenecks. Um, I mentioned this last year, but I started a few years back this UK Cryonics and Cryopreservation Research Network to encourage network, encouraging collaborations, and also um, to, to raise some awareness, with, you know, talk to journalists, uh, um, so do some PR basically for cryonics. Um, I mentioned it last year, so I, I won't go into detail today. Now, one of the things I, I'm quite interested now in doing for cryobiology is, is, is based on some of my experiences with aging. So uh, it's been over 20 years ago now, I'm feeling old, but I started this website called senescence.info. Um, you know, basically it's an educational and information resource on the biology of aging. So it has a number of essays from beginner essays to a little bit more technical essays, but basically it's a one-stop shop for, if you're interested in aging, go there and, you know, it has a list of labs working on aging, but basically it's a way of attracting students and, and, and talent to work on the biology of aging. That's been very successful. You know, I get lots of emails from students, lots of people tell me it's been it's how they started in the field. Um, and so I, I wanted to create something similar for cryobiology. Um, you know, creating a website is not difficult for me. I can do that. Um, so, so that's something uh, that I would like to do. And possibly what I'm thinking is um, invite experts to, to contribute articles. I mean, I can do some writing myself. Um, we can have some focus on cryonics as well, I think, or, or biostasis. I think that's absolutely fine. Um, but I think this would be a way of having, you know, uh, or, or facilitating the way students can can come into the field or attracting students and attracting talent into the field, um, which I think is something the field needs uh, very much. So that's something I'm interested in. If you're interested in collaborating or, or contributing, uh, um, please drop me a line. Um, so the other thing, of course, we have to do is advance the research. And, and so, the, so, you know, advancing the state of the art. Um, and uh, I mean, crime biology has an advantage, uh, which is it doesn't need clinical trials. I mean, that's the that's big problem we have in aging research. I mean, as I said, I'm CSO of a company and that's one of the problems we have is that we can discover something, but if to do a clinical trial, we're talking, you know, I mean, normally hundreds of millions of dollars to go through full phase three. So, um, so in crime biology, we don't have that restriction. So that that's quite, um, handing, and it, it means there's a lot of potential to make discoveries. So, so one of the things that I, I suppose we have a lot of expertise in, in data-driven approaches and, and data sciences and data analysis. So, I mean, we've done quite a lot, don't have time to go into details, but we've done quite a lot of data-driven big data in silico approaches and methods to drug discovery. Um, using deep learning, machine learning, uh, bioinformatics, more traditional bioinformatics methods, but we've done quite a lot. Um, we got some funding. We, we just got a grant actually from UK government to, to do drug discovery for longevity. Um, so we're trying to essentially, what we've been trying to do is identify new compounds and targets for longevity, for aging, uh, using our computational approaches. Uh, and so the idea, uh, I've, what I would like to do is do the same for cryobiology. So applying our machine learning AI methods to cryobiology, uh, namely to, to drug discovery, to predict targets, to predict drugs that can improve cryopreservation formulations, cryopreservation protocols. So that, that's something that um, I would like to do. And so we're working with uh, Roman as well, will hopefully convince you of the advantages of computational approaches. Um, and so we're, we're starting a company to apply these methods. I mean. If we have enough funding, we can uh, then test them in animal models, in brain slices. I mean, there's a lot of possibilities. But the idea is to start with something relatively small that doesn't require a lot of funding, um, but it can allow us to, to employ these methods uh, and ultimately improve the formulations used in cryobiology. So, so that's, that's the plan to really to advance the, the, the field and hopefully um, even uh, in, in biostasis. Um, and so... Well, with that, um, let me uh, summarize. Uh, as I said, you know, if you miss a few of the lunch, if you don't eat as much, that's absolutely fine. Um, but I'll try not to to uh, to delay you too much. Um, so, in summary, I've told you that well, everybody dies uh, unless you believe in afterlife. But if you, if you don't believe, if you science based science tells you that everybody dies, and most people die of aging within a relatively narrow 
um, ages. As I said, roughly from 70 to 95, that's when most people die. Um, I told you that technological progress is very hard to predict. A um, lot of failed predictions in the future, um, but clearly uh, intervening in, in medicine, in particular in non-infectious diseases, is a huge challenge. And there's been huge amount of funding, huge amount of researchers trying to, to intervene in cancer, Alzheimer's, type 2 diabetes, and so on. And there's still no cures for those diseases. For Alzheimer's, there's not even a single treatment, single effective drug for Alzheimer's. Um, so I don't think we will cure aging in our lifetimes. And by our, I mean everyone is live now. We're talking children. So I, I don't think we will cure aging within the next 100 years. Um, and so long-term biostasis is our our only option if we want to avoid death, if we want to, to, to avoid eternal oblivion, we need um, long-term biostasis. And we're talking, we may be talking about centuries of biostasis. Could be more, could be less. We don't know. As I said, technology progress is very difficult to predict. And just like you can have a great scientific advance, you can also have a nuclear war. So, so we don't know what, what will happen. Um, but I think we, we, sh we need to be prepared and, and efforts need to be prepared for very long-term, centuries-long biostasis. Um, I hope I persuade you, at least some of you, that biological preservation is essential, um, that copying our the information either in our DNA or in our minds, that's not the same thing as revival. That's not the same thing as living again. That's just a copy. So biological preservation is essential. And that's how research into cryonics has to be tailored uh, to. Um, and so we need to improve the, the current protocols. And I mean, I'm glad there's some research, fascinating work by Ashwin, for instance. Um, uh, so we need to improve the, 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 the protocols. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a cell molecular biologist, although we do quite a bit of work with animals, including large animals like whales. Um, but what we're trying to, to, to start is an enterprise to apply machine learning and artificial computational approaches uh, to cryobiology to ultimately improve the, the current preservation protocols. Um, and so with that, um, let me just um, thank you. I mean, this is uh, our lab. I should say I'm now uh, based in a hospital. This is Queen Elizabeth Hospital. It's quite new in Birmingham. It's a massive hospital. Um, that's where I'm based at. Um, and if you have any questions or comments, feel free to, to drop me a line. Um, we're also recruiting. I mean, if anyone is interested in, in drug discovery for um, uh, computational approaches, then please feel free to drop me an email. We, we actually have a job at at the moment, we'll have another one. Um, and so feel free to, to drop me a line. Um, and uh, lastly, so Jose asked me just to uh, uh, advertise on just a, a plug to her Transvision Madrid that he's organizing where there will also be some, uh, some training in, in, in cryopreservation. Um, so thank you very much for the time and attention. Awesome, thank you so much. So if there's any pressing questions in the audience, there's one here online um, to start with that. Uh, what research has your current main interest, longevity or cryobiology? Uh, hmm. That's a good question. Uh, I mean, it's, what would be my main interest? I have a lot of interest. I, I, I'm definitely, gear so, so far I've been working mostly on longevity. Um, I'm now gearing, first of all, to cellular reprogramming and cellular rejuvenation, because I think if we're going to cure aging, that's really the, the, the main option we have. So I'm shying away from caloric restriction, for example. We did some work on caloric restriction, um, but I'm shying away from that because that's not really going to cure aging. Um, and I'm focusing more on rejuvenation. Uh, technologies and reju cellular rejuvenation approaches. Uh, and that's the work we're doing with uh, Youth Bio, that uh, I'm CSO of, of this company. So that's that's really the only route towards curing aging, even though I think it's unlikely it's going to you know, cure aging. Um, uh, that That's really the only way I can see. So that's something I'm quite interested in. Um, I'm definitely trying to gear towards cryobiology. So I'll be I'm very interested in cryobiology. I'm very interested in doing more research in cryobiology. But keep in mind, it's difficult in an academic setting to get funding and to get students as well, to get people. You, you need people. You need pairs of hands, even if you have funding. So that's that's one of the hurdles I found um, in um, doing cryobiology research. And that's why we're um, uh, starting this company to, to, to do some research in cryobiology. So I'm very interested in gearing towards uh, more towards cryobiology. Definitely, that, that, that's the way I see it's going more towards cryobiology from now on. Uh, you mentioned building like maybe an introductory uh, database or, or wiki. 
Um, are you aware of any list of open, unresolved problems in, in cryopreservation or ceramics? Um, that's a good question. Um, uh, I mean, there's been papers on it. I mean, we mentioned it in our uh, review last year, and uh, there was a um, uh, Nature Biotech paper uh, a few years back that also made a list of it. I'm not aware of any website with this. And I think, I mean, I'm not aware of it. If if there isn't, that would be very interesting to to build. So I'm interested in, I'm aware of publications, but not websites. So so that would be something that uh, would be very interesting to to include as well and to develop. Pedro, thank you so much and talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. So decide if you want to stand in the shade or the sun. Luckily, the sun came out. Um, and we'll have a lunch break. All right. See you soon. Oh, yeah. Nice to meet you in person as well.
update for all of the people joining us remotely. Um, we have, we're waiting for one speaker to switch around the agenda a bit due to one of those TVs for whatever reason not turning on anymore and basically being broken. So stay with us. We're going to be back in a couple of minutes with either a remote speaker or having switched out the TV. Sorry for the short delay. Think of already some questions you might have for prior speakers for the end. See you soon.
next speaker will be David Wood. Huh? Huh? David, you can start speaking. Hey, sorry about the delays, but I'm glad that things are working again now. Should okay. I start my Tell presentation? Them start and then we figure this out. All right, good, great. <laughs> okay. So my name's David Wood, as you heard. I'm going to talk about the future of biostasis. There's been many talks at this event already that are very practical, uh, with their feet on the ground, talking about concrete issues. I'm going to be looking a little bit more speculatively, but not that far into the future. I'm going to make the case that AI is poised, possibly, to change everything a lot sooner than many people think. And it will change biostasis as well. If that's true, what should we be doing about it? So I'll start with the consideration that everybody who is bio-curious or cryo-curious inevitably asks themselves, should they set aside a significant part of their personal wealth in order to have a chance of future reanimation via biostasis when that portion of their wealth could instead be assigned to other goals such as philanthropic ventures, Wikipedia and so on, or could go to supporting family and friends or even helping oneself have great holidays? If that is the big question, for anybody who is cryo-curious, the three great tasks of the biostasis community, arguably, are first, to help people make that decision clearly, calmly, and thoughtfully without adverse social pressures distorting that consideration. Secondly, what can we do to reduce the costs of cryopreservation, making it as easy as possible to sign up whilst maintaining the quality. And third, as you can guess, it's what could be done to increase the chance of future successful reanimation. And that consideration, the probability of future successful reanimation weighs on people's mind. The smaller the perceived probability of successful future reanimation, the more likely it is that someone will say, yes, it's a cute idea, but frankly, it's indulgent or fanciful or indefensible or irresponsible to tie up their funding and indeed some of their own personal time in a biostasis initiative rather than allocating it to something else whose payback seems more certain. But on the other hand, the larger the perceived probability of success, the less likely it is that someone will be put off by that kind of thinking. So how can that probability be calculated? And even more important, how can that probability be altered? Now, I'm a mathematician. You may know there's an equation, actually several equations, including the Warren equation for setting up the probability of cryonics success. I'm not going to share that equation. Instead, I've got a visual representation of the steps needed. First, we've got to complete the paperwork and financing responsibly. Second, we've got to avoid dying in a way that destroys our brain. Third, we've got to make sure our family and friends don't interfere and contest our will and seek to have our cryopreservation stopped. And then there's the cryopreservation itself. Can that take place without significant brain damage? Once that has happened, there is potentially a long wait during which various things need to happen. Our brain needs to be preserved without incident for, in some uh, forecasts, centuries, in other forecasts, many decades. And during that time, the organization to which we have committed our mortal remains needs to exist in some form or other, and the surrounding society has to avoid destroying itself with a major collapse, a nuclear war, or whatever. And at the same time, science and engineering need to advance sufficiently 
so that eventually they reach the stage when reanimation is possible. And at that stage, our descendants, whether our literal descendants or our community descendants, will need to want to revive us, and that reanimation should have no nasty surprises. I've color-coded the steps here. The first three are broadly under our influence and control, not completely. What about science and engineering advancing sufficiently? I'm going to argue that AI and recent changes in AI are altering sensible forecasts of when this might be possible. I'm not going to put my trust in nanotech to start off with. I'm going to put more of my trust on AI, which will in due course enable nanotech. This AI enhancements can reduce the time under which we can expect to be in this cryopreserved state. If you think it's unlikely that society could survive for three and a half centuries without destroying itself, then if you only have to survive 35 years, it's a more credible thing. And I'll argue it's also possible that AI can help us there with enhancements in how the brain is cryopreserved. So let's talk about AI. And it's my view that most people don't understand AI very well. Even those who claim to understand AI often are stuck in the past in their thinking. So some people have been influenced by Hollywood films and science fiction, and that's all they've got. And their knowledge is almost useless. Then there are people who knew what AI was like around 2010, and they can talk knowledgeably about that, and they're not aware of what's happened in the meantime. Their forecasts are almost useless as well. Then there's the people who think they know what was happening until about 2020. They are aware of deep learning and neural networks, for example, but they're not aware of what's happened more recently. Again, their forecasts are not to be relied on. And this is the fourth level that I'm going to try and explain to you what's been happening in AI since 2020, which is remarkable and which I claim actually nobody properly understands, which makes it all the more important, all the more fascinating. To keep some track of the forecasts for what is likely in AI, there is a site, metaculus.com. If you go there, it will welcome you and it will announce that it is a community dedicated to generating accurate predictions about future real world events. Not just progress in AI, progress in lots of things. And they do this by aggregating the, what they call collective wisdom, insight, intelligence of its participants, where the ones who have a better track record, their predictions are given more weight in the averages. When people predict something in the past and the community thinks they give good reasons and indeed their forecasts were borne out, then that's a reason to take their forecasts more seriously. So let's look at the Metaculous page for when the community thinks general AI will exist and be publicly known. More precisely, when what they call weekly general AI is publicly known. I'll explain that in a moment. And I'll also explain this graph in a moment, which, as you can see, tracks the community forecasts from 2020 up till the present time. So the site Metaculus is to be commended for being quite explicit what they have in mind. So for general AI, they say that one piece of software must be able to do four quite different things. It should be able to pass a Turing test, which means that somebody who's chatting to it won't be sure whether it's just a human helped by an AI or whether it's just an AI. It also must be able to do something called a Wienogrand challenge and score at least 90%. That's dealing with text, which is relatively easy for humans to understand, but which most AIs struggle. When you come to a paragraph like the one I'm showing you, if you ask whose wallet was it, most AIs can't answer that today. This AI should also be able to answer mass problems, not mass problems typed in AI language, but mass problems from an SAT exam shown to the computer just by an image. And it should score at least as well as the 75th percentile of humans. And last, it should do very well in a game 
from the classic Atari set, which has defeated most of the other AI systems so far, even though these other AI systems have done well on most of the Atari games. So how has this forecast changed over the last few years? In 2020, the forecast came down quite a lot. In 2021, they drifted up a bit, and in 2022, they have come down and down. Yes, in October 2022, that community is predicting that there will be one piece of software which can do all of that in just six years' time. That is, by the way, the median estimate. That's the thick line. If you look for a 50% confidence range, then there are people who are saying it's 25% likely that we'll have this within three years. So are all these people just mad, this large community? Are they existing just in an echo chamber? I think no. And I'm going to try and argue in the next 10 minutes or so that they are sensible in predicting short timelines for significant progress in AI, more than was previously expected. Just to be clear, how does AI work? Well, there are two aspects to AI. And I'll explain how it will work in the future as well. The first aspect is that AI can follow rules. You type things in. The second is that it can spot patterns by itself. So following rules, you can ask linguists, what are the rules of grammar? You can type in these rules of grammar into the AI explicitly. There will be if then else types of statements. You can have uh, law officials typing in the laws about speed limits. You can have rules coded by all kinds of experts. Whereas for neural networks, instead, it's simply the AI notices things by itself. Ah, when A is there, it's usually followed by B. If C, then it usually means D. These are not rules explicitly coded. They are more rules of thumb, worked out by training. And I'll talk more about different training methods shortly. The stuff on the left is classical AI. It was how AI started off mainly. The stuff on the right is neural networks and deep learning. The stuff on the left is explicit reason. The stuff on the right is often called artificial intuition because its rules are implicit. And the most successful of today's AIs, by the way, include combinations of both an intuition module and a reasoning module. And that's going to be more in the future. So what's happened? Here's an example from early 2020. What's going on in that orange box? It's a mammogram. You might guess this is a cancer tumor detected by AI, which, as it happens, was previously missed by six human radiologists. Is that impressive? You should say to me, no, that could be a one-off. How about the statistics? So let me tell you the statistics of this case. The software had been trained by seeing 91,000 mammograms, which were each labeled in terms of there's a growth here which will become malignant, or there's a growth here that doesn't become malignant. But it wasn't given any more reasoning apart from that raw data. Then it was tested on 30,000 new mammograms it hadn't seen before. And compared to the human radiologist in the US, it had 9.4% fewer missed tumors. That probably works out to many women who would still be alive if their AI had been there. Is that impressive? Well, you should still be unsure because after all, in such tests, there are two kinds of errors. One, you can miss a tumor that's there. But secondly, if you are too trigger happy and you are saying all the time, there might be a tumor here, there might be a tumor here, you will have lots of cases of false alarms. But the reason the community paid attention to this result was that it was better in terms of fewer missed tumors and fewer false alarms. Another example also from early 2020, another kind of training, training an AI, giving it the atomic and molecular features of 2,500 drugs and natural compounds with, in each case, just one further piece of information. Did it block the growth of E. coli bacteria? 
why is this a useful thing to explore? Because we are standing on the precipice of having superbugs that evade all the antibiotics we've got. And we are struggling to come up with new antibiotics. So let's get an AI in the same way to look at possible new solutions. So once it was trained, then it was given a test set. In this case, nobody knew for sure what these 6,000 other compounds would do to E. coli. And the software was asked, pick out a few that are unlike, dissimilar in superficial aspects from existing known antibiotics, but which is still judged by AI as likely to block E. coli. And one compound was identified, a small number was identified, and one has since been gone through real trials, which are very promising. It had been a drug initially developed for diabetes, dropped because it wasn't very good, but some details of its properties were still around. And this is being expanded now into a much larger database. What's going on here is something that caused many AI practitioners at the time to be shocked at how good their systems were. If we roll back to 2014, here's a number of a famous photograph. And I'm heard that the software developers fell off their seats when the AI was able to describe what's going on in this picture. Classical AI would have struggled to know much about this. It would have said, there's grass, there's trees, there's people. But the new neural network said, I think this is a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee. Another example. Shown this picture, it said, I think this is a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road. Another example. I think this is a herd of elephants walking across a dry grass field. I'm not sure how dry it is, but it's still an impressive captioning. Is that impressive? Well, you should say it could just be cherry picked examples. And indeed the software wasn't always good in other examples, but we can look at some statistical data. This is a slightly different imaging competition. This was held every year from about 2010 until a few years back. And in this case, the software was trained on a large set of images and then shown new ones. And it was given a multiple choice. Which of these captions do you think is appropriate? And in 2010, it wasn't that good. It had an error rate of 28.5%. And that was using classical if else if then else logic but since then that has moved up the best systems are now at superhuman level they are more accurate and human in identifying for example what kind of tree might be in a picture or what kind of animal might be in a picture superhuman level with a big surge in 2012 and that is called the big bang or sometimes the alex net breakthrough because the name of that software was AlexNet, named after the one of the three people at the University of Toronto who had developed it. It scored much better than anybody had expected would be possible using neural networks. And since then, similar methods, similar methods have revolutionized many other fields, including language translation. Here's something that Google put on their blog in 2016. By applying similar methods, they have improved in a single leap more than they've seen in the last 10 years combined using the old fashioned classical AI mechanisms. So their translations were no longer clunky, they were much more fluent. Let's put all this in a simple picture. This is too simple, but at a certain level of approximation, it's useful. What I'm showing here is the improvements in the ability of classical AI which did some things well in the 1970s and gradually got better. In the blue, I'm showing not classical AI, but these new systems, neural networks and deep learning, which were around for a long time. In fact, the theory of neural networks was written down famously in the 1940s by Warren Pitt and Walter McCulloch, but they were slammed, they were denied. The gurus of AI, such as Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert, two people who were my childhood heroes in some ways, they both said that this deep learning stuff, they didn't call it deep learning, neural networks or perceptrums could never solve any interesting problems. Thankfully, a few mavericks 
disbelieved the words of these apparent experts. They kept on going, like Jeff Hinton, the leader of that team in Toronto, like Jan LeCun, who's now one of the heads of AI in Facebook. And by 2012, there were the results that I've shown you because they had better algorithms, better than the ones that Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert had criticized. There was also access to big data. There was also new kinds of hardware that made many of the considerations about Moore's law actually more or less irrelevant, as it turns out. But I'm not here to tell you about that blue line. I'm here to tell you in the last few minutes something about a new surge of creativity in AI. A surge that I long predicted, but I now think it's already starting to happen, starting to break through. And at 2022, we can see the early signs of remarkable, faster wave of progress in AI. So what I'll try and cover briefly about this next wave, despite the denials that some people thump the table and say, no, deep learning is forever limited. It can't solve various problems. Despite these denials, which are akin to many of the denials of the classical AI gurus from the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s, I'm going to put forward quickly reasons why I'm expecting this surge to happen, what that surge will consist of, when it will happen. Well, I've already given you a rough answer to that. And then, of course, the so what. So what for society and so what for biostasis. As for why, it's money. It's huge amounts of money. AI is no longer a science project, a philosophy project. It is something that determines the route to absolute riches. The most powerful, successful companies in the world are those who are deploying AI. It's not just a competition for commercial dominance. There's also a geopolitical competition. China does not want to be left behind behind the power of Western AI. Russia does not want to be left behind. Saudi Arabia does not want to be left behind. They are investing very heavily in AI. Even Dubai, where I was a few uh, a couple of weeks ago, is very determined not to be left behind. There is a powerful uh, community all competing here. Then there are more and more people in this field, people who are converting to this field, who are being trained very quickly in this field with more online information and assisted by today's AI and deep learning to come up with new improvements in AI and deep learning. There's a couple of cute pictures here. If you want to learn about AI, you no longer need a human to teach you. You can be taught by an online automated course. Automated machine learning is making the technology more accessible to non-AI experts. And it's not just that AI can teach people AI, AI can often write better AI. Here's a story from Wired. Google's learning software learns to write learning software that is in some cases more powerful and more efficient than the best system than human researchers themselves can design. This is not yet the singularity, but it is sign of positive feedback cycles. So there's a strong demand for new AI. There's also a strong supply of new ideas. So let's briefly run through the what. Large language models such as GPT-3, which is still evolving as I speak with so-called transformers, which to simplify a lot are just better algorithms for training data out of tokenized information, whether it's tokenized text or tokenized pictures. We used to have generative adversarial networks, which were creating new pictures. We've now got stable diffusion in the last few months, which is leaving behind the capabilities of generative adversarial networks, creating all kinds of new text and graphics and videos and sound. There are new insights ready to be deployed from understanding the brain, which will make these systems much more power efficient. There are the capabilities of decentralized networks to have emergent properties suddenly more powerful than the sum of the parts. There's AI that can understand cause and effect, a very interesting field of study. And there is transfer learning, as in Google DeepMind's GATO project. And that's GATO, which is not the French for cake, but the Spanish for cat. And I've only listed six. There's about 14 promising lines of inquiry that people are avidly studying as I speak. When? 
Well, I've said I see this is already breaking through. I urge people to keep an open mind, prepare to be surprised positively and yes, negatively. I do think there's at least a 10% chance of very major changes in AI capability by 2030, possibly sooner. I urge people to be skeptical of anybody who is dogmatically insistent about dates. And there's lots of reasons to be wary of insistent forecasts. There are, as Yael Pedro de Magales reminded us before lunch, there are predictions which have been far too early. There have also been predictions which have proven to be far too late. There are companies who overhype their products, deplorably in my view. There are also companies who paradoxically underhype the capabilities of their products. They emphasize longer timeframes than I believe they actually consider to be likely. Why? They don't want politicians, understandably don't want politicians being alarmed at the possibilities and coming in and imposing some ham-fisted, ignorant, unhelpful regulations. Regulations could be very counterproductive. Then there are consultancies who minimize talk about disruption because they want to keep their clients happy. They don't want to frighten their clients by talking about more powerful disruption. So they avoid frightening the horses. There are many people locked into their present paradigm. There are many people, frankly, who are motivated by psychological, philosophical disquiet. What are the meanings here? Well, what, first of all, I do think in the next 10 years, possibly sooner, field after field, including medicine, including drug discovery, is poised to be transformed even more than you would have thought by just following that blue line. Expect the majority of jobs to be altered. Expect extensive social turmoil. Expect a lot of weaponization of this new technology by people creating ransomware and malware and cyber hacking. Expect, however, many wonderful positive opportunities if we are ready to seize them. For a brief exploration of some of this, I'll point you at Bloom, which you can find explained in a very nice video by a deep learning expert who has kept up to date with this, Harrison Kinley. His YouTube channel is SentDex. A couple of things I've got from his video about the capabilities of this Bloom a Big Science Large Open Science Open Access Multilingual Project. It's a real admirable example of the best that humanity can do. More than a thousand researchers from more than 250 institutions have collaborated on a supercomputer whose time has been donated by the French government. What it comes up with is an example of the power of these large language models. It does take a huge effort to train the model, but it is a simple task not only to use the model, it's also a simple task to customize it to new tasks. Just like the brain was enormously difficult to design, it took hundreds of millions of years of evolution, but it produces young children who can learn new tasks relatively quickly. And until recently, skeptics laughed at neural networks and said, ha, huh, my young child doesn't need a million pictures of cats and a million pictures of dogs to learn to tell them apart. Well, I have to say, nowadays, the new Bloom systems, amongst others, you can train it on a new task very quickly. This is transfer learning. And here's just one example. There are many in that video. Some of them are even more impressive, but this is the quickest one I could explain. Bloom continues a conversation. So you've got to type up a conversation and let it go. So Harrison Kinsley just devilishly tried this. He typed in a question in English, put a reply in Spanish, another question in English. This is something that almost certainly the AI had never seen in scanning all its text. And it produced a very coherent, plausible continuation. This is not multi-shot learning. This is one-shot learning. And as Harrison Kinsley says in that video, what an incredible time to be alive. And some of the other examples, which it would take too long to explain, he says he had to get up off his seat and walk around the room. He was so amazed at how intelligent this piece of AI was. So what does that leave us? I think it does make it more plausible. We will have shorter timelines. I think it's quite credible. We will have cryo animation later this century. 
So that's more plausible. We'll also have longevity escape velocity earlier than many people think, but likewise, many people still in this audience will probably die before that happens. So we should put our effort into using AI to ex improve the possibilities. As Jao Pedro was saying at the end of his talk, combining AI with the problems in cryopreservation should be one of our highest tasks. And especially if we do that with this new wave of AI. I'm sorry I'm not there with you in Switzerland today. Some of these discussions at least will continue in Madrid next month. Thank you very much to the tomorrow bio for hosting such a good event. Thank you. Thanks, David. We're, you're just saying that while we fix some technical problems, um, but we're going to have that fixed in a second. Um, David, we, we're doing Q&A in like one minute once uh, the small technical issues are hopefully resolved, um, and then we do Q&A. David, can you hear me? I can, yes. Um, and we have indeed now fixed the technical problems. Um, almost. All right, now we do. All right, any questions from the audience? No questions. Okay, I need to check if there's now questions from uh, from the online uh, audience. So, so, so the last uh, the last one uh, was: Do you have any prediction when, in quotation marks, turnkey chronics will become available? So that was a, a question I think before my talk. That was a question that was posted earlier. Uh, when turnkey chronix could be available, all I can do is offer a statistical spread of possible uh, dates. I think there is a 50% chance we could have that by 2030, and that will be a much more straightforward process in which many of the standard traditional uh, medical facilities are quite comfortable in uh, extending their processes smoothly into the processes of uh, cryonics. So that could be here in 2030. On the other hand, there are many ways in which you could go, could go wrong, and we're still in 2030 looking forward to that at some stage in the future. I'm guessing David, my talk uh, probably David, didn't, get, so didn't get brought... Thank you for yeah. your presentation. And I would call the next speaker. Oh, there's one more question. Go ahead. Yeah. So, David, the question was, and for the audience uh, remotely as well, um, what would be possible use cases for biopreservation, for, for AI in biopreservation, right? Yeah. So, AI is able to look at a whole bunch of data and make suggestions that uh, humans couldn't make, just as it could uh, scan the medical data and come up with a clearer knowledge, just as it could scan data about drugs and make recommendations. So, it could scan our systems. And then it could say, here's a possible cryoprotectant that you haven't considered. Here's a possible other in intervention that you haven't considered. So we'd still need to validate them, but it could help to funnel down the set of ideas to consider. And Perfect. also very importantly, in the audience. Go ahead, please. There is one other thing, which uh, Demis Hassabis has talked about a lot. When the protein folding software... David, um, and for the audience, what's, what's your prediction or what's your opinion on uh, Ray Kurzweil's 2045 timeline? Well, and to my mind, Ray Kurzweil is both the hero and the villain of making predictions. 
I think a lot of what he says is profound, but I think he gives 16 years in between software passing the Turing test and what he calls the singularity. So 2029 to 2045. I think on the contrary, as soon as we have software that's able to pass the Turing test, it will self-improve much faster. So if we do have the Turing test software, the software that passes the Turing test by 2029, we'll get to something like the singularity much sooner than 2045. All right, Roman, one more. The question was, which countries are leading in, in AI research, China versus US and, and, uh, and so on? Well, the remarkable thing is that these large language models are easily accessible. So a small group of people in any country in the world can do interesting stuff with these compiled large language models. So the most interesting breakthroughs might come from a relatively unknown place, people who are willing to try something differently. So it's no longer you just need to have huge resources. You can take benefit of the models that have been released and compiled. And sure, China's making progress. Sure, there's lots of progress in America. But I think we are more decentralized with the possibilities for AI progress than in the past. Thank you so much. So as the next speaker, I would ask Max Marty to the stage. All right, am I coming through okay? Good. Okay, well, I will power through this, see if we can help us get back on track. But I think this could be one of the most important uh, non-scientific um, research projects, we could say, uh, of recent times in cryonics. And uh, incidentally, since David was talking about AI, that was not chiseled by me, but of course chiseled by uh, an AI called Midjourney. Uh, there we go. So as many of you know, um, I uh, have, I'm part of a uh, podcast called The Cryonics Underground with Daniel, who is here in the audience. And I also started a uh, Discord server, which is the, I would say, pre pre preeminent cryonics server uh, of, uh, of our times, and um, I have had a chance with both of these to meet uh, virtually and speak with a lot of people in the Cryonics community. Obviously with the Cryonics Underground, I've had great conversations with a lot of the kind of who's who in Cryonics, many of which are in this audience. And on the Cryosphere, I've had a chance to speak with uh, a lot of people who many of us may not know, but are cryonicists, uh, our members or are what we call the cryocurious or the cryocrastinators or people who are interested in the subject. And um, through these conversations on the Cryonics Underground and through the cryosphere, I have come to learn a number of interesting things about the kind of people who call themselves cryonicists. And uh, some of these discoveries are, for example, that a large portion of cryonicists seem to be perfectly okay with mind uploading and the scenarios which lead to mind uploading, such as neuro is typically thought of to lead more likely to that. Um, while a substantial number of cryonicists uh, find this to be a terrible idea, would not wanna be uploaded, uh, or if they are uploaded, don't feel that the person who is uploaded or run in a simulation or run in some other substrate uh, is them in a meaningful way that they that they value and that matters. Um, there are also a number of people I've met who claim that the reason that they're into cryonics is because of an underlying fear of death, an anxiety that they had around death that they've had through their lives, um, some of which I know are in this audience, and, uh, and it is because of this fear of death that they thought about cryonics, they searched cryonics, and indeed they became cryonicists to 
um, to, to quell that fear, to, to, to quiet it down, to assuage that fear of death. However, for many other cryonicists, I would put myself in this latter camp, um, they are signed up because of the sense of adventure, the sense of what about all those enormous questions we're gonna get a chance to answer in the distant future that we're not anywhere near being able to answer right now. Of course, you know, if the singularity happens next year, well, that's different, but you know, for the rest of us, we see this distant future when really interesting things can happen and we are, there's much to explore that we couldn't possibly explore today. And that's what drives us to be interested in cryonics. However, the interesting thing is these two, the, these different camps, from what I've gathered, tend to think that the opposite camp is silly, crazy, doesn't exist, doesn't exist in large numbers, or um, that they're sort of like superstitious and supernaturalists, you know. Um, so like a, uh, a prominent member of the mind uploading camp, I would say, is um, someone we had on the podcast called Robin Hansen. Um, and the impression I got from speaking to him privately was uh, not that he wouldn't, of course, he would be perfectly happy with everybody knowing this, but that um, if, if you'd think mind uploading is, a, you know, is not really you or something, you're just like some confused supernaturalist. So the people in these different camps really don't have a good understanding that uh, that there are these other camps of people and that um, perhaps they, they, they are more numerous in the cryonics space than they realize. In fact, some of the people who have an anxiety or a fear of death uh, have told me that this whole thing about wanting to be a cryonicist for a sense of adventure is just a, a, a smoke screen, is just a, my way of hiding my deep inbuilt anxiety and fear of death. This is how I'm coping with it because of course the real thing that's driving me towards cryonics is of course an anxiety and a fear of death. So you can imagine that it's, a, it's kind of a complicated, complicated situation that I've, I've kind of discovered. Uh, okay. There's also, I've noticed, a number of groups that seem to be overrepresented among cryonicists, engineers and programmers. I think many of you have noticed this. Rationalists, there's a sort of subset of people. Um, there's substantially more men involved in this. Um, many, many people, in the, uh, in especially you know, different places that I've interacted with them, seem to be somewhere on the autism spectrum. And uh, that's not disparaging in any way. I think you know that's sort of a superpower that I don't have, but um, they are somewhere on the autism spectrum. And the truth is, uh, well, I mean, well, so, so of course, politically different groups are overrepresented and, and cryonicists tend to have, as far as I can tell, fewer children. But the point of all this is, these are all speculations. Right, we, I assumed certain things about how many people are, are uh, uh, engineers and programmers, how many might be on the autism spectrum, et cetera, based on my own interactions with people, anecdotes, stories, uh, et, et cetera. There has not yet, or certainly not recently, been any kind of comprehensive investigation into these questions about the Crownix community. So, what are some other potential questions that we don't have good answers to? How many people are in favor of neuro versus whole body? Obviously, if you sign up for neuro, even though you have the money to afford whole body, it means you probably think it's a good idea. But is that because they are also mind uploaders, which seems to be more popular among neuro, or just because of the financial costs of it? We all speak to them, we might have some ideas, but again, no real study has been done to try and ascertain these questions in any um, uh, uh, formal sense. What about people's journeys to become a cryonicist? Obviously, tomorrow biostasis and, and the other CSOs have an interest in understanding this, to understand how better to outreach to them, but we have not had a systematic look at this. Why are cryocurious uh, and cryocrastinators still cryocurious and cryocrastinators? We might hear from many of the ones that do transition into becoming cryonicists, but we don't hear about the ones very much that have not yet transitioned into becoming cryonicists. What about the cryopreservation of pets? There are many people who think that that's ridiculous, bad PR, silly, gives the cryonics a bad name. And there are many people who think it is actually the gateway into making cryonics a much broader and more important endeavor than it is today. Um, our attitudes towards risk, so is a person who is, has a great uh, uh, worry about death and their fear of death, is that also correlated with their attitudes towards financial risk and personal risk and health risk? We just don't know. There's so many interesting questions about 
the Quranic community that really seem to divide us and we are uh, in the dark about a lot of these things. So, the goal here in what I am launching today, the cryonics survey of 2022, is firstly to help the CSOs improve their own outreach, so that is so reduce wasted efforts and um, be able to reach those people more effectively. So if you understand, for example, that there tend to be four large categories of people who become cryonicists, A, B, C, and D, and you can very quickly ascertain whether a person who is expressing some interest is in camp C, you know how to better approach them than if you are sort of not sure and you sort of talk about this and you talk about that and you don't realize that the reason that they're trying to become cryonicists is because they have an anxiety and a fear of death. That's different than somebody who's doing it because they are looking for adventure in the future and would be marketed to differently. So, um, of course, this survey goes well beyond just understanding that. We want to get an idea of what do existing members think about their cryonic service organization, how well is it doing, what can it do differently, how can it improve, um, and of course, hopefully, someday, offer different services based on a better understanding of what cryonicists believe uh, and, and, of course, what they want. The philosophical frameworks that underpin their ideas, I, I think a lot of people who dismiss these questions are um, short-sighted. And uh, I, I, I think this survey will, well, it'll either prove me right or wrong to some extent. So without too much further ado, I want to encourage everybody watching, everybody in the audience, to at some point go to this link, bit.ly, cryosurvey2022, or you can uh, scan the QR code, and take the survey. Now, it is not a short survey. It is comprehensive, so make sure you have a good, you know, cup of tea or whatever it is that you're going to enjoy. Um, now, all of the results of this survey, of course, if, when you take the survey, your own responses will not be tied specifically to you. We don't ask you your name. We don't ask you a membership ID or anything like that. Um, so, uh, but uh, any, any information that is published on this survey will be published in aggregate, and we will be putting together um, a, a, a comprehensive analysis of the survey, including looking for things such as correlations that might be interesting between different groups um, who, who, uh, who are taking the survey. Now, the survey is not only for cryonicists. We would also love to get a lot of responses from the cryocurious, the cryo-interested, the cryocrastinators, somebody who finds it really uh, worth discussing and worth thinking about, because it's useful to understand and have data from the difference between these two groups. So if you can understand why is it that some people went from being cryocurious to being cryonicists, and other people who have not yet made the leap, maybe there's some distinction that we can find in the survey that helps us explain this unusual fact pattern. So that said, I would love to open the floor for questions, comments, or cheap shots. Well, I, I hope we find some, some relationships in, in what we're looking for. We are asking questions on religion. So we have questions to understand what are people's religious views and whether or not they hold those religious views strongly or less strongly. Do they think those religious views are quote unquote true or are they only faith, you know, well, I, I kind of go to religion, you know, I go to church on Sundays because that's what we do, we people here who live, whatever. So um, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer specifically in this survey what you're describing. However, I think that this survey is going to be the first survey in a set of these that we can repeat in coming years. Get rid of questions that we found weren't very important, weren't interesting, didn't get at useful information. And of course, add new questions that will get at exactly the kinds of things that the first survey brings up or that were not covered in the first survey. Quick reminder to repeat the question briefly. Oh, sorry, yes, yes, yep. Um, quickly one from the remote audience. Uh, are you planning uh, underground podcast episodes about the survey? Daniel, are we yes, we are. We are planning an article. Yeah, so the next episode will be 
um, about uh, about the survey. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, so to repeat the question, um, have, I, have I considered what are people's, um, uh, you know, that, that people may not know what their real motivations are or that they may say something immediately but then think about it a little deep, more deeply and then realize that their motivations are actually different than what they're first saying. Um, yes, uh, we have thought about that and there's two ways that the survey is trying to address that. One is instead of just asking, you know, why is it that you're doing X? Um, there's actually some questions that kind of present the scenario, especially around like the philosophical views. Um, so instead of just saying, you know, do you think simulation is you? You know, instead it's, it says, well, imagine a, a circumstance where, you know, this happens and then this happens and then you're uploaded in this way and people think this. What do you think about this? Does it make you comfortable and uncomfortable? And, you know, what, how, how would you react? So we try to ask mm, deeper questions because I do think, like you said, that, that it's, um, it's hard to get at the real meaning. The other thing that we do is we, for example, when we say, what, do you, what are the typical objections that you hear? That's one of the questions. What are the typical objections that you hear? We say, what are the typical objections that you hear? And then we ask, but what do you really think is the person's actual objection? You know, so the first question is, what do, you, what do you hear them say? And then what do you think they say? Because a lot of times a person will say, well, they, have, they say it's because of this, but in reality it's because of death anxiety. Well, I don't know about that. But at least we get, we, again, we gather a lot of this data and then analyze uh, to what extent it is or is not useful later on. Right. Well, I think um, in total, in, in sort of all of Cryonics and all memberships, I think there's something like five five thousand or you know in that order of magnitude number of people totally signed up, et cetera. So I think if 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 uh, if this survey could get even you know ten percent of that or or five percent of that, so you know in, in the hundreds, I think would be great um, if that could be achieved. Now, of course, that's difficult because of the fact that it's a longer survey. Actually, in the survey, one of the final questions that is optional. Um, allows you to essentially uh, uh, get into a contest where you can uh, win a $50 Amazon gift card, and then the two runners up to that contest win $25 Amazon gift cards. So there is some of an incentive there for people who are you know, motivated by that. But uh, like Daniel said, I think the real motivation here should be, let's actually learn about the people that are in our own community so that we can um, do a lot of things more effectively, better, and, and frankly, just, just communicate with each other in a way that is, um, um, more understanding of the other person and the fact that they may not be fully on board with the reasons that you happen to be a cryonicist. Awesome, great. Thanks cool. for the talk. Yep. And I'll take over the microphone again. Yep. And I would ask Max Moore to the stage for the next talk. <laughs>
Uh, a few years ago, this might have been a, a tougher sell. We've gone through a long period of very low inflation and probably you thought inflation wasn't really an important topic, but it's pretty hard to ignore it these days. And I think it's actually a major problem for cryonics and um, both on an organizational level and an individual level really needs more attention. And you know, given that we're here at a new organization, it, it can get uh, started early on with proper planning and thinking about this issue. So what I'm going to argue really is that, well, first of all, it seems obvious that when you say it, but cryopreservation minimums will rise over time, at least in nominal terms. That seems like a really obvious thing that doesn't need to be stated, and yet people sign up with minimum funding all the time as if inflation doesn't exist, as if prices won't go up, which is kind of foolish. Um, they will go up, even not in real terms, they will in inflation adjusted uh, uh, in nominal terms. Secondly, most people are pretty bad at financial planning, and that includes you know, probably a bunch of us in here, uh, clients in general, we're not very good at thinking long-term, putting money aside on a regular basis, and so it becomes an issue, because if you're funding this purely f through uh, insurance and you run out of funding because you need to raise your minimums later on, have you saved enough to better deal with that handily? Uh, we know that many people are not that great at it. Alcor has actually had a big underfunding crisis, which we've made a lot of progress on, but it's not completely resolved because obviously Alcor has been around for a long time and people signed up when minimums were way lower. Some people signed up for 35,000 when minimums are now 80,000 um, and so on. So doubled or tripled since that time. And that's a problem when you raise the minimums after a long period of time and people are not used to increasing them, they're suddenly in trouble. Well, how do I increase my insurance? And maybe they've gotten older, maybe they're no longer insurable, maybe the policy doesn't allow them to add more to it. And then you've got an issue to deal with. And well, these are the points I'll go through as I go along on grandfathering and so on, but we'll, we'll come to those. So first of all, okay, so the point is again, you know, today, I think we can understand inflation is real. This is back when you could get a gallon of gas in the US for a gallon, not a liter, for 27.9 cents. And today you can pay actually up to about $7 in California. So it's pretty, it's pretty hefty when you look at that. I guess in Switzerland, it looks like it's probably slightly more expensive than in California. Now, a lot of people, I've seen you know, some of the geniuses on the internet, you know the kind of people I'm talking about, who say, well, of course, I've never told people about this. They've never warned us about inflation. Well, excuse me. Yes, we have. There's a whole bunch of articles on this over time that have looked at this. Um, but, you know, maybe we haven't done enough still because obviously a lot of people aren't really planning this well enough. So it still needs emphasizing. Which way do I point this? Over here? No. No. Oh, yeah. Okay. I stole this from some website recently. I'm not quite sure who runs it, actually. But this is pretty handy. This, this adjusts, uh, it takes the 1982 minimums, which is when we had the increase from 81, which was completely unrealistic, I think, and then adjusts for inflation. And what you can actually see is the neuro is actually cheaper if you adjust for inflation. So compared to inflation, we've been going up less than inflation. And for whole body, that's quite considerably the case. And I think it's because we've been underpricing whole body for a long time. So uh, people say, well, of course, being just you know, increasing prices over, over time way too much. Actually, it's less than inflation. It probably should have gone up more. So if you look at, if you take the 1982 minimums, for Nero it was 35,000 compared to today's 80,000. It was 100,000 for whole body compared to today's 200,000. Um, and that was the average inflation rate over that 40 year period. If minimums had gone up in accordance with inflation, Nero would be 107,500 rather than 80,000. Whole body would be 228. And so these are the inflation rates and these are the actual average increases. And as this is already sort of suggesting, we've been underpricing whole body. We haven't been raising that enough. I, I think that's kind of an important thing. This is actually from about 10 or 11 years ago. I think Ralph Merkel did this when we were looking at one of those papers that did discuss inflation problems. Um, so we're actually below the curve if you take an average of 3% a year, which is a pretty good estimate of very long-term inflation if you go back over a, a century or so. Um, this is what you see, you've got to start thinking, oh, maybe I need half a million dollars, at least in nominal dollars, sometime in the future uh, for whole body. Now, one issue is, okay, it's important both for organizations and individuals to make these plans, to think about, okay, if I'm 20 years old when I sign up, or 30 or 40 even, it's gonna be decades, hopefully, until you need to pay out for your cryopreservation. What will the minimums be at that time in the future? What basis do we want to use for that? Well, of course, we can use consumer price index or whatever the you know, European equivalents are. That's a very common one. That's the one you see in most of the newspapers. Uh, again, that's averaged around 3% over a long period of time. There's, but there's so many different indexes, you know, retail price index, employment cost index, GDP deflator. There's all kinds of these things. Which one is actually the most useful? 
is kind of a hard question to say because cryopreservation expenses are not necessarily representative of the entire economy. Uh, obviously, liquid, liquid nitrogen is going to be an important cost. So is land because you have to have the patients in, in a certain location. Uh, you need a certain amount of labor to, to look after them. So it's going to be a very small component of, of these indexes. So maybe you want to have you know, a cryonics index that's very specific to what you're using, which brings us really more to something like this one. You can do a projection of past costs in your actual, uh, past trends in your actual costs. Now that doesn't really work very much for, for EBF and other organizations like that because they've only been around for a few months and you can't make a useful projection based on a few months. With Alcor, we could actually go back 40 years. Mike Delman, back in 1982, wrote a, a very detailed piece called The Cost of Cryonics. And you can actually look at the numbers in there for all the very specific components of cryopreservation and maintenance of patients. And you can compare it to today. And so you can actually you know, see how much has it changed over 40 years and then figure out what the average is. So we, we do have actual data for us, but I don't know whether CI has that information. And of course, new organizations really won't better use that very well. Now, some of the factors we have to take into account, whether we decide to use an index or actual long run averages, we have to think, well, how accurately will that forecast the future? Because hopefully we'll get economies of scale. That's something we generally expect to see. But that's been something we've been looking for for a while in cryonics, and it hasn't really shown up very much yet. I think it's starting to do so. Um, you know, at Alcor, we expanded the patient care bay a few years ago, so we doubled the size of it. Uh, so we have a lot of room to expand, and, and you get these economies in kind of big lumps. So you can go for several years where you don't need more space, you don't need any more people to oversee it, uh, and you can maybe double or triple the number of patients. And then suddenly you realize, oh, we're running short of space, we've got to knock down this wall, reinforce it, uh, put new flooring in, and you get a sudden jumping cost. So it's, it's kind of a lumpy increase. But on the whole, there should be some economies of scale. Not in SST, I would argue. Actually, you probably don't see many economies in SST, uh, at least until you get to really large sizes, because those costs don't really go down. But for patient storage, you should get them, especially if you're using automation. So for instance, at Alpha right now, Steve Graber is doing a lot of work on automating patient care. We can actually monitor cool downs, for instance, remotely, and there's all kinds of alarm systems. You can watch it on video. Um, and you might Perry, our patient caretaker, it doesn't necessarily have to be in there as often uh, as he is, because we can monitor this remotely. And certainly, if you get hundreds of patients or thousands of patients, you can have much more sophisticated systems with the cost spread over many more people. So that should actually hold down prices, and maybe economies of scale does explain part of why our minimums have actually increased less than inflation. OK, so how do we figure out? If we're thinking about, OK, I, I have to seriously think about 30 years, 40 years, 50 years from now. So how much are we talking about? Well, we have to look at some assumptions. So we've got the, what we've seen the average rates in the past, which again, a little bit misleading because I think we're behind the increases we should have. But let's think about, okay, 3% we can take because it's a long run average, but it might be 2%. Maybe we go back to the, the, the more recent regime where inflation was lower, but it could easily go up to 4% and you know, hopefully not higher than that. The longer the time period, obviously, and the higher the percentage growth, the scarier the outcome. So if you're starting you know, the whole body, which currently is 200,000, at 2%, in 30 years, you're going to need 362,000. Um, and in 50 years, 538,000. It starts a little bit scary. But if you look at 4%, it looks a lot worse, 649,000 and 1.4 million. That looks pretty, pretty scary. So you think, do I really have to buy a life insurance policy for $1.4 million today? Well, we'll look at that. So you can run these projections. You can use any of these inflation calculators uh, based on your age and think, well, how long do I think it's likely before I'll be cryopreserved and how much am I likely to need to be paying out at that point? That's a good starting point. Okay, so let's look at some solutions on an organization and individual level. Now, one thing that we, we do at Alcor is we limit the draw on the patient care fund or the, the Alcor Care Trust as it is these days. And that has been set at a 2% limit, which is pretty conservative. The idea is that uh, you don't ever want to run out of money, no matter whether the market goes up or down over various periods of time. So you want to not take very much. You know, for retirement planning, for many years, people said 4% draw is probably fairly safe. You've probably got you know, a good 20 years or so. That's been questioned a little bit recently because people are living longer, and maybe 4% is, is too much. If you retire just when the market's going down for the next 10 years, you could be in trouble. Um, so. Can we, do we have to stick at 2%? Because obviously, you're going to have to raise the minimums if you're drawing at 3% because you're going to run out of money more quickly. So, uh, I mean, so the, the, sorry, the smaller the draw, you know, the lower the amount. But if we, if we go to 3%, then uh, we, can, we can delay raising the minimum. 
I don't think 5% is at all realistic. 4% is, is not really plausible for very long term if we're talking about 50 years plus. 3%, I wanted about 3%, since 2% is our current limit, but well, that's gonna make it really painful. If we had 3%, we could raise uh, rates by 50% without having a problem because we're increasing the draw. Um, but I've been told that experts who are much more expert than I am at, at statistics and mathematics and finance say that 2% is the only safe number. I'm not entirely convinced. I was playing around with a spreadsheet, which you might want to go here. It's a lot of fun. You can plug in all kinds of assumptions on, uh, depending on what your spread of investments are versus to stocks versus uh, bonds and so on, and over various periods of time. And it looks at historical data on you know, increases and decreases in the stock market, crashes and rises, um, and looks at the probability based on a very long history. I think it's based on 60 years of history, what the probability is that you would run out of money based on different draws uh, over a long period of time. And you, so you can put in... You know, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And it looks like 3% from the figures I've seen there, I want, I want someone to explain to me why it's 2% now, because it looks to me like 3% is actually pretty safe over 60 plus years. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying 2% is wrong because I'm not expert enough in those numbers to know, but uh, based on this, I think 3% might be plausible. I'm not sure what the policy is at other organizations, but uh, obviously the higher you go, the more risky it is. Uh, but if you go too low, then you're really meaning that you're going to require higher minimums, which obviously can cause problems. Okay. Now, one thing is, don't use grandfathering. A lot of people have assumed that Alcor has grandfathered all the members, and there's a lot of controversy about that. I think, actually, uh, in real policy, Alcor has never really grandfathered people, but in practice, it kind of has. And that's rather unfortunate, because people think it's an actual policy. Um, it's really a bad idea for an organization that's not growing very rapidly. Uh, if you're growing rapidly enough, grandfathering might be workable because people who've signed up earlier on and the rates have gone up and they're in the water, uh, they're under water, if you've got a lot of new people signing up at current rates, they become you know, a small percentage of those you have to deal with. But Chronix organizations, you know, at least till now, we can hope about the future, have been growing at pretty low percentage rates on average. So grandfathering people is really a very bad idea. It's gonna get you into big problems which can get larger and larger. So uh, unless you really start seeing growth rates, you know, 20%, 30%, 40% a year, uh, really avoid grandfathering. Um, some people say, well, other you know, companies do grandfathering all the time, so why don't bionics organizations? I don't think that's really true. I think uh, commercial organizations sometimes do a little bit of grandfathering early on, like Netflix had you know, subscriber rates uh, early on, but, uh, but they didn't last very long. They would actually expire after a while. Well, what they do is they force you into increasingly unappealing options. So it's a sort of push you to upgrade so you can stay grandfather beginning increasingly crappy service. So that's one way they, they deal with that problem. And we can't really do that, right? That's not a very good option for us. But there are some ways we can deal with this. So here's some things that, I mean, some of these things you'll be familiar with. Obviously one thing you can do, and this is something that Rudy Hoffman would love you to do, is to buy as much life insurance as you can possibly afford right now. You know, buy millions of dollars of life insurance and you're well covered for inflation. Uh, okay, if you're very young and in good health, you might might get too bad a deal on that. Um, my problem generally with relying entirely on, in, on insurance is that it's a pretty crappy investment. It's a very powerful tool, especially if you're younger and healthy. It gives you a lot of leverage when you're not really earning a lot of money. But to rely on is your sole mechanism of funding over the long term means you're probably throwing away a whole bunch of money. They have to make their margins and you, know, you don't control the investments. Uh, so one thing you should definitely do is buy a life insurance policy that can be expected to increase in nominal value over time. So hopefully the nominal value will increase enough that the real value won't go down. So if inflation averages 3%, you want the, the nominal value to increase by at least, at least that much. But of course, policies like whole life policies, which maintain the cash value, cost more, uh, so they're less appealing to people. So you tend to say, oh, I'm just gonna get term insurance because it's cheap. Well, there's a reason why it's cheap. 95% of the time it pays out nothing because it expires in 20 years or whatever your term is, and you haven't used it, only 5% of people use it. That's a pretty awful investment. So. Again, that's why I suggest term insurance should be something you want to use temporarily uh, to move something like a whole life or um, a universal life, or I think they call it a little bit differently here, or an indexed universal life where you can actually choose how much you invest in growth of the cash value, and that can help you keep up with inflation. But again, I'm not, I'm not an insurance person. I'm not really selling any of those policies. Those are all options that you can play with. Uh, but there are other options you should consider. And again, I don't know, I don't know if a CI has this. I'm not sure what uh, uh, tomorrow biostasis does. But one thing you can use, at Alcor, we've actually been tweaking this recently, um, you can have a prepaid account. Uh, a problem with this in the past was that I'd been told by our finance people for a long time that this wasn't really 
feasible or people could, could give us prepaid funds we'd have to put into a bank account which was you know for a long time was earning 0.02 percent which is pretty lousy and it's not going to keep up with inflation and i've been told there's nothing we could do about that because of the various technical reasons it seems that's not actually true so now we have prepaid accounts um, where you can prepay us and we'll put it into the endowment fund and that's designed to generate enough income to produce you know at least keep up with inflation so that's one possibility another one is to set up a trust so that you control your funds so you, you know, maybe you get your life insurance to cover you for now and for some time in the future but then rather than buying more and more life insurance which has a bad return if you invest decently you should get a much better return put that into a trust which then goes to your clinics organization or some part of it so that way you can make up for a shortfall in funding if you've bought you know 50 percent above today's minimums but after many decades it's now 300 percent more you can use that you can use a trust to make up for that uh, there's some alternative funding options i introduced this uh, some years ago at alcor because of the the you know, problem of people being underfunded and not having a lot of income as they get older uh, but some older people who don't have much income may have assets they may have houses maybe more than one house they may have other assets um, that's not very easy for chronics organizations to handle because they're risky someone says well i've got a house you can have well okay but where is it and what kind of condition is it in and how do we know someone else doesn't have a claim on that so there are a lot of risks so we introduced that with the big 50 percent discount for that kind of uncertainty um, so you know that that could help with some people especially who are older and uh, can't find other ways of dealing with it but then you start creating an organization that actually becomes a bit of a, a financial organization that has to handle all kinds of assets real estate and uh, you know who knows what other kinds of, of assets so you don't want to do too much of that really but that gives you some of the options um, but again I, I really urge people to uh, not think about minimums you know, minimum really is a minimum so that's why I always get annoyed people are still doing this all the time in alcohol meetings they talk about people who are overfunded and I say shut up there's no such thing as overfunded there's over minimum funding there's no there's no overfunding you can't be overfunded because you don't know how much it's going to be you know, 50 years from now so over minimum funding not overfunding doesn't exist it's a bad bad term to use uh, so insurance not not the only method for doing it but uh, use these projections to try and figure out how much you think you're gonna have to increase it and then how much do I want to do that by by some kind of insurance policy um, and how much do I want to do it by prepaying if that's an option of your organization or through a trust the other thing I, for the uh, organization that I suggest and this is based on I think Alcor's not very good practice is train people's expectations for inflation by making frequent changes to the minimums and by a small amount now Alcor has not been doing that because it's too painful to raise minimums everybody bitches and complains every time we do it and it's just no fun and so uh, you know minimums have not been raised since 2005 for neuro and 2010 for whole body that's a long time and when inflation was low that wasn't so bad but now it's picking up that's not a great thing um, and so if you have to raise them by you know 30 percent all at once it's just going to be a nightmare so you want to get people used to making changes maybe even annually or maybe every two or three years depending on inflation just by a little bit that way this idea of the minimum will get changed in people's minds to that really is today's minimum and next year it's probably going to be a little bit more so rather than just saying this is the minimum this is the amount which i think is very misleading um, so again alcohol has warned that it does go up but people ignore that when they hear about the minimum so train people's expectations um, that will push them to make use of some of these other mechanisms so that's pretty much it i uh, hope we have some time for questions we do from the audience, Well, that's kind of a dangerous question for me to answer, right? Because I'll, I'll get uh, very unpopular with CI people. Uh, I, I don't really know. What I would think is that um, obviously they've enjoyed some economies of scale. They're definitely a lower cost operation. Um, you know, they have much smaller staff. They don't really do much less research than we do. Uh, of course, that 28,000, we have to remember, I have to keep pointing this out, does not include SST. You've got to pay, I think, 60,000, 65,000 extra to get SST. So it's not a fair comparison in the first place. As I like to point out, uh, a neuro with Alcor. 80,000 could actually be less than uh, a whole body with CI. So if, if you're you know, happy with neuro, it could actually be less. Uh, but how they manage to keep those minimums, I don't know. And what I do know is they have nothing like an alcohol care trust, the patient care trust fund. The money is not put aside separately. Uh, and so 
you know, I don't know what their margin is or how much trouble they might be in in a few years' time, especially now inflation is picking up. So I wouldn't recommend that kind of super low cost forever model because actually what they've done by not raising prices is they've actually lowered them in real terms. And unless they're getting really good economies of scale, that doesn't seem like a sustainable approach to me. Yeah. Well, I think competition is always a good thing for, for the industry and for you know the consumer, as we don't really think of ourselves as consumers, but that's what we are essentially, consumers of cryonic services. Now, I don't, I don't think that, um, I think membership dues are more likely to get diverted to something not necessarily useful, but I think cryopreservation minimums, that's less of a problem because we've pretty much fixed in what we need to put in the, in the alcohol care trust to get that 2% return. Uh, SST costs what it costs, and so there's not a lot of uh, fudge room in there. But, um, but also, and of course, we could increase costs too. Like maybe eye vitrification, if I'm saying that right, maybe it'll cost more or sending out, you know, I don't know. We're not really sure whether things will increase more or less. If we become more professional, will we have to pay more real surgeons and doctors on the team? Otherwise, we get shut down by the regulators. So we may have economies or we may actually have some, something going the other way. Uh, a little hard to predict. But certainly by having more organizations, I hope you're moving, to, I really hope you're moving to the US because it's gonna kick alcohol's butt and CI butt. And it gives us incentives to be you know, more effective, to reach out to more people more effectively, to look at our costs and try to figure out how much of those costs are actually justified. Uh, so I don't believe in the super low cost model, but nor do I believe in making it unnecessarily expensive. So bring on the competition, it's good we'll for us. Do. Yeah. Um, a couple of other questions. Like how do you respond to people who believe Bitcoin will be the new gold and uh, alcohol by not putting any of their treasury into Bitcoin or anything like that? How do you, might, might be fall, alcohol might be fall, fall behind the curve? But. Well, that's uh, obviously Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies are a huge unknown in terms of what the return is over any particular period of time. So the policy we've had at Alcor since the beginning is that any uh, donation or payment we get through a cryptocurrency, we have to cash in right away for, for dollars. Um, uh, so for example, I, uh, this is a public thing I can say, uh, Vitalik Buterin of, of Ethereum gave us some money, I think it was like 2013 maybe, and it came to, um, the Ethereum came to about $27,000. If we'd held on to that, it would be worth probably millions now. And then it might have been worth nothing. So certainly if you're using that to pay for acquire preservation, that's too big a risk. Um, on the other hand, I think some of us, I'm, I'm one person, I think maybe one or two of the directors would be sympathetic to the idea of keeping maybe 5% of that because we actually already have a policy where we can use 5% for more speculative investments, but only that much. So that would seem reasonable, but it, it's still, I mean, it's still very early days for cryptocurrencies. We don't even know if Bitcoin will be the, the cryptocurrency of the future. Uh, it's really still so volatile that I think it's sensible to try and to cash in most of that right now and be a little bit cautious. But yeah, in the long term, sure. I mean, I don't think, uh, you know, government money is, is any more real money than the cryptocurrencies. It's just that governments can go out and they can force you at gunpoint to cough up more money if they need it. So you're kind of backed by that force in the end, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be more stable in the long run. But for now, let's be a little bit cautious and don't get overexcited about cryptocurrencies. Uh, one more question. So based on today's pricing, what should people use as an inflation rate for life insurance funding? Well, as I said, that, that's kind of <laughs> hard to say, but I think, the simplest answer is going to take the long run average, which has been over a century or so, has been about 3%. So we had this anomalous period recently, about 10, 15 years, where it was well below 3%. And people kind of got used to that and government started spending more because, oh, we don't have to pay much interest on our debt. And now we see you know, the outcome of that. So 3% is probably a pretty good basis, given that we're not sure how, whether our costs will go up or we'll get economies of scale. So 3%, you know, using the, the rule of 72, does everybody know the rule of 72? It's a very, very handy little tool. If you want to know the doubling time, any, any interest rate or inflation rate, uh, take 72, divide that number into it. So if it's 3% increase, divide into 72, basically 24, 24 years for that to double, whether it's you know, inflation uh, increase or increase on investment. So if you think it's gonna be about twice that long, about 48 years, so you probably need to be cryo preserved, you double it and you double it again, that's four times the current amount that you'll need. So to give a very simple answer that kind of ignores a lot of the complications, Maybe you think about 3% a year on average, unless our monetary system really goes off the rails. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Max. Yeah. Um, one more speaker before the break.
Take this home. I've got two handicaps. One, I had a stroke in, on June 30th, and so uh, my voice is still slurred, but uh, and, uh, email seems to think people can, will be able to understand me, and uh, I, guess, uh, I guess I can be understood. The other handicap, of course, is, is that I have a lot of text on my slide, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to read it. So we'll see. Um, which way I go? No, that's not the right way. Okay. So um, I just I wrote a paper in 2015 about cryoprotect cryopro cryoprotectant toxicity, and uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I appreciate the opportunity to expand on that topic. I, I was very pleased when Emil accepted my proposal to speak, and so. Uh, uh, I'm expanding on this paper. Um, oops. So, uh, CPA, you can hardly see it, uh, is the abbreviation of cryoprotective agent. And uh, I use that abbreviation a lot, uh, and a lot of people in cryobiology use that, uh, that expression or abbreviation. Um, it's a chemical present, preventing uh, ice formation. It's an antifreeze for biological tissues. If cryoprotectant toxicity could be substantially reduced, transplantable human organs could be stored at low temperature, and cryogenic uh, patients could be more easily preserved at cryogenic temperatures without ice formation. And uh, the challenge of preserving tissues and organs with CPAs is to use enough CPA to prevent ice formation but not so much to cause damage by cryoprotectant toxicity. So um, antifreeze, uh, you're familiar with, we're familiar with antifreeze in automobile, uh, automobiles, and actually uh, ethylene glycol and propylene glycol are the most commonly used automobile antifreeze. Um, and the propylene glycol uh, is actually um, used to make ice cream smoother and have less ice, and not just using automobiles. And ethylene glycol uh, forms highly toxic compounds in the liver, so you don't want to be using that in ice cream. Um, and, um, uh, but uh, propylene glycol is used as an antidote for ethylene glycol poisoning. But these aren't relevant because we're talking about low temperatures, and uh, the, the liver byproducts aren't relevant. So anyway, I show here the, uh, um, doesn't show up very well. The uh, pointer doesn't work on the screen. Okay, anyway, those are structures. I, I hope people are familiar with a little, <clears throat> just a little bit of chemistry because uh, there's a fair bit of chemistry in my presentation. I guess you, almost everyone knows the formula for water, H2O, and uh, that's the basis, and, and water forms ice, so that's pretty simple. And there's an attraction between oxygen and hydrogen, and that's, that's called a hydrogen bond. So hydrogen bonding between water molecules is the basis of ice formation. And um, we see that on the figure on the right, that's, that's uh, the way ice looks. It, uh, it forms a very strong water crystal lattice. And, uh, when you compare that with water, uh, the water <clears throat> in water, the molecules are just jumbled around. And so this, this structure crystal occupies 9% greater volume. And so this uh, causes mechanical damage. Uh, and uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, ice formation is so hazardous. So um, they, the mainly CPAs, uh, 
We use that formation by interfering with the hydrogen bonding water molecules. If you look at these cryo protectants on the bottom, um, certainly it's easy to see the OHs on uh, the first three, uh, which are, uh, <clears throat> are hydrogen bonding with water molecules and interfering with the process of ice formation. And then the DMSO, it's the, it's the carboxyl group of the oxygen is also forming uh, bonds with the hydrogens in water. So actually, uh, that's not the only way to have a, uh, we can increase the effectiveness of, of uh, prior protectants by adding methyl groups. And so here we have ethylene glycol, and we add a methyl group to that, uh, and we get propylene glycol. And you see the concentration needed to vitrify, CD, uh, becomes greatly reduced. In other words, you need a lot less propylene glycol to, to form a vitrification solution. And then you add another uh, methyl group, and uh, you get uh, this butane diol, but uh, you don't get as big a bang for your buck uh, by doing that. And the methyl groups enhance uh, release of electrons, the hydroxyl group uh, enhancing bonding. And there's also amides. Um, I'm putting. What? Um, so amides, uh, formaline is, is, <coughs> is uh, most notable uh, cryo protectant, but actually it can't, it can't do much cryo protecting just because it self associates. It's, uh, it's not, uh, it's not, um, um, it's not heterosexual, let's put it that way. Um, it, it likes a sort of self association. And, uh, but uh, if you add a methyl group to a formamide, you get acetamide and methyl formamide. And uh, these, these are, uh, these are um, heterosexual. They associate with water and uh, they, um, and they, uh, <clears throat> anyway, they, that, that increases the, the vitrifiability of this compound. Um, they're not self-associating so much, in other words. The methyl groups enhance the basicity of the carbonyl oxygen and the acidity of the amide uh, hydrogens, enhancing the chemical, chemical bonding of water. Now, I've, I've said vitrification, used the term vitrification uh, quite frequently because it's a term widely used in cryonics, and I'm expecting you to know <laughs> what this is, but uh, quartz and sand are crystal forms of silicon dioxide. Uh, they aren't glass. It's just like uh, ice is, is a crystal form of water, of uh, H2O. And um, silicon dioxide plus soda line plus soda, sodium oxide and calcium oxide make soda line glass. You know, just like uh, this glass I'm holding and the glass in the windows, these are not crystals. They're, they're glasses. They're vitrified. It means means they don't have this crystal structure that I showed in the earlier slide. Um, and so you can, uh, it's like a, when, when it cools, it, it's, if you've seen a glass blower, you know that the glass, the glass is, uh, when they cool it, it doesn't form a crystal. It just gets, as they lower the temperature, the gets thicker and thicker and, and until you have something like uh, this window pane. And so um, vitrification by cryo protectants doesn't cause a mechanical or solid damage that results from ice crystal uh, formation. So there's actually a number of achievements for vitrification. The uh, vitrification of rabbit brain has shown no ice anywhere by electron micrograph. Uh, vitrified hippocampal brain slices cool to um, a, Minus 30 degrees Celsius and way warm to allow 100% viability. And rapid kidney vitrified cool to minus 135 degrees Celsius and way warm was able to indefinitely sustain a rabbit as a sole function kidney. So that's pretty impressive, I think. Um, so 
toxicity increases with increasing concentration, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, if you increase, I show these uh, different uh, fire protections, but you see when you increase the concentration, the, the toxicity, which is shown in the vertical axis, increases much differently um, than uh, for, for each of the cryo protectants. Um, and here we see that it also lowers temperature, reduces cryo protection toxicity. So in this, so in this case, we're increasing the concentration of glycerol, and uh, and the toxicity rate increases much faster at 37 degrees than at 21 degrees. So um, that's the effect of uh, lower temperature as a way of reducing cryo protection toxicity. Well, there's another mechanism of cryo protecting toxicity that has to do with temperature, and that is uh, um, at higher temperature, the CPA is attached to protein enzymes, denaturing them. But at lower temperature, uh, the um, the water is closer to the proteins, allowing their natural form. Now, um, another example of this is shown by the. <coughs> In the previous example, okay, anyway, the, the, in this case, the vertical axis is indicating serum creatinine. So a higher serum creatinine indicates greater toxicity because the liver, the kidney uh, functions to remove creatinine produced by metabolism of creatine in the body. So high creatinine is a, a very commonly used in medicine as a sign of kidney damage. And in this case, I show, uh, th th this is shown, uh, uh, this is shown uh, rabbits exposed, rabbit kidneys exposed to, in, inside of rabbits, exposed to uh, um, prior protectants. And, and um, when, the, when the rabbits are, after the operation, um, they can recover because kidneys have, like other tissues, have self-repair capability. But if the cryoprotectant is exposed at the highest temperature, uh, initially the, the, there's a lot of damage to the kidney, but it declines gradually, but it declines. The, the, <coughs> if it's medium, medium levels or lower levels, it declines a lot faster and it does, it's less high initially. And the C is the control group where there's uh, uh, no cry protection used. So there's uh, also specific versus non-specific toxicity. Some toxic effects are specific to a particular CPA, but other toxic effects are inherent property of being a CPA that's non-specific. A CPA toxicity is poorly understood is not known actually whether specific or non-specific toxic effects are more important contributors to overall toxicity. So I'm showing this graph again, but you'll notice uh, formaldehyde and propylene glycol, the, the toxicity rises very fast uh, in comparison to the other cryoprotectants. So this indicates um, greater specific toxicities for these two molecules than, uh, than the other CPAs. Because um, if they were all having a, 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 a non-specific toxicity, in other words, they were all uh, toxic for the same reason, the, the lines would all be uh, matching. Now there's formamide, as I mentioned, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a, um, anyway, it's, it, has felt a lot of self-association, which is, a, I told you before, but I'm just showing you the citations on this statement. And uh, that that has a lot to do with the um, um, propylene glycol has specific, specific toxicity as indicated in, in the chart I showed you. Uh, at 10 degrees Celsius, it's damaging epithelial cells above a concentration of three molar but not, not less lower concentration. And human chondrocytes, cells in, from cartilage, 
exposed to many combinations of TGA, including DMSO, AG glycerol, formamide. At four degrees Celsius were most toxic in combination, which include propylene glycol. So you don't want to include propylene glycol in your CPA. And but combinations of CPAs are less toxic than single agent CPAs. Humans cartilage cells exposed to six molar solutions of DMSO, EG, F formalized glycerol, EG at four degrees. Also, all showed that three CPA combinations are less toxicity than single CPAs or CPA uh, comb two, two CPA combinations. Now, DMSO famously reduces formalized toxicity. So in this chart, you see, this is a different chart where the, the high, on the, instead of the, the horizontal axis showing more toxicity, it shows less toxicity. So as you get higher, you get towards 100% of the sodium potassium ratio measure of toxicity. And it's, you can see, and the bottom, the bottom gra a graph shows the combination of formalide and DMSO. And as you see, uh, the, very rapidly, as you increase the formalide, the toxicity increases, and, and the, uh, the, the measure of toxicity, it gets to be, the viability goes well below 100%. Uh, if you stick the formalide, uh, at 20% concentration weight for volume, you're down to pretty well 20% viability. But if you add DMSO, you can get back up to nearly 100% viability. And, um, and the, the, as they say, the horizontal axis showing the combination of the two um, CPA. But there's also a factor of exposure time. Uh, after sites exposed to 5% uh, DMSO for 24 hours or 4% experience severe mitochondrial damage and promote, promotion of apoptosis. Now, in the previous, the previous uh, slide, I showed very little toxicity with DMSO and, and, um, and, um, and uh, formalide, and actually it's the same sort of thing, but DMSO is not very toxic below a certain level, but if you have a high exposure time, the uh, d five molar DMSO is about 28 percent, which was uh, and uh, w which was harmless in the previous slide for 30 minutes of exposure, but for 24 hours of exposure, you got you got a lot of toxicity. Now there's also penetrating versus non-penetrating CPAs. Penetrating CPAs enter the cell tend to be more toxic than CPAs remaining outside, which are called non-penetrating. You know, they can't crawl, cr cross the cell membrane. Um, ice forms more easily outside of cells than inside of cells because uh, actually the proteins in cells uh, actually act to inhibit ice formation. Um, and so the, you need to lose, use less of the penetrating CPAs. Uh, so, and the, and the, the, the non-penetrating CPAs tend to be very non-toxic, uh, like simple sugars, for example, or, or PDP as, uh, are non-penetrating um, CPAs. So there's another <coughs> wrinkle to this, and that is that you can reduce uh, CPA toxicity uh, in cryopreserving by biological tissue by using low concentrations at higher temperatures and increasing the concentration as temperature lowers. So the idea is you introduce the cryoprotectant instead of the, and then you could lower the temperature. Lowering the temperature might actually cause the, the tissue to freeze, but you've got cryoprotectant now, so you can lower the temperature. And so since it doesn't freeze, that means you can introduce more cryoprotectant and, uh, and uh, lower the temperature any more. So this is called, uh, this, uh, this is based on, discovered by a, a guy called Ferrant. It's called the Ferrant Method and, uh, uh, in, in 1965. Uh, it, it's been used since then. And actually, uh, in, in, um, 
the CTA M22 uh, enables survival. It's, it's a, a mixture of uh, cryo protectants uh, in, in in 22. It enables survival of rabbit kidneys when perfused at increasing concentration. So you increase the concentration, you cool in conjunction with increasing concentration, and um, only reaching a maximum concentration of 9.45 molar at minus 22 degrees Celsius, and that's how. M22 got its name. So, um, so here's the kidney. So the, you know, uh, that's major research. We've been searching with cryopreserved kidneys for a long time because kidneys are the most transplanted organ. And if we could, if we could cryopreserve kidneys, we could we solve a lot of problems. Most about nine out of 10 people who need a kidney, kidney transfer die waiting for a kidney. And so uh, uh, this is probably the major, the biggest biggest uh, uh, breakthrough we can make in cryobiology and actually we were thick cryonics if we were able to do this. Um, so, but the ma major problem is the kidney doesn't perfuse evenly. It's got the outside cortex and the inner medulla, and the kidney cortex receives 90% of blood flow, whereas the kidney medulla only receives 10% of the blood flow. So it's very easy to expose the cortex to toxic levels of cryoprotectant at N22 uh, before the um, medulla has received sufficient cryoprotectant to vitrify. So this is a major challenge. Um, so I mentioned that earlier, the, the, the potassium sodium assay, this is a way of, of measuring uh, toxicity. We have the various measures of where measuring toxicity. Uh, the sodium pump uses ATP to pump sodium outside of cells and, and potassium in the cells. And a high cellular uh, potassium and low uh, <coughs> sodium indicates an intact sodium pump, ATP supply, and cell membrane. Their cell membrane is intact, in other words. But if, if you don't have these things, uh, the sodium pump could be damaged and membrane damaged. So toxicity damage can occur at any temperature, but the potassium sodium viability assay from these temperatures must be done at 25 degrees because you can't, anyway, you can't, if the damage is occurring at zero degrees or, or minus 22 degrees, um, you have to rewarm the sample up uh, to do the assay. I don't, it's a technical question, so I don't think so. Anyway, the, there's a QV hypothesis of non-specific CTA toxicity, which came from uh, 21st century medicine chief scientist uh, Chief Scientific Officer Gregory Fay, uh, his theory of metric design designated QV star, which he believes explains the non specific toxicity of CTA. Um, so, um, anyway, the QV star, the QV hypothesis asserts that high hydrogen bonding strength of CTAs leads to non specific toxicity in comparison to the faster vitrify, or rather not appealing. So, uh, you know, this is the QV formula. I mean, basically Q is the calculation you're doing. It's moles of water over moles of polar groups, where I can indicate the polar groups we're talking about um, in, in cryoprotectors pretty well. And uh, the V stands for minimum conservation needed to vitrify, and the Star indicates standard conditions, uh, a cooling rate of 10 degrees Celsius, and uh, I don't know, in this case, uh, uh, exposed to CTAs at 30 or 40 minutes at zero degrees Celsius. So, um, so anyway, if you do this calculation, you see that Q is going to be much higher, probably in general, for DMSO, because it's the uh, P, the only one polar group in DMSO, and so that's the dominant is going to be one. Whereas in glycerol, you've got three polar groups or three hydroxyl groups, and uh, so you got three in the 
in the in the denominator, and um, so that's going to make the two uh, a lower value. So we got some advanced math then, closing the two events. Um, anyway, uh, Dr. Fays um, created this graph uh, and showed the highest uh, cube, DMSO is the highest QV star and the lowest uh, potassium sodium assay, which is the, ver the uh, vertical axis is the sodium potassium ratio. And um, ethylene glycol, but he, he's saying that uh, this, the upper line is indicating the, the line that most supports his hypothesis, uh, but he uh, considers ethylene glycol to be an outlier due to specific toxicity rather than non-specific toxicity. So I, I have a lot of doubts about uh, Dr. Pei's hypothesis. Uh, the line is defined by DMSO more than any other CPA, as you can see. And the other points of graph are mostly CPA composites selected by Dr. Fay. And also, uh, he didn't mean to include, he didn't mean to include pro propylene glycol, and he did include ethylene glycol, which is the outlier. I think uh, propylene glycol would have been much bigger outlier than, than ethylene glycol. But it, I mentioned earlier that it has a lot of hyperspecific toxicity. The hydrogen bonding strength of each of the groups was not the same, but will vary with temperature, concentration, and solution composition. So I'm running out of time or what? Uh, what? Well, these are the CPAs used by, by Klein's organization. The BM1 has only two, uh, two um, CPAs and uh, the M22 used by Alcor has everything but the kitchen sink. Um, BM1, uh, it's, it's they, they introduced it by uh, in stages, uh, not just for the the, for the ferret method, uh, but for to uh, <coughs> to avoid uh, osmotic shock, which can lead to edema, but. Uh, but the VM and so VM1 can be used in the head without edema, but it causes edema in the body. So they have to use glycerol in the body, according to industry does. Uh, VM1 is stable in tissues at driest temperatures, so there's little danger of ice formation of a patient uh, for people with VM1 and dry ice. But uh, VM1 is more toxic than M22, but M22 is not stable in dry ice for more than a couple of days even under optimal conditions. And uh, M22 contains non-penetrating CPAs, which make it uh, anyway. Um, and here are some of the uh, uh, other ingredients in M22. There's 4% uh, uh, this uh, pre-methoxypropanol and N-methoxyformamide. And um, anyway, uh, the, they, both of these have specific toxicities that dilute the specific, specific toxicity of the dimethyl, the MSO, ethylene glycol, and foreign line. Um, so there's been some other possible uh, penetrating cryo protectants which I think have not been sufficiently tested. Uh, I think no, most notably uh, dry methylbutane triethylglycine. Um, and it's been shown to be identical negligible toxicity even after a long term exposure of cells. Um, mouse, um, thousands, hundreds or, or thousands of mouse embryo, embryonic stem cells have been exposed to 60% N22 for up to eight hours. Six mutants were found to be resistant to N22 toxicity, uh, but, the, uh, but the, th these mutations would indicate the potential for some pharmacological simulation of for blockage of CPA toxicity. 21st century medicine has discovered uh, a chemical they don't want to disclose, but, but it's been shown to reduce CPA toxicity, which is similar to what was suggested there. Now, carrier solutions are used for CPA to ensure isotoxicity and, and have on conic agents and, and other things, you know, to, to, to carry, this, carry the CPA and deliver them. Uh, but uh, uh, I asked Dr. Fay uh, about uh, how much research has been done into the ability of carrier solutions to um, reduce um, 
CPA taught you, so you gave me these references. So serious attempts, as, as, all the 1980s, there hasn't been any research on the subject in the 1980s, um, which is too bad, I think. Um, so non-toxic ions can influence CPA. Uh, we have what we call cos cosmotropic ions that make hydrogen bonds in water, kaotropic ions, which break hydrogen bonds in water, uh, and uh, cosmotropic ions stabilize proteins, kaotropic cations stabilize proteins. So the chaotic, kaotropic cation, potassium with the cosmotropic anion, methyl sulfoxide, has been shown to stabilize the enzyme mushroom um, uh, ty <coughs> tyrosidase and actually maximize its activity. And uh, there's been further studies on this, which uh, uh, I give reference to, but I, I suspect a better chemist, chemist than I am could design carrier proteins with CPAs that could reduce CPA toxicity. So um, I think prior protected toxicity research should be at the very top, list, top of the list for uh, basic theoretical research for improving uh, prior biology and uh, the, the prior protectors will use it because uh, uh, as they say in 22, uh, they, they're trying to preserve rabbit kidneys and try to walk the fine line between producing ice and producing prior protecting toxicity. And they, they, they don't seem to be able to cross the fine line well enough to preserve kidneys. And the other thing is uh, we don't even know the molecular mechanisms of prior protecting toxicity. You know, the denatured proteins, that's a popular hypothesis, but we don't really know. Um, so, anyway. Thank you lots. Any questions from the audience? Anybody need to do a quick question for six minutes? Um, My question is, um, um, what do you think we can do in the animation of uh, people training to spend? Because I see this new parameter. Great, you want to talk in the constituency, and um, uh, what is his name, Mike from Alcorn? You talk about the constituency. What is your take? That's outside of, of the context of my presentation. Yeah. <laughs> We can continue all questions that people might have. Is there anything here? I take the microphone back. So all questions we're doing in a break. Two quick um, things to announce. Uh, on one hand, we're gonna in 20 minutes from now, which is, well, 17 minutes from now. So everybody grab uh, a coffee and then at 10 after five, we're taking a conference picture, a workshop picture, before, in front of the facility, so everybody migrate down um, to, take, to take a picture. And now we're taking a break until half past, so ample time to continue to network. And for everybody here on, on site and everybody remote, sorry for the small technical glitches. A as you can see, we spend more money on research than on AV equipment, but I think we figured everything out now. So at half past five, we're meeting again um, on the stream and here on site. And in 20 minutes, pictures downstairs.